The story starts in a hospital where our MC is playing games, but he is bored of every game. Then he finds a game called Dungeon and Stone on a forum. It's a 2D pixelated game, which he doesn't usually play, but since it's free and he's bored, he decides to give it a try. It's a rogue-type game where if you die you have to start over from the beginning. Without noticing, he plays it for hours and becomes addicted. He plays it everywhere he goes for nine years. Finally, after nine years, he reaches the final boss room. After opening it, he receives a notification that the tutorial is complete. Suddenly, a light emanates from the screen, and he is sucked into the game world. He opens his eyes and finds himself as a barbarian, standing in the coming-of-age ceremony where barbarians choose their first weapon before entering the dungeon. He is shocked and wonders what is happening. Suddenly, a barbarian near him shouts, It's the game! It's Dungeon and Stone! After hearing that, the barbarian chief arrives and asks who shouted. The MC points towards the player in fear. The chief approaches the player and chopped his head off and announces that he was possessed by an evil spirit. Realizing that if he stands out, he will die, the MC faces a problem. He doesn't know his name. If he doesn't go when called, he will die. He starts to think of an idea and comes up with a plan. If someone else doesn't respond within two seconds, he will act. After some time, a name is called and no one responds. So he goes up on the stage and luckily he gets it right. It was his name. Finally, he discovers his name is Andal's son, Bjorn. With his years of experience playing the game, he chooses a shield as his first weapon because it offers the most survivability. After everyone chooses their weapons, they select their leader, Venom's third son, to guide them towards the dungeon. Because everyone that have gone through coming-of-age ceremony will enter the dungeon. However, after some time they get lost on their way. They decide to choose another leader, Fenelene's second daughter Aner, but even she gets lost. Seeing their intelligence, the MC decided to help them and suggests her that they should follow other species to reach the dungeon gate. Aner likes his idea, and they start following other creatures until they finally reach the dungeon gate. However, upon reaching the gate, the MC starts feeling fear. But he have no choice but to go inside because all the citizens of the city need to pay taxes starting from the age of 20, and failure to do so results in execution. Since he is a barbarian, it is impossible for him to find a normal job, and the labyrinth only opens once a month. So he has to go now, but his feet aren't moving because of fear. Then Aner gives him some encouragement, and also thanks him for helping earlier. After that, he gathers his composure and enters the labyrinth. However, instead of transported to the start area, he is transported to an area with complete darkness. Just as he took a few steps... A trap set by a cunning goblin snapped shut beneath his feet. Pain coursed through his body as he began to bleed profusely. The goblin, reveling in its victory, shadowed Bjorn's every move, eagerly awaiting his impending demise. Aware of the goblin's presence, Bjorn feigned weakness and collapsed to the ground, his breathing shallow. Seizing the opportunity, the goblin trow a rock at him, testing to see if he was truly dead. Confirming his suspicion, the goblin approached Bjorn. But Bjorn, despite his injuries, mustered his strength and launched a surprise attack. In a fierce struggle, he emerged victorious, and the goblin's body disappear. Leaving behind a ninth-grade magic stone, a highly coveted and valuable item in this world. Yet, its worth was equaled that of a mere piece of bread. Despite his victory, Bjorn's wounds continued to bleed profusely, posing a grave threat to his survival. Desperate for aid, he forced himself to keep moving, dragging his injured body across the unforgiving ground. Hour after grueling hour, he fought against the encroaching darkness, his resolve unwavering. The brink of death loomed near, but he refused to succumb. Finally, a glimmer of light pierced the darkness, signifying an exit from the treacherous depths. To his astonishment, a party of seasoned adventurers emerged before him. Seeing his dire condition, they stopped their captain demanding the assistance of their healer. However, much to their dismay, the healer refused, unwilling to use her limited holy power on a stranger. Undeterred, the captain turned to another party member, asking him to give a healing potion. Reluctant due to its cost, the party member initially refused, but the captain, demonstrating his leadership, promised to repay the debt in due time. Relenting, the party member handed over the potion, and with careful precision, poured it onto Bjorn's injured leg. 
Unbeknownst to many, potions in this world inflicted a searing pain when used, making them impractical for use in the midst of battle. The healing process was arduous, but Bjorn endured the agony, his wounds slowly closing under the potion's influence. Grateful for their aid, the captain inquired how he had arrived before him. He wondered if there was a hidden shortcut he had missed. Bjorn, tell them what happened, after listening his explanation. The captain explained that such occurrences were exceptionally rare, happening only once or twice every hundred years. Bjorn couldn't help but reflect on his ill-fated luck. With their paths diverging, the party bid him farewell, and Bjorn resumed his exploration of the illuminated area. With a renewed sense of purpose, Bjorn ventured forth, his eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of danger or opportunity. He knew that the light before him marked the beginning of a new chapter, brimming with challenges and untold treasures. Armed with his resilience, honed skills, Bjorn prepared to face whatever awaited him in this enigmatic realm. Little did he know that his journey had only just begun, and the trials ahead would test him in ways he could never have imagined. After his near-death experience, he kept running into goblins. They keep coming. At first he was nervous, but after some time, goblins are no threat to him, and traps are randomly placed in the open. The only problems were food and water, because the food he got from the deputy chief was lost when he was crawling on the ground. Only two days' worth is left, and the chief did not give any water, so he has to find it in the labyrinth. So he starts searching, and after some time, he finds the water. But there was already someone else there. But he left himself. After that, he drinks water and started counting the magic stones he collected, and there were forty-four stones. And now he started to feel tired, and started to feel sleepy. There are two ways to sleep in the labyrinth. First, live your life in the gods' hands and sleep. Or second, find allies to protect each other. He tried the second option, but everyone got scared because of his looks and all the blood all over his body. Then suddenly, the man from before comes and asked him if he is looking for an overnight companion. After hearing that, MC got angry. Then he explained that he thought that they could take some sleep while protecting each other. Then MC understands that it was called an overnight companion, and he thought he was saying, um. After that, he agrees, and they play rock, paper, scissors to determine who will sleep first, and MC lost. So the man gives MC a watch and asks him to wake him up after two hours. After two hours, MC wakes him up, and now it's his turn to sleep, but he can't believe in a stranger. So he pretends to sleep to see if that man does something, but he doesn't do anything. After two hours, they change turns again, but MC is frustrated because he didn't get a single minute of sleep, and he was so sleepy that his eyes closed, and MC falls asleep. Then suddenly, that man wakes him up. MC apologizes to him and offers him more time to sleep, but that man refuses. So MC takes his turn and starts sleeping. After some time, that man comes and attacks him with his hammer, but MC blocks it, and says he knew that there is no one that kind in this world who forgives and does not take the offer to sleep. They fight, and MC defeats him, asking him why he didn't attack the first time he slept. That man answers that because he also needs sleep. Then MC asks why he attacked him, and the man answers that it's because of his stone, but MC doesn't believe him and attacks him again, asking once more. That man explains that it's because of his heart, and tells him that a barbarian's heart is used for new magical research and sold for a good price. After saying all of that, he starts begging to be let go. Everyone in this world thinks barbarians are stupid and naive. Most of it is true, but our MC is a human inside a barbarian. So he kills him and takes his items. He have many items, like potions. MC starts to think that after only a few hours since he came to this world, he killed someone, and only after killing a man, he is now living like a man. After that, he started to hunt again, and goblins started to come in pairs because it's the second day. But it's not a big problem for our MC. He hunts for 14 hours, but now he started to feel very tired and needs sleep. Because of the previous incident, this time he chose the first option and tried to sleep alone, hoping goblins won't come. But goblins keep coming. After some time, he just closed his eyes, but a goblin attacked him and just missed MC's neck because of height. After that, MC becomes frustrated and decided to find another barbarian, but instead, 
He meets many humans this time who want to become his overnight companion, maybe because this time he is looking good and didn't cover in blood. But he refused them all and told them that he is looking for another barbarian. Then one man tells him that it's going to be hard to find, because most of the barbarians quickly go up to the second floor. Then MC realizes that it would be embarrassing for someone of their build to struggle on the first floor. So he starts to look for any race other than human to become an overnight companion, because every race has a special trait other than human. After some time of searching, he finds an elf. She was injured and afraid. Then MC goes there, and she instantly starts to beg him to let her live. Then MC tries to comfort her, but she gets more scared and says that even if he is a barbarian, let her live just once because she has a younger brother to take care of. Then MC starts to think about what barbarians do. So to make her let her guard down against him a little, he gives her some healing herbs and some bandages he got from the men from before and asks her to treat her wound first while he stands guard. After she finishes treatment, he introduces himself, and she also tells her name, Erwin. Then he asks her why she is so afraid of him. She tells him that he is a barbarian, and barbarians and elves had a very big war in the past, and now they are hostile towards each other. She says she doesn't care about this, and asks him to let her go. MC didn't know about it. All he knows is that elves and barbarians have a good relationship, so he does not know which timeline this is compared to the game he plays. Then he tells her that he also doesn't care about it, and asks her to become his overnight companion. I know it sounds weird. After thinking for some time, she agrees, but asks him to make an oath on his warrior's honor that he will not harm her. And she also makes an oath in the name of her tribe. Then both make the oath to not harm each other. Then our MC decides to sleep first, and she agrees. So he gives her the pocket watch, and asks her to handle it with care because it's expensive. At first he thought that he would pretend to sleep for ten minutes, but he instantly falls asleep. Then after two hours she wakes him. Then he realizes that it's all because of the blanket and the bag, and if Hans, the man from before, lent it to him, he would definitely die there. So he decides to lend them to her, and just like that, they both take a few turns, and now there are only ten minutes left before the last turn. Then two men came there and asked Bjorn what his relationship with the elf was. He told them they were overnight companions. Then they asked how much time was remaining. After hearing that, Bjorn told them it was none of their business and that he was not obligated to tell them. He scared them away and they left. After that, Bjorn tried to wake up Erwin, but she pretended to sleep. Bjorn forcefully woke her and asked why she was pretending to sleep. She answered that if she got up, he would leave her because their partnership would end as soon as she woke up, and he would leave her alone. Then Bjorn asked her what happened with those two. She answered that she didn't know them, but they were probably from the same group called the Crystal Union as the human who tried to hurt her. After hearing that it was a whole group, he first thought of parting ways, but this beautiful elf was only 20 years old, and that was reason enough for a man of culture to help someone. So he decided to help her and asked for her full story before deciding. She got really happy and told him that she had met them on the first day inside the labyrinth as overnight companions. And when she was sleeping, she felt a gaze behind her. Only later did she find out that he was a manager of a clan doing business on the first floor. And somehow she managed to escape. Since then, they had been chasing her. Then Bjorn asked how they were able to chase her in the labyrinth. She told him that they were probably using message stones, which allow communication when synchronized prior to usage. Their range is up to about 300 meters. It was a device that didn't exist in the game, so he was a little shocked. Then Bjorn asked her why the members of the Union continued to chase her, when it didn't seem like she had done anything wrong. She told him that while escaping, she swung her knife around and accidentally cracked one of the assailant's ears. Jorn felt bad for that man, and she was laughing while telling him all this. Suddenly, she felt someone following them from behind, about 150 meters away. It was an ability of elves they are born with, so they decided to increase their speed, but the distance between them didn't increase. Jorn started to think about the risks he was taking and the benefits. 
Well, I think we all know the benefits of helping beautiful Elf. So he asked her what she was good at. She gave a great answer fitting for the situation. She said that she was good at laundry and cleaning, but bad at cooking. I just want to ask what is going on in her head at a moment like this. Everyone, what do you think? But just don't go overboard with it. Then he asked what she was good at during battle, that she was good at archery, and could also use spirit magic, specifically flame element. Flame element is actually the rarest element in this world. Then he asked her if she had killed anyone before. She answered that she hadn't, but she could do it. Then Bjorn asked seriously if she would like to become his comrade until they got out of the labyrinth. He would take 90s, and she would get 10. He didn't even finish his speech, but she instantly agreed without any hesitation. So Bjorn decided to get rid of the pursuer, because the distance between them was getting shorter and shorter. He decided to enter a dark area where they waited for the pursuer, after he arrived and started searching for them. Hmm, Bjorn ordered her to shoot the arrow. She was a little nervous, but she shot the arrow and got a headshot. MC sure was smart. He didn't kill the man himself. Erwin was in a little shock. So he gave her some encouragement and started looting the men. There, he found the message stone Erwin had been talking about. After that, Jorn checked the loot he got from the man he just killed. He had a pouch of magic crystals, two daggers, one potion bottle from his waist belt, and the clothes he was wearing, a leather top and bottom. Jorn sure was a scavenger, and I like this kind of bodrin in story. Then MC asked Erwin about how to use the message stone, and she told him that there was a button on the side. After Bjorn pressed it, a voice came from it, and there was someone giving everyone instructions and asking them to catch the elf and the barbarian with full instructions. He also placed a 10,000 gold bounty on their heads and asked everyone to gather at the goblin district, which was where Bjorn and Erwin were currently. After hearing that, Erwin got scared, but MC asked her not to be scared, and they moved up to the second floor. After hearing that, she asked if they were really going to the second floor by themselves, as there was a huge difference between the first and second floors. Jorn said he knew it, and told her that they would just stay near the entrance, and they were also a good match. She got flustered after hearing that, but she still hesitated to go to the second floor. Then, suddenly, a voice came from the message stone, saying that whoever found the elf first could enjoy her first on top of the 10,000 gold. Then another man's voice came, saying that if she was too resistant, could he cut off one of her arms and legs? Then that man asked if they should just leave the important part, and he asked if they all knew what he meant, right? After hearing all of that, she immediately agreed to go up to the second floor. This makes Bjorn's work easy and saves his time. He always likes to help people in need when it is beneficial to him, of course. When a chance like this comes, of course, he will take it. After that, Erwin asks Mick about the path to the second floor. Jorn said that he doesn't know the specific path, but the dungeon is designed in such a way that if you keep following the darkness, you will reach a portal, since the darkness represents a path that leads you to the upper floors. Suddenly, Erwin stops Bjorn because there was a trap. After seeing the trap, Jorn remembers the dark past and that he just walked a few steps before stepping on one, but they only appeared now after so late. Then he realizes how unlucky he was. Then Erwin asks Bjorn to let her handle it, and he should rest. Then Bjorn told her not to use spirit to save strength. With her clumsy look, you can understand what she is going to do. After that, she goes near the trap, and suddenly two goblins attack her, but she was ready and counter attacks them and kills the first goblin, then the second goblin, then the second goblin tries to attack her, but she quickly finishes him too. After that, she gives both stones to Bjorn according to the agreement of nine to one, and she seems very happy about it, saying there's something her younger sibling has been asking for. And if they keep progressing like this, she can earn a little bit too, right? After hearing that, Mick feels like she is trying to insult him. I also feel the same, but she's got a point there. Then a voice from the stone comes again, saying that they are raising the bounty on the elf to 20,000 gold, 
dead or alive. After hearing that, Erwin gets scared again. Then Bjorn asks her not to worry and says there's no one who will search in the dark for them. And these bastards don't have the best teamwork. That's all he said to her. But inside his mind, he was thinking that it's suspicious, that all things are going too well. He was just thinking, but suddenly, Erwin shouts, there are ghouls. After seeing them, Bjorn starts to think, how are the ghouls here? On the first floor, there are different monsters based on the direction you go, and ghouls are supposed to be in the south. They've come too far after roaming for so long. But actually, it's a good thing for Bjorn. Maybe you guys are thinking about what level McCurrently is, right? To know that first, I'll explain the experience awarding system for the dungeon in stone. You are only awarded for the first time you defeat a monster of the same species. But if they are from a different rank, you can also gain experience. For example, if you kill a goblin and a goblin chief, they are both considered different species and you gain experience from both of them the first time you kill them. Meaning you need to defeat as many species as possible in order to level up. So Mick is just level one. And by the way, a personal question. I'm also thinking of making a similar game, but in three, of course. So can you guys tell me which platform I should create it on? The mobile version will have lighter graphics compared to the CC version. Also, Tell me all your ideas about gameplay and everything else. And if you guys want, I can make another channel where I'll share my progress on it. Now, let's get back to the story. Erwin said she will handle it alone, but denied it, asking her to cover from behind. After Bjorn comes within a certain range of ghouls, they attack him. And why is their hair like melting cream on top of a cake? Well then, the fight begins. And it was a piece of cake with Bjorn's power and Erwin's artillery. After that, they keep walking towards the north until the third day. Then Erwin sees blood on the ground, and it was not Goblin's blood. After following the blood trail for some time, they find a sandal. And I think everyone knows about the dark past of Mech. After seeing that, the portal was less than 10 meters away from his starting point. And if only he had gone in the other direction. Just how much bad luck does he have? Because anyone who opens the portal first to the second floor gets two experience points. And as I told you before, you can only earn experience points one time from the same species. So it's very hard to level up. But you can earn these experience points every time the labyrinth opens and it becomes a kind of race. That's why the team who saved Bjorn on the first day asked him about it. Thinking about that makes him very angry, and seeing him like that, Erwin asks him if there's something she did wrong. Then he says it was not because of her. After that, she comes to a conclusion that Jorn lost his barbarian comrade here, so she gives him some sympathy. Jorn gets confused, but he decides to ignore it, and they go up to the second floor, the Goblin Forest. But their landing is not a smooth one, for Bjorn, of course. Erwin lands perfectly. After Bjorn recovers from this unfortunate experience, they look around and there is no living being in a 50 meter radius. The second floor is different from the first floor. While the first floor is like an underground maze, the second floor is an open forest and there are four gates in four different directions on the first floor and each gate leads to a different place. But you can go to the third floor from any of them. Just tell me, What's with the ghouls? Others look good, but ghouls look like ice cream is melting on their heads. After that, Erwin asks Bjorn what to do now. He tells her that once the time is up, which is 168 hours for the first floor and 240 hours for the second floor, the labyrinth spits the explorers back out into the city. So they will stay on the second floor before the 168 hours are up, and then they go back to the first floor. But they can't just stay here by the portal all day, so they start to explore the nearby area a bit. Soon after some time, Erwin finds a trap, but Jorn didn't see it. Then Erwin throws a rock at it to deactivate it, and then she asks for praise from Bjorn. But Jorn just says that she is good at throwing rocks, and it was always her duty to find the traps. McSure is a Sigma. Let's talk about the second floor a little. 
Traps on the second floor are different than the first floor. They are well hidden and are all over the floor. But there is no goblin watching over them. And other than traps, another difference is that the goblins go around in groups of about a dozen, sometimes with warriors or archers. And there are more high-ranking monsters the farther you go towards the exterior of the forest. Continue the story. Jorn and Erwin started exploring the goblin forest, destroying traps in their way so they wouldn't cause any trouble later when monsters attack. Soon, Erwin heard footsteps of the goblins and asked Bjorn what to do. Jorn asked her about the number of goblins, and she answered that she doesn't know the exact number, but it's more than ten for sure. After hearing that, he decided that they will attack them and asked Erwin how close they can get without being noticed. She answered that, on her own, she can get to about 30 meters away from them. Then, Jorn said that they will go with her plan. First, Erwin goes near them and shoots the first arrow. Then Jorn will attack them. However, the second floor is different. There are three times the amount of goblins from the first floor. And there's a goblin warrior too. Yes, this guy with the knife-like sword is a goblin warrior. And it should be scary face so many goblins to gather. But instead of being scared, Jorn's warrior's heart was twitching. He was feeling excited. It reminds me of the Overlord manga where Ains' emotions automatically get suppressed. With this sense of excitement, he started to crush them one by one. But dealing with a goblin warrior isn't easy. He almost chopped Bjorn's head off and surrounded him with other goblins. The situation became quite threatening, and he might also get injured. But that's if he was alone, of course. But with a trusted partner like Erwin, his back is covered, and he quickly finished them all. He gained one experience point for defeating the goblin warrior for the first time, and 11 magic crystals. But the warrior's weapon and armor disappeared with the goblin. The warrior stone has more value than a normal goblin of the same rank. So, he decided to give Erwin two normal stones. She looked very happy. And after that, they started moving again. Once they went farther out than a three-kilometer radius, they began to come across goblin groups every five minutes. This time, there's an archer among the goblins, and as soon as he saw them, he disappeared using stealth magic. It became difficult because of the goblin archers. But it wasn't enough to defeat Bjorn. He just had to focus a little more to dodge the arrows coming towards him, and he easily defeated the goblin archer. After 15 hours of fights, they decided to take rest. And Jorn gave Erwin the first chance to sleep, and she instantly fell asleep. Then Bjorn started thinking that explorers are scarier than the goblins, especially now that he has a reason to be worried, and it's a problem that she's so pretty. He said it out loud, and Erwin woke up instantly and asked him if she is really pretty. But Jorn asked her to sleep. Well, it shows that she was not stupid and is always on her guard. And just like that, the fourth, fifth, and sixth day passed. And it became the seventh day, the last day, and it's finally time to leave the labyrinth. Jorn told Erwin that it was finally time to leave the labyrinth. There were only two hours and 47 minutes until the first floor would spit the explorers back out. Erwin told Bjorn that she's so tired that she will immediately fall asleep as soon as they're out. Jorn told her that they should go back now because they should get to the portal earlier rather than late. Of course, things would get a bit tricky now because the goblin groups had respond and put down new traps all over the place. Erwin also sensed a goblin group 70 meters away from them with eight regular goblins, two archers, and two warriors. Bjorn decided that they will fight. Goblins were just chatting and laughing. And just like before, Erwin shot from afar and popped one of them in the skull, leaving the other goblins stunned. Then Bjorn charged in with his fierce look, scaring the goblins, and he started his attack. He knew that Erwin would take care of the archers, so he focused on killing the warriors first. Bjorn had become a master at fighting goblins, swinging his hammer around and hitting them all to their death in each shot. Erwin also got used to it. She knew exactly when and who to shoot. And because of that, the time it took to kill all the goblins had shortened. He praised her and told her that she did a good job, and she loved having Bjorn's approval. 
But he told her to tell him when she kills the archers so that he doesn't have to worry about getting shot while fighting. She apologizes and tells him she wasn't sure if the last one was hit or not. He is a bit confused, but agrees that unconfirmed information would be more dangerous. While Erwin just smiled and waited for a response, he was thinking about how much he's grown. He's actually kind of proud, but I doesn't know who he is proud of. To me, it looks more like self-appreciation. Suddenly, Erwin calls Bjorn's attention to something cool near a dead goblin. Its corpse hasn't fully vanished yet. Rather, it has a blue aura around it. Bjorn notes that this essence particularly belongs to the goblin archer. Essences are a part of the skill system in Dungeon and Stone, which gives you passive and active skills with varying stats, depending on the essence's type. There is only one essence allowed per level, but it is kind of like a cheat. It's one of the most valuable treasures for an explorer, and there will always be a limit to how many essences you can absorb. He remembers his early days of playing the game and recalls how each goblin has a different ability attached to their essence, and your fate will depend on which essences you take. It has a near 0% drop rate, and he never expected to see it here. He was speechless as they stood near it. It feels too good to be true, and he senses something bad might happen. Then our weird but cute Erwin asks him if she would become a goblin if she ate it. Jorn tells her that she wouldn't, but she wouldn't but she would earn a part of the goblin archer's abilities. He tells her how the guy who was chasing them on the first floor had taken a razor mane wolf's essence, which gave him the ability to track their smell. He asks her if she wants the essence, and she says she doesn't really care much, but she will take it if Bjorn doesn't want to take it. Jorn doesn't care about the goblin archer's essence. He's a barbarian, and he already knows what essence he wants, and this essence would be useless to him. So he tells Erwin that she can have it, but she must promise him something. This is something he was originally going to tell her once they got to the first floor. But right as he was about to speak, they were interrupted by a man calling out to them. It's a group of explorers. He tells our protagonist not to move a muscle. Erwin asks him what he means and mentions that they were just hunting, but Jorn knew the true purpose of these people arriving. He puts his hands on Erwin's shoulders and says she doesn't need to answer them. Erwin looks confused for a moment. Right then, Jorn throws her into the goblin archer's essence, and she lands directly on top of the essence, and a bright light emerges from the essence, covering her. The man who looks like he's from Naruto Aname starts screaming out of rage because Erwin ate the essence and is now fusing with it. He claims that the essence belonged to them. Erwin stands up and leans her back against Bjorn, thanking him for the essence. Jorn knew that he would eventually run into people like these. People who wait until they see an opportunity to grab something from unsuspecting explorers. However, they couldn't do anything about it now that Erwin had absorbed it, and it was gone forever. But Jorn took a step forward and told them to come at them if they wanted a fight. He was confident, showing no fear as he looked towards them. He knew they were at a numerical disadvantage, so they needed to show confidence and boldness. That group started getting nervous, looking at the oversized barbarian with his hammer in his hand. He sure was intimidating. He told them he was ready for a fight if they wanted one, but if they were scared, they could fack off. It looks like we are going to see some real fight very soon. But for now, we have to wait because that group decided to go from there. But before they left, they left with a warning to Bjorn that they will come. After that, Bjorn and Erwin start running towards the portal, and Bjorn tells Erwin not to stop until she reaches the portal. She runs at the fastest speed she can while asking Bjorn if the four from earlier are gone, or whether they'd chase them. Bjorn remembers how they threatened him, that he would get revenge for the essence. And even if they didn't follow them, they would probably end up in the same place, which confuses Erwin. Bjorn tells her that they were a party of four, which is a good number for a second floor raid. But they were loitering around the entrance, which means they were planning to go back to the first floor and leave the labyrinth, just like them. They were doing the same thing as them, and Erwin appreciates Bjorn's ability to think critically. Well, for others, he is a barbarian after all.
As they run, Erwin senses a group of goblins 50 meters away from their location, and Bjorn says that they will avoid them. However, Erwin tells Bjorn that they can't run because the goblins are coming towards them. Bjorn is shocked to hear this, because the goblins hadn't found them once during the past few days. So, how did they find them now? He wondered if this was a coincidence. So they decided to go in the opposite direction. As Bjorn made a quick turn, Erwin was agreeing with him. But suddenly, an arrow comes flying towards her. Bjorn grabbed her by the shirt and pulled her backward. But the arrow wasn't from a goblin archer. She says she was going to dodge it herself. And Bjorn says that it's the guys from earlier who shot at them. He tells Erwin that they lured the goblins to their location. And they're waiting on the opposite side. They were planning to tire them out with goblins. And now they had no choice but to fight. He told Erwin to use her powers. She is confused as to what powers he means. And he tells her to use the essence's power that she had acquired by eating the goblin archer's essence. You see, every essence has its own special ability. And since Erwin had absorbed the goblin archer's essence, it would give her special powers. It would increase Erwin's stats in many ways, as you can see on the stat window. Alongside that, it adds a passive and active skill, which can be quite useful in situations like this. She had gotten a passive skill that made all her arrows poisonous, while also giving her an active skill that made her stealthy. Erwin tells him that she doesn't know how to use it, and he just looks at her and tells her that it's already working. Erwin begins to glow blue with the essence surging through her body. She can finally feel the powers of the Goblin Archer. Her active skill thief step was now in use. Bjorn looked at her and wondered whether the skills work just by willing them, or did they need to say something to trigger it. Meanwhile, Erwin is just enthralled by her new powers. He hands her his bag, telling her to keep it safe. He was going to handle the goblins on his own, and she can look for the guy with the crossbow. Erwin is worried for Bjorn, because it would be too dangerous on his own. However, he doesn't care at the moment. He tells her that there is no time to think. He tells her to stay hidden, and when he gives the signal, she must kill the guy with the crossbow. There would only be one shot. After that, he runs into the forest towards the goblins without even telling her what the signal would be. After some time, he stops, because goblins were surrounding him from the left while rushing into the goblins headfirst. Jorn notices how those guys haven't shown themselves since they shot at them with a crossbow. Early on, he assumed that they would show themselves once he killed all of the goblins, and he began the killing spree. Blood splatters were everywhere as Bjorn was killing the group of goblins. There were a dozen of them. Two of the goblins were swordsmen or warriors, but there were no arrows flying towards him. There were probably no archers, or so he thought. But an arrow comes flying his way, so he blocked it with his shield, and he now knows there were archers too. Then he felt something pierce his back. It was a goblin with a dagger who stabbed him from behind. He threw the goblin off and bashed its head in with his shield. He was fighting the goblins to the best of his abilities. But he also remembered the crossbow guy was there too, and he didn't have Erwin to help him this time. The injuries were piling up as they were cutting Bjorn up. It was looking like the attack on Titans. But he didn't let up though, as he slammed his hammer onto the goblins and killed them all. They turned into smoke, and he realized that things were getting a bit too dangerous for him. Suddenly, two arrows shot in his direction at once. He had to dodge them, but he realized that they were both different markings. One belonged to a goblin archer, and the other arrow was from the crossbow guy. It was impossible to block both arrows, and now he had to pick and choose which arrow would be more dangerous to get hit with. So he decided to block the crossbow bolt, and as he blocked it, the goblin arrow had pierced through his elbow because he simply couldn't have blocked shots from both sides. His arm was wounded and bleeding, not to mention the goblin arrows seemed to have been poisoned. His arm was turning purple, and he couldn't feel any movement within it. He only had his right arm, and he needed to choose between his weapons now. So, he let go of the hammer, knowing it wouldn't be much help. He pulled the arrow out of his elbow and chose the shield. 
It was his original weapon. He knew that the real enemy was that group of scums. If it weren't for them, the goblins wouldn't have been much of a threat to him. He could easily kill goblins with the hammer, but the shield was necessary to protect himself from those crossbow bolts. Jorn kept slamming into them with his shield. He was flinging them around like they were nothing, sending them flying far away with each hit. But it was not enough. Eventually, he had enough, and he got angry. As he gave the goblins an angry look, the remaining goblins began to run away. As they ran away, Bjorn had one slight moment of rest. He managed to hold on long enough, and he knew he didn't have to chase them down. The group started to emerge from the bushes. They were hiding in there for too long. Their leader smiled and looked smug. He respected Bjorn for getting rid of all, of those goblins on his own. He found it impressive and quite unexpected as he walked out with his two other companions. The crossbow guy didn't come with them, but he noticed and asked him the whereabouts of Erwin. With anger, he just tells them to come and fight him. Then their leader says that it is truly impressive that he still has energy despite fighting all of those goblins. However, he was sure that Bjorn was severely injured by this point and gives him the option to tell him where Erwin is and they would let him go. Bjorn smiles. He wondered if they thought he was stupid. But Bjorn, laughing, annoyed them and they decided that they should fight him first and torture him later for the answers. He tells his crew not to let their guard down, even if Bjorn is injured. They were going to take this fight the same way as they would while hunting a giant monster. They decided to rush and attack Bjorn as he held his shield up, ready for their attack. But his situation was dire. His left arm wasn't moving, and he was going up against three explorers. He wondered whether Erwin found the crossbow archer yet, but he needed to send the signal now. But he knew that the signal had to be something unique, something that this world's people would recognize. He knew what he had to do. He smiled as he raised his poisoned arm up and showed them his middle finger. As he put his arm up, he looked very pleased with the signal. Well, it's a good one. What do you think will happen if Erwin got confused with it? As all of you know how clumsy she is. Also, I also have a story, a dark fantasy one. So I just want to know how much darker I keep it. It is going to be similar to Remonster. But if I make it too much darker, I have to create another channel for it. Or I release a novel with a darker version and video with a lighter version. Please tell me. Okay, let's get back to the story, guys. As Bjorn's middle finger was raised up high, his mind was racing and worried as he wondered if Erwin had recognized the signal yet because she's far away. Of course, the red hair man and his crew didn't know what this meant, and this confused them. While they were confused, Jorn had no choice but to trust her. So he charged at his enemies with his shield. He rushed towards them, but their leader stopped him by slamming his sword against his shield. Feeling Bjorn's strength, he began to be undermined, so he called his samurai friend for help. While Bjorn was focused on him, the samurai came in swinging his sword, slashing at Bjorn's shield and pushed it out of the way. Bjorn could feel the power of the samurai warrior, but he knew that he couldn't back off. So he decided to be aggressive towards the samurai, but the samurai easily dodged his attacks. However, hitting them is not his original goal. He wants to distract them to make an opening for Erwin. In the midst of the fight, he couldn't help but worry about Erwin. He was worried that she might have been defeated by the crossbow guy. But as he fought, an arrow came flying from behind them. It surprised everyone because it was a crossbow arrow, and it was coming towards their leader. But it was blocked by the shield guy of their team. The shield guy told his squad to focus on Bjorn, and he would focus on blocking any of the arrows coming their way. Both of them rushed towards Bjorn. Bjorn stopped the attack of the red-haired guy with his shield, but he had no chance to fight against both at once. As the samurai guy ran towards him, ready for a killing blow, Bjorn knew what he had to sacrifice. So he protected his back with his left arm, though the poison had already made it useless for this fight. His arm had a huge cut on it now, but he exchanged it for the leader's head, slamming his shield into Redhair's face and sending him flying. 
so it wasn't a bad trade-off. The samurai guy tried attacking Bajorn, but he dodged it. Then an arrow came flying towards the samurai, and he was shocked. But the shield guy came and blocked it. But he didn't know that the archer they were up against had a fire spirit on her side. Before Bjorn could do anything, another arrow came flying and pierced through the unshielded guy's shoulder. After seeing that things were not looking good for them, Red Hair decided to run off and go after Erwin. Jorn wanted to go and stop him, but he knew he couldn't risk going after Red Hair, so he decided to trust Erwin to deal with him herself. He locked his feet into the ground and attacked the samurai guy with full force, but the samurai dodged it at a last moment. However, the samurai was not Jorn's target from the start. He was aiming for the shield guy. Now, it was just Bujorn, and the samurai left standing. They clashed again, but Jorn could see that the samurai was trying to buy time for Red Hair to come back, so he decided to finish it in one shot, even if it was dangerous. He pretended to swing his shield, but instead he threw it towards the samurai's head, hitting him hard. But if he missed, it would become dangerous for him. Now, he grabbed the samurai guy by his collar, and Bjorn knew that he didn't have much strength left and was about to die if he messed things up. So he lifted him up and pulled him towards his face and literally bit his tongue out of his neck. The barbarian rage had taken over and he was moving off of pure instinct for survival. Now, both of Bjorn's opponent's bodies were on the ground and he was left standing alone. Erwin came running to him from behind, tears in her eyes because she was worried about Bjorn's safety. She also killed both of her opponents and now they had both survived the game of survival one more time. This time, it got a bit too close for comfort though. As Erwin saw how wounded Bjorn was, she handed him a potion, telling him to drink it immediately. Bjorn was confused, because he didn't know that people can drink it. She told him it's better to drink it than to pour it on your wounds, and since he was poisoned, it would clean up his insides too. Bjorn chugged the vial of healing potion and dropped it on the ground as he sat there healing. He could feel his insides boiling, his entire body burning in pain, and his veins were itchy and hot. That's the reason why people pour it on the wound instead of drinking it, even if it has more benefits. While Bjorn was healing, Erwin was next to him, encouraging him. Then he asked her how much time was left. Erwin checked their watch and told him that it was 11, 20, which meant that they had 40 minutes until the first floor closed. They did not have any time to rest despite the fight. Then Jorn asked her to strip, and she had a regular reaction for her standard Akos. She was thinking that he was doing it so suddenly, so he must have a reason for it, and she started taking her top off. Or I was just thinking too much. She is the same Erwin we know. Then Jorn asked what she was doing, and told her that he meant stripping the bodies of the dead guys for items and resources. But now that they had only 40 minutes, Bjorn decided to just take their equipment, magic crystals and backpacks. They didn't have time for other things. So Erwin went to get red hair and crossbow guys things too. They had only 34 minutes left when Erwin came back with all the stuff. After that, they ran through the forest at top speed. There was only one minute left but they got to the portal of the first floor, and then they jumped into the portal. They managed to come back to the first floor in time. Erwin rejoiced in their success. She had lots of fun. Meanwhile, Bjorn still wondered how she managed to land perfectly every time. She told Bjorn that he did a great job. Then he told her that she did a great job too. Then she leaned in close to Bjorn, asking him what he wanted to say earlier before but there were less than 10 seconds left before the labyrinth closed. So he told her that they should talk once they were back in Raftonia, but they would both emerge at different locations. So they had to choose some spot for meeting, but Jorn forgot the name of the tavern. There was no time left, and he was scratching his head in rage because he couldn't remember the name of the tavern. Finally, he remembered and told her to meet him at the Black Whale Tavern once they were out. She happily agreed to it, and their time together in the labyrinth ended. The labyrinth began to close, and he was being transported back to Raftonia. Jorn emerged back in the city filled with explorers. 
Now the story is going to be more interesting, my horny friends. But for now, he was back in Raftonia, amidst the hustle and bustle of people. It's place filled with a tremendous amount of people, because all the explorers are gathered in one place. But for now, he began to reset his clock, because time in the labyrinth flows differently than in the city. No matter how many days you spent in the labyrinth, once you come back to the city, it's always noon on the next day. And you have to reset your clock so that it points to noon. I was curious about one thing. If no matter how many days you spent in the dungeon, you come out the next day and the higher the floor, the more days it takes to close, does it mean you age faster compared to the person outside? Or does the age of the person inside the dungeon not increase? Think the second option is more reasonable. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section. Let's get back to the story. In the crowd, he saw a tall barbarian calling out to him. And he wondered what this guy's name was. As the two men shook hands, Dorn remembered his name as Vanon's second son, Karak. But he was actually the third son. Well, Dorn always does that. Then another one came and he was glad to see both safe. This guy's name was Serum, and the name reminded me of something. What about? After that, within a moment, a crowd of barbarians gathered around, surrounding Vanon's second son, Karak, talking about their experience in the labyrinth. He sure was a popular guy, but Jorn didn't seem to be happy about it. They were having a whole reunion, but I didn't see Aner anywhere. Maybe we'll see her in the future. For now, one of the barbarians challenged Karak to a duel, and Karak accepted it, which was a celebratory barbarian thing. So they all decided to head out to the bravery checkpoint, where they could get their magic crystals counted, as well as talk some more and share their experiences as they walked away. They asked Bujorn if he was coming with them. It didn't really seem like he wanted to, but he obliged anyways, because what else could he do? At the register table, a lady was counting all of the magic crystals. Some had 20,000. Some had 30,000. And at the end, Vanon's third son, Karak, stood above them all with 40,000 magic crystals. Everybody was cheering for him, calling him the warrior of warriors. Then Bjorn walked up to the register and dropped a bunch of bags on the counter. The cashier lady began to calculate. She was so fast that Bjorn was left shocked. After the count was done, it turned out that Bajorn had 182,413 magic crystals. Hearing the numbers, Jorn was also in shock. After hearing that, they gathered around him and started cheering for him. They also noticed his equipment and bag and started saying that they were jealous of him and that he was a true warrior. All of them were truly happy for him. He was being lifted up and thrown in the air by a crowd of barbarians. And he enjoyed that moment. But people started to complain about it. So the squad decided to hang outside of the checkpoint while some of them stayed inside the building to get their magic crystals counted. As they sat on the steps, Jorn decided that he should follow all the other barbarians because there might be something left to do that he doesn't know about. And he doesn't want to take the risk of getting exposed. So he would wait for them to return and stick with them. In the distance, he saw a group of elves hanging out. In that group, he saw Erwin. She was talking to her friends about how she learned to control spirits, and they applauded her. Jorn felt envious because she hung out with that sort of crowd. But he was surrounded by the savages instead. He noticed that she looked at him and waved stealthily from afar, trying to hide her connection with him. He quietly told her to meet tonight, and she agreed. Then the elf lady asked Erwin if she knew him. She denied it immediately. Meanwhile, the same happened to Bjorn. Karag asked him if he knew the elf, but Bjorn said no. Of course, barbarians are free, spirited and loud, and this guy straight up shouted that there's no way a number one warrior like him would hang out with those cowardly earheads. This pissed off Erwin's friends, and the mood became tense all of a sudden, but she didn't escalate the situation. Bjorn was annoyed, but thankfully, the rest of the barbarians came out of the building. So Bjorn got up, telling the other barbarians that they should leave now that everyone's here. On the way, 
he noticed a child calling out to his father. The child ran up to his father and hugged him. They told each other that they missed one another. This was also a feature in the dungeon in Stone Game. Anyways, there were moments of joy once you came out of the labyrinth. People would meet their families and friends. However, there were also moments where people would die, and the repercussions of that could be felt. A woman cries to her husband's companion, begging him to tell her where he is. But the companion can say nothing because her husband had died. Another moment happens where a woman is crying as a little girl innocently asks her mother where her brother is. These moments of agony and sadness couldn't be felt throughout the two game graphics. But now, seeing it in real life, his feelings were in chaos. After some time, the barbarians raised their mugs to drink the night away, pouring liquor down their throats like true barbarians. Jorn thought these guys were going to do something important and he was worried he might miss a necessary step of sorts. But they were just trying to get drunk. He was angry looking at them, wasting his time. So he slammed his hand on the table and told them that he had somewhere else to be. Karak was shocked upon hearing this. The whole crowd became angry when they heard this. It looked as if they would kill him, because he is the protagonist of the night, and he is leaving. But they let him go happily, while still calling him the best warrior. As he walked through the streets of Raftonia, he could hear the laughter and joy in people's voices. This place was peaceful, and he felt comfortable walking around. He thought that there were no monsters or humans that would harm him. As he looked around at stores, he felt the relaxation of being in a place that had rules and laws. In this place, even if he fell down on the ground, nothing would happen to him. Unlike the labyrinth, someone might even help him. Then he walked into a hotel to properly take a rest, then started thinking that this other world might be more barbaric than the 21st century Earth, but it was still peaceful. Then he got a room for himself so he could change and shower. All those near-death encounters in the labyrinth had made him realize that living in Raftonia might not be that bad. After he came out of the shower, feeling refreshed, and now all he wanted was a comfortable bed to sleep, but thoughts of his home were rushing through his mind. He still wanted to go home, even if there is no one to greet him at home. As nighttime approached, Jorn woke at nine at night, feeling fully refreshed and relaxed. He remembered that he came out of the labyrinth at noon, so he must have slept around four to five hours. It was now time to go meet Erwin at the Black Whale Tavern but an old man told him that the Black Whale Tavern was sold off ten years ago. Jorn was shocked to hear this. Then the old man got more into detail. Apparently, the son of the original owner got into gambling addiction, ending up costing him the tavern, so the name and the owner both changed. Jorn kind of expected it, but the game's version of Raftonia must have been years behind this one. Then he asked the old man the new name for the tavern. The old man told him the new name. The tavern was now called Python Path, and Bjorn had arrived at the place ready to meet Erwin. After seeing it, he wondered that the Black Whale Tavern used to look much different from this place in the game. He was glad that at least he can read this world's language, so he had to go to the library to fill his missing knowledge of this world. Then he entered, and this place was filled with people going wild. He immediately started looking around for Erwin but she found him before he could. She called him over by waving her hand and saying his name. However, he noticed the elf lady from earlier was also there. The short-haired woman stared at him angrily, saying that he is the barbarian from earlier. He introduced himself as Jandal's son, Bjorn, and asked her who she was. She said she's the older sister of Erwin. Then Bjorn said that her name couldn't be older sister, so she just told him to call her Teresa. Then he remembered that Erwin's last name was Teresa, so this lady was trying to keep her real name hidden. He asked her reason why she was there. Then she stood up and slammed her hand on the table. She asked Bjorn why he called Erwin to such an inappropriate tavern like this last night, and then stood her up, making her stay the night out. And now he is asking what her purpose here is. She insults him calling him a thick-skinned barbarian.
Then Jorn asks her what she means by it. Then she replied and said, Are you trying to play dumb? After hearing that, he got confused and asked Erwin how much time it has been since they got out from the labyrinth. She answers him that it had been 30 hours. Jorn was feeling like an idiot right now. First, he thought it had been four to five hours. But nope, it had been a whole 30 hours. He realized the reason why he felt so refreshed after waking up. It was because he slept over a day. Seeing Erwin, he was feeling sorry. So he apologized and told them that he overslept. After hearing that, both of them were shocked, especially Erwin's sister, to see a barbarian apologizing. After that, in shock and embarrassment, she asks Bajorn why he would call Erwin. Jorn could have given many long reasons, but he said he had no obligation to answer her. She can ask Erwin if she wants and piss her off again. She says he is just a beginner, and then Bjorn replies that she should throw away that kind of attitude unless she intends on taking care of Erwin all her life. Then she calls him a savage and slams a huge bag of 350,000 magic stones on the table. After seeing it, he feels like he is in K-dramas. Jorn just stared at the stones, and this made Erwin's sister wonder why he wasn't taking it. She knew that he had a different reason for asking Erwin to meet. Does she think Bjorn is Johnny Bro or something who accepts any types of payments? Jorn looked at Erwin and asked her if she agrees with her. But she doesn't know what to say. At least for a moment. However, Jorn tells her that the deal for giving her the essences was that she'd help until he got the amount he wanted. After hearing that, Erwin was a little disappointed. Then Bjorn told her that they would also split the rewards 50-50. Erwin was overjoyed at first, but suddenly she realized something and asked for Bjorn's forgiveness because she wouldn't be able to go labyrinth exploring with him anymore. This made Bjorn wonder and puzzled because he thought that they were a really good and pretty compatible duo. Then her sister explained that she comes and explores the labyrinth with her from now on. She said that they were just following tradition and letting her go alone since it was her first time. However, she never intended on letting Erwin explore the labyrinth on her own. Jorn now realized that she already had someone to accompany her through the labyrinth, and he was jealous of people with personal connections. Then she pushed the bag further towards him and said that if he understood, he should just take this pouch. But Bjorn stopped her and said that it was a result of splitting the essences in half. She responded that this was indeed because it's the loot they got together. But according to Bjorn, the bag was still lacking 280,000 stones because the promised share was 9 to 1. She smirked and slammed another bag with the remaining 280,000 stones on the table. He realized that this woman just tried to con him and he kind of gets why the barbarians hated elves now. He immediately told her to get out if she is done here, so that he and Erwin can get on with the remain private matters they needed to talk about. Of course, she wasn't going to move, but Erwin poked her on the elbow and told her that while she appreciated her coming here with her, she should go now. She wanted to thank Bjorn and say her goodbyes. This was one of those weird moments when you realize your younger sibling isn't a child anymore, However, she retaliated, pointing her finger at Bajorn and asking him to swear that he won't sleep with Erwin. If he agrees to swear, she will leave immediately. Erwin was embarrassed and shocked that she would say that out loud. Meanwhile, Bjorn wondered if that meant that all the other options were still on. She told him to swear. It didn't mean anything to him, but he swore on his warrior's honor. But Erwin looked most disappointed. After that, she decided to leave, but she still had something else to say to Bjorn. She turned around, thanked him for saving Erwin and keeping her saving Erwin and keeping her safe in the labyrinth. Erwin slammed her head on the table in embarrassment and was worried that she might have upset her sister. She had never spoken up for herself like this before, and if she was mad at her now. Jorn told her that she didn't look angry because she was smiling and told her not to worry about it. Erwin remembered and apologized to him that they won't be able to be a team again because she had made up her mind to work with her sister a long time ago. He told her that she didn't need to apologize. Jorn was a considerate and rational guy. Even he wouldn't have rejected the offer either if some high-level elf offered to carry him. Then Erwin pulled out another bag of 63,000 magic crystals. These were from the loot that they got from the redhead and the crossbow guy. 
and she had already taken her share, so this was all that was left for him. She also told him that she left the two backpacks that she took off at her place, and there were a bunch of things there. So she invited him to take a look for himself tomorrow. Jorn was surprised that she knows what he wanted to ask without him mentioning anything, but he was disappointed that he already had to give her up as his teammate. Then Erwin asked the last question, and she asked him how she should repay him. He was confused. Then she explained that she had told him that she would repay him for helping her. This is the reason why her sister made him swear that he wouldn't sleep with her. For a moment, Johnny Bro took him over. However, he just told her that he couldn't think of anything at the moment and then asked her if she wanted to eat anything. She told him that she wasn't hungry, so he decided that he would just order for himself because he was starving. This brought an idea to Erwin's mind. She said that she wanted alcohol. She hadn't taken a sip of alcohol yesterday because she wanted to drink the first return drink with him and truly celebrate with him. Jorn remembered that return drinks were a culture in the game, especially for elves who only lived in their shrines until they were adults and put huge importance on the first return drink. He said that he was glad, but Erwin leaned in closer and told him that he's supposed to say thank you, and he said thanks to her. Erwin was happy. She told him that they went through so much together in the labyrinth, so it was a given that they share their first return drink with each other. She said that this is probably not his first return drink, though. But he says that it was actually the first time he was going to have a return drink. She was surprised to know that he was serious when he told her that he was only 20 years old, which is the same age as her. She had initially thought that he might just be joking. He told her that it was his first time in the labyrinth as well. They start celebrating, and as they're celebrating, Erwin tells Bjorn that he did a great job. Then he tells her that she was great too. The two raise their mugs and slam their mugs together in a toast. After a bit, their mugs were empty and their food was done. Erwin said that Bjorn was wearing a shirt today as she looked at him, and Bjorn only said in his mind that she was wearing a skirt today. Bjorn took a big sip of rum and decided that it was time for him to talk about the more important stuff now. Meanwhile, Erwin just kept admiring his ability to drink. He asked her if she still wanted to repay him, because he has thought of a way. She asked him what it was, but he said he couldn't tell her here, because he feared that the security would come after them. She blushed and looked at him and asked him if they should head up to his room. After they went to the Bujern room, Outside of Bjorn's door, moaning of a woman can be heard from inside. Inside, Bjorn told her to spread wider. He was sweating as he tried hard. As she moaned and screamed louder and said to let it go, he was just scratching her shoulder to check her stats effects. But Erwin screamed out loud from the pain, telling him that he was going to dislocate her shoulder because it had never gone that far back before. He still wanted to make sure, though, and asked her if she was sure this was the breaking point. She swore on her family, crying and screaming, so he let her go and told her to rest for a bit. When he let her go, she was in complete shock at being alive. She thought she would lose her arm and life from all that. She looked annoyed and disappointed. She wanted to know if he asked her to come to his room just so he could check her abilities and stats. Then he said that ability use wasn't allowed within the city and he really wanted to check the difference in her body after the essence. But in reality, he wanted to check the difference between the game and real life. He did this because Dungeon and Stone was not a user-friendly game. There were three main stats. Body, Mind, and Ability stats. However, there was a plus icon on the side of each of the main stats. And when you press it, there are thousands of detailed stats. For example, if stamina were to increase, you could carry heavier items and perform better in physical attacks. This was the reason that different characters were capable of different things, despite the numbers of their stats being the same. Jorn has come to learn of this because he practically put his whole life into the game. But there were still stats that had effects he still did not know about. Erwin was hoping and asking if there is something else they are going to do. Meanwhile, Bjorn was there wondering about the obsession stat that came with the essence Erwin ate. He doesn't know much about it except that it was a low-ranking stat in the mind stat, and that's all he knew about it. So he asked her if she felt a change in her mindset after she left the labyrinth. Did she start overthinking about something or having patience issues? He needed to know more. She wasn't sure. Still, 
She remembered that she had a desire for cookies right as soon as she came out of the labyrinth. She did not like them before, but she ate a bunch of them when she came back. He wondered if the obsession stat increased desire, which is probably a given. There were still other stats he didn't know about, so he had to take it into consideration when choosing the essence. Maybe this is the reason why she is so horny for Bjorn, because of the obsession stat. As he was thinking, the horny elf pulled his shirt and said she was sleepy. There were still things he wanted to check, but he couldn't anymore. So they decided to sleep, putting out all the candles in the room. Jorn closed his eyes, ready to relax. In that moment, he remembered something, something he had sworn on. As Erwin slept leaning on his chest, he remembered that her sister had made him swear not to sleep with her. But he said to himself that she probably meant the other kind of sleeping together. They got up early in the morning and had brought all of the loot back to Bjorn's inn. Erwin asked Bjorn if he was going to sell everything. Bjorn told her that he was going to sell most of it, except for a few items. Erwin had her eye on a piece of gear, a leather outfit, and a belt. She asked him if she could have it. He told her that she can have it if she subtracts its cost from her share, and she agreed. Later on, they went to a merchant shop where they sold all of the extra equipment for a good amount of money. The sword was sold for 350,000 stones. Later, Jorn sold some more stuff for 180,000 stones. Then, they sold the backpacks, which went for a whopping 250,000 stones. After a few more visits to different shops and merchants, they had a solid amount of money in their hands. The bags of money had piled up, and they had earned a total of 1,450,000 stones. As they held the bags of money in their hands, Erwin was shocked after seeing that much money. But she earned just change compared to Bjorn. He really is a heartless man. Bjorn gets almost 1.4 million stones after subtracting Erwin's share because he also killed a man alone before meeting her. He had never made this much money in the game start before. This was a nice start for him. They walked out into the street. Jorn told her that this is where they should part. This surprised Erwin. Then he wondered why she was surprised, because they had already decided to go their separate ways. He told her that they're taking the same route, so they should walk to the central square together. Even though she agreed to it, she really wanted to spend more time with him. As they walked up to the town square, they saw a huge crowd of people standing around a guillotine blade. Jorn and Erwin walked up there. A guard screamed out loud, stating that there was an execution happening and that everyone should back off. A man was forced into the guillotine, his head and hands poking out as his face sealed up with bandages. These people hadn't committed any serious crimes. Their only crime was that they hadn't been able to pay the taxes. The execution began and the guard pulled at the rope. Raftonia was the final remaining city of the other world that ended at the hands of a witch's curse. The only place to get resources in this limited space was the labyrinth. Therefore, those who couldn't pay taxes were executed to decrease the number of mouths to feed. As the blood hit the pavement from those who were executed, a bunch of people came running and holding pieces of bread. They dipped their bread in the blood and started eating it. Erwin was barely holding herself from throwing up, asking Bjorn why they were dipping bread into the blood. He told her that there's a legend that everyone who drinks the blood of the executed will gain great financial luck. Bjorn asked Erwin how much the taxes were for the first year. She told him that it's 700,000 stones for non-humans. He realized that it was a bit off from the game, but similar. He asked her what it is from the second year and afterwards. She told him that it was 800,000 stones, and they were exchanging fees too. This was the same number as the game. As they stood there, looking at them devour the bread with blood sauce, Jorn started thinking about tax rise each year of work. And if he can't get back to his real life, and if he can't compete with the increasing taxes, his blood might be the one that people are dipping their bread into. And to avoid that, he has to save money. And for that, he needs to become an explorer that can at least reach the sixth floor. The scene switches to the library. As he walked in, he wondered why people were staring at him because he was a barbarian in the library. 
Then he saw Anar using a book in the library as a pillow and sleeping. Well, it's good that she's okay, because we didn't see her after he came out with the other barbarians. He walked up to her and poked her, wondering why she was there. She woke up, saliva drooling down her face as she looked at him. Jorn looked at her and said that he was glad to see she was doing fine. She gave him a smile, telling him that she feels the same. He told her to lower her voice because they were in a library. She answered that she never expected to see her fellow barbarian here. Jorn asked her what she was doing here. She told him that she was here because of what he said to her earlier. He told her that she should think before acting, and she wanted to gather more knowledge in order to think properly. Jorn was surprised because she is different from the rest. She tells him that while she was in the labyrinth, she realized that the monsters weren't the only enemies they had to encounter. As she's speaking, Bajorn thinks about how if there was any regular barbarian in her place, they would be bragging about their experience. Instead, she said that this is why she decided to study, but she found reading to be very, very difficult for her. So she wanted to learn how to read and write properly, and she was thinking of going to their shrine so she could learn all that from the elders. He asked her if she was going right now, and she said that if she doesn't, she would forget about it. As she's walking, she remembers that she promised to repay him for his advice if they came back alive from the labyrinth. She told him that if he ever needed anything, all he had to do was ask her at the Angry Bull Tavern. He looked at her and said that he would definitely come to her if he needed. He was simultaneously hoping that she doesn't forget about this promise in a couple of days, because he was probably going to need her help very soon. Anyways, he needed to find a book, and he didn't know how to do that in a place this big. His eyes went straight towards a girl, sitting at the front desk, which is the librarian. He walked up to her as she slept on the job. He tried speaking to her, and the girl woke up while raising her head. She looked at him and asked him what he needed. He tells her that he's looking for a book, one that is related to history, but she interrupts him and casts some spells, conjuring up a weird ball of light that starts floating towards Bajorn. He's confused about what magic she cast. Then the ball of light shimmers its way into his chest. Jorn is unsure of what changed because he doesn't feel any different. The librarian tells him that now he can find any book that he's looking for in the library. She also tells him that he's allowed to borrow any book, but he has to put it back where he takes it from. Bjorn tries to ask for details about the magic, but the librarian already becomes the sleeping beauty. After that, he walks around in the library. He quickly realizes how the magic works. It's quite simple. All he has to do is walk around, and the book he wants to read would shine. Now he understands why there's only one librarian in a library and in a library this big, and she still has time to sleep. After that, he starts reading books. The first book, titled The Fallen World, talks about the history from thousands of years ago, where no living beings could live due to a witch's curse. And the last remaining fortress, Raftonia, was the only place that managed to avoid the disaster. The royal family opened up a dimension for the people who were starving to death because of limited resources. That became the labyrinth. This was similar to the game's prologue. He already knows it. Then the second book he read was Alchemy's Basics. It talks about how magic crystals from monsters can be made into bread, water, steel, and such. They are literally changing the atomic structure. Isn't it too much? Well, it was also too much for Bjorn to understand the theory, so he just memorized it for now. After that, the next book was Is Sacred War 3. It talks about how the barbarians and the elves come to hate each other. The fourth book he really wants to read about was The Evil Spirits of the Abyss. The evil spirits refer to those people who had come from different dimensions and had possessed other people's bodies. This was technically correct, but it doesn't describe why it happens. It's clear that the temples and the royal family had tried their hardest to get rid of this phenomenon. Well, what I think is that someone from the royal family is also one of the people from Earth. Like Earth. And then he made it public to get rid of any competition. Well, it's just my theory. He learned one thing from it, 
And that is, as long as he didn't say any of the forbidden words, he would be pretty much okay. The fifth book titled On the Death of the King is about the first ever king, also called the Immortal King, Lavagen III. It talks about how he died over 150 years ago. Basically, he lived for thousands of years. Since he was the first king, and I think it's also related to evil spirits and my theory. The game's story started after his death. So that means Bjorn was 150 years after the game timeline. This is why his knowledge of the game world kept contradicting the reality in this world. Previously, I think I said it was a 10-year gap, but it was actually a 150-year gap. After that, he moved on to the book about the dimension's instability of observation records. While reading this book, Jorn had a realization that this might be the book that the blondie who had saved him had read. This book mentions a theory that says entering a portal in the moment that it was closing could have something to do with that instability. Perhaps that is why that happened to him. That made him feel depressing, because he had no one else to blame but himself for the torture he had to go through. It had gotten dark outside, so he decided to read the rest later. After that, he goes back to his room and thinks about how it had been three whole days since he had left the labyrinth. The labyrinth opens up on every first day of the month at exactly midnight. So he has 27 days left to prepare himself, and he has to find a new member for his party from tomorrow onwards. In early moroning, Bjorn woken up by loud knocking noises on his room's door. It was Erwin who was knocking the door. He hurried to get out of bed, then he opened the door to see why she was standing outside. He asked her why she was banging on his door so early in the morning. He was just saying, but suddenly he felt an incredibly powerful gust of wind. It was Erwin's new contract. She was excited to show Bjorn that she had succeeded with the new Sprit contract. She told him that she had tried ten times with the Spirit Stone, that her sister gave her, and it worked out, and it's a wind spirit. It was perfect match with her fire spread. He congratulates her, but in his mind, he was think about that how rich her sister and her family is, because Sprit Stone is an item that lets you sign a contract with a Sprit with 10% possibility. But they are pretty expansive, and she tried in times. And before she was saying she have a little brother to take care, acting like a poor, helpless lady. Well, whatever. After he saw it, he told her to get rid of it. She wanted to show him more telling him that she hadn't shown him everything she can do than her to look what mass she made in his room. After seeing it, she started to apologies. She promised to clean up the whole mess right away. A little while later, Erwin sat on the bed looking tired after she was done cleaning up the whole room. Jorn looked at the room and wondered how incredibly talented she was at cleaning even though she had told him before that she was great at it. He congratulated her on having a contract with a spirit, and she was really happy as she thanked him. But he is a stud. He told her that she shouldn't have come to him just to show him this. He tells her that she should have spent her time much more wisely because she would have to go back into the labyrinth in 26 days. While Erwin agreed with his logic, she had wanted him to be the first to know about her achievement. Bjorn wondered why she felt so attached to him and speculated that it might be due to an obsession trait she gained from a goblin archer essence. He wanted to maintain a business, like relationship, but also expressed his willingness to be there for her as a friend and fellow comrade. As the morning continued, Bjorn planned to use his time effectively. He went to a place called the Angry Bull, where many barbarians were staying. He was welcomed by cheers from the crowd, being recognized as the strongest warrior. Inside the inn, a barbarian warrior informed Bjorn that he could stay for a cheap price due to multiple barbarian sharing rooms. Bjorn revealed that he was there to see Fenelein's third daughter. He was still forgetting the names. Then that barbarian correct him, because Einar was Fenelein's second daughter, and I think it is very important. Einar arrived to the scene and that guy told her that Bjorn was looking for her. She walked up to Bjorn and asked him why he had come to see her. Bjorn told her that he had a favor to ask her, which is that he wanted to fight her. She asked him if this was for training purposes, 
And he said yes, he needed to get stronger, because he knew he wouldn't be able to survive with his current fighting skills. Aner told him that it wasn't really a favor. If you wanted that all he had to do was come out to the field where there were already dozens of sparring. She told him that as long as it wasn't in the morning, she was ready to fight whenever he wanted. He told her that they should begin right away. The crowd was ready to see some combat as Dujorn dashed towards her. He knew that he came to learn, but he wasn't intending to lose either. The fight began, and Bjorn rushed toward Aner with his full power. Aner was also ready. She swung her sword, and Bjorn's body hit the ground with his face bruised and nose bleeding. Crowd starting to shout that Aner is the best warrior now. She walked up to him and asked him if he was okay. He answered that he was fine and asked her for one more fight. And just like that, they keep fighting for entire day. They both are huffing like a dog. But Aner asked Bjorn that it's fine if he wanted to keep going, but she would like to rest for a bit. I don't know why, but to me it's looked like she is also from another world. It's just my thoughts. He told her that was enough for today, and asked her if she was going to go to the labyrinth alone next time around as well. And she nodded. She told him that she was too broke to form a party. So this was her only option. Jorn immediately asked if she'd like to be his teammate, and he would keep 80 of the profits, but that he would pay for the party fees and everything but in reply. She told him to shut up, as she had already heard enough. Jorn stated to feel nervous. He was worried she wouldn't agree to be his teammate. So he brought up other ideas for her to stick around. But Aner just grabbed his hand and told him that she wouldn't understand even if he tried to explain it to her. However, she trusted him to join the party. He told her that he was looking forward to working with her. Next day, Jorn headed to the Barbarian Shrine, a place of great importance to the barbarians. Here they saw the chief of the tribe. I like this old man's smile. He welcomed both Aner and Bjorn. Old man asked him if he had come to learn how to read and write, like Einar had. But Bjorn denied it. He was not here for that, it was come here something more. That thing called the Spirit Seal. Or more specifically, he wanted a Spirit Seal called the Undead Seal. In this world, every species have specific trait to them. Elves enter contracts with Spritz in order to borrow their powers. And Dwarves receive the Blessing of Armor which increases the effects of all their items and the beast people, enter into contracts with ancient beasts, called spirit beasts, as for the barbarians they had, the spirit seal. The chief got way too close to Bjorn's face, aggressively asking him how he even found out about that. The chief knew that usually that wouldn't be common knowledge to a young barbarian. So how did he find it? This had made the chief suspicious, but it doesn't matter, though, since Bjorn had gone to the library to find out more information about the seal. So he told him that he read about it in a book, and that he had heard that spirit seals were greatly helpful in the war against the elves. The chief's attitude immediately turned. He told Bjorn that he was proud of him and Aner for reading books. He said that he had no reason to deny the spirit seal. Bjorn immediately wanted it, but before he could even finish his sentence, the old man told him the spirit seal would cost him 800,000 stones, as the chief looked almost giddy, knowing that Bjorn could never afford that. He looked at him like an accomplished person, almost as if he had won this scenario. Bjorn told him that he would pay for it, surprising Aner on how he could even afford that, because she was not there when Bjorn's stones counted. This was a careful plan by Bjorn, you see. Spirit Seal was difficult to obtain at the start of the games because of its prices. Especially because the higher your rank would get the rarer the ingredients he would need on top of the already large sum of money. But now he have money. He dropped four bags, one bag, which had 500,000 stones. And the other three bags had 100,000 stones each. The chief was shocked this time and he asked Bjorn about where Bjorn got that much money. But Bjorn had already thought of a reason to tell him. If the old man didn't ask, Bjorn would have been disappointed. So he began to tell him a story that he would love. About an injured elf that he found on the first floor, he told the chief that he used the elf as his slave, 
and used her to acquire as many stones as he could. Then he fed her a essence and got even more money from her sister as payment those elves were completely helpless against the might of Jorns. Well, it's actually true if you look at it from other perspective. Old man liked it as he laughed out loud, claiming that he hadn't laughed this hard in years. What's more, a whole group of barbarians came around to appreciate his act, and Jorn liked the attention. Nonetheless, the old man had a reward for him. He liked Bjorn's story so much that he gave him two coins, each one worth 100,000 stones. So he made 200 zero stones by just telling a story. Jorn raised his fist in celebration, letting the barbarians hear what they wanted. He loved the attention. He felt good inside when they gave him compliments. Let's learn a bit more about the spirit seals. You see, spirit seals are strengthening techniques. They make the body absorb the essence of magical ingredients and give the body a special power. The barbarians had a ritual of tattooing babies when they were newborn while their souls are clean so that the soul pathways are still visible even as adults. This why all barbarians are tattooed. And here I am thinking that because they look cool with them. After that, as he sat in front of the shaman, guiding him towards the path of the spirit seal, he received one last warning. The shaman told him explicitly that there was no way out of this once he received this spirit seal. He cannot receive another kind of spirit seal if he choose this path. Bjorn had accepted it. This undead seal is the essence of a tanker barbarian. So the shaman began the process by raising his needle at Jorn's back. He knew that this was the right choice he had played the game too long to not know this. Red rays of light began to pour out. Entering the tattoos on Jorn's back, he was starting to feel it. He felt it on his back, and then he felt it through his entire body. The pain was overwhelming. It hurt so bad that he wanted to scream but he had to endure this every time he wanted to upgrade his sprit seal. After long pain, he activated the first level of the seal, and his natural regenerative skill had increased greatly. He thanked the shaman for the seal, but got shaman shocked after hearing that, and start laughing, because this was the first time a warrior thanked a witch doctor. Jorn was confused about why is he laughing, or did he did something wrong? Jorn quickly started walking out before the shaman start getting suspicious. The morning was here, and Bjorn headed out to the commercial district to buy necessary equipment. After training with Einar for quite a long time, he had learned that he definitely wasn't fit to be a swordsman. His plan was to only use shield techniques after a point. So building proficiency in swordsmanship would be pointless. This is why he was looking for a one-handed blunt weapon. The shopkeeper showed him a large collection of blunt weapons that barbarians prefer. These were good-looking weapons that Bjorn knew would fit a barbarian's taste, but he asked for a more normal-looking one. The shopkeeper handed him a simple bronze mace, which immediately caught his eye. It was a small mace that cost 220,000 stones. After that, he did some more shopping, buying himself a custom fit helmet and a half-armor plate that fit him perfectly as well, which cost him 530,000 stones. Now, he was left with only 50,000 stones. A lot of time had passed since he had left the labyrinth, and his daily routine eventually set itself. He also met Erwin every day. He would wake up at 7 in the morning and get some breakfast with Erwin. Then he headed to the library and read until afternoon. After that, he always ate lunch at new locations, just so he could gather information that wasn't readily available in the books of the library listening to adventurers speak. At around five, he would make his way to the end where the barbarians were living, and he would train there. By the seventh day of training, he started to go up against different barbarians, testing out his strength against the lot. There were no techniques or systematic combat skills involved in these duels. It was just a fight with your instincts, and that was good practice for the labyrinth. After regular training, he had become strong enough that he could even win against Einar sometimes in duels. During the duel, she would compliment him on his skills improving. Although when he beat her, he would tell her that she had a pattern of fighting. But since it was habitual, 
Anar had a hard time changing her patterns. At night, he would get home and wash up, after which it was time for Erwin to come see him again. He walked out of the shower and saw her there. He asked her how she could make the one-hour walk journey every single day, but she was usually just happy to see him and wanted to eat dinner with him. They would be together till 11 p.m., after which she bid him good night as it was time for her to leave. After that, she stood there for a second, looking back at him and telling him good luck for the labyrinth. Because the day was almost there, they were going back in tomorrow. As he wished Erwin the same for her time in the labyrinth, Jorn realized how quickly the time had passed. There were only 24 hours left before the labyrinth gates opened. I clear it to you if you are confused. Jorn can't see these pop-up windows. The next day, at 8.10, they went to the Explorer Guild to receive the Unity Magic. They arrived inside the building and walked up to the counter. He asked to receive the Unity Magic. The cashier lady looked at them and wanted to make sure that it was just the two of them. Bjorn acknowledged it, telling her that she was correct, and in return, she told them to place their hands on the crystal. As they put their hands on the crystal, the lady proclaimed that two rank 9 explorers would have to pay 15,000 stones. It was an expensive fee, considering that this was just a one-time use thing. However, it was a necessary thing to get. The Unity Magic had only one purpose. It existed so that you would spawn at the same spot in the labyrinth as your teammate. Jorn asked the woman at the counter about what determined the rank of explorers. She told him that they judge it by the amount of essence in one's soul, which made Bjorn curious if the price would also increase with his rank. The lady told him that he was right, and that it was only valid for 24 hours from now. Anyway, after they got their unity magic, it was time to go and eat. Anar looked like she was in love at the look of the food, wondering what the hell this was. Well, Jorn had ordered the most expensive meal at the tavern as a last feast before entering the labyrinth. He told her that this meal cost 800 stones, as she drooled at the sight. He told her to try it. And just as she took one bite, it was all well worth it. It was almost as if she found herself to be in heaven. It felt like a dream to her. The food was way too good. This meal had motivated her. She wanted to work harder from this moment onward so that she could earn a lot of money and get this meal every day. This makes Bjorn think about what she is eating until now. After that, at midnight, there were only 10 minutes before the labyrinth would open. The guards were stopping people from entering before it began. As Bjorn was noticing the size of the humongous portal, he heard a loud commotion in the background. It was a group of freshly turned warriors. They were cheering Parthun as a great warrior. Bjorn wondered how they even managed to find their way every time. I think there is another worlder like Bjorn every time in the new group. Again, it's just my thinking. Einar, on the other hand got sentimental looking at them. It reminded her of the good old days, which was literally just a month ago. The announcer told everyone that they could now enter. Einar got excited and told Bjorn that they should go now, but he told her to wait. Instead, he was trying to explain how an unstable portal could help them spawn closer to the second floor's gate. But she just told him to shut up about it and tell her what to do, once it's time. After all, she had blind faith, and she knew that she was too dumb to understand his explanation. There was only one minute remaining until the gate closed, and she got a bit nervous that they weren't going to make it in time. Jorn noticed how much smaller it had gotten than how it initially started. It was about the same size when he first went into it. As well, he was just waiting for the guard to say that it was about to close, which would be his cue. That's when he heard the guards scream out that the gate would close soon, and Jorn was ready. He told Einar to go, and the two began to dash towards the gate. It was time for them to enter, and even though the guard tried to stop them, telling them it's dangerous as they passed through the gate, they had found themselves in complete darkness. As Bjorn opened his eyes, he knew that he was right. Bjorn was right. It was the dark region of the first floor, which made Einar panic because she couldn't see anything. He came prepared, though. He had brought torches with him this time. As he entered, he saw a large concrete slab, 
which made Einar a bit confused as she asked him what that was. Jorn explained that this was a monument, which they can use to open the portal gate to the second floor. This time around, they weren't going to stick around on the first floor at all. They were going to the second floor immediately. You see, beyond the barbarian, Bjorn was an expert gamer, and every pro needs to know how to utilize and exploit bugs. Jorn opened the portal to the second floor, and after seeing this, Einar was in shock, as I explained before. But Jorn gained two experience points because he opened the portal first. And because of this, Jorn's level increased, and he is finally level two now. And also, the maximum capacity of essences has been increased by one. Let's talk about this later. Both of them entered the second floor. Einar asked Bjorn how they got here so quickly. The chief said that it takes at least three days to get to the second floor. Jorn answered that he read about it in a book. Einar complimented him and said that he is amazing. This time, the second floor they came to isn't the goblin forest, but the land of the dead. Then Bjorn asked Einar if she is feeling something. She asked what he is saying. Then Jorn told her that it feels like something is filling his entire body from inside his veins. After hearing that, Einar congratulated him and told him that his spirit status must have gone up. Then Bjorn understood that this is leveling up. There are also levels in Dungeon and Stone and B, which are needed when using skills, increase with level. The amount of essences one can consume also increases with each level. Since Bjorn is now level 2, he can take two essences. Einar was still confused because his spirit status increased without killing any monsters. Then, Jorn explained to her that it was because opening that portal counted as an accomplishment. Experience. It's called accomplishments in this world, but you can only gain it once per type of monster. After a certain point, it becomes very difficult to obtain, and one way to break that wall is to open the first portal with a speedrun. The experience earned from opening the portal doesn't stop after the first time, so if used well, it's an easy way to gain experience. So, he has to keep this trick a secret. So, he told Einar that it's a secret. So if anyone asks, tell them that it took them two days to get to the second floor. Einar was confused, but she agreed. After that, they moved out from there before the experienced explorers get there. First, I was thinking, why is his helmet weird? Now, I understand why. So, it is used for holding the torches. It's quite practical indeed. Then, Einar touches Bjorn's helmet, and it's not hot. Then, Jorn explains that it's because torches are magic tools and stay on for three days once turned on. That's why it's possible to use them like that. If not, Bjorn's head will be roasted alive. The Land of the Dead has stronger monsters on average than Goblin Forest. However, there are no traps so it's less tricky than Goblin Forest. In other words, this place is much better for two barbarians. Einar saw the ghouls. There were just three of them because it's just the first day. There will be about three times this amount on the third day. This made Einar excited, so she decided to take care of them herself, and she finished them in a single swing. After that, she started boasting, saying that the second floor is easy. Then suddenly, a sound of laughing and screaming came. She got scared and held Jorn's hand tight, asking him what that sound was. Then, Jorn explained to her that it was a banshee, a ghost monster. They don't attack first most of the time, so it's best to ignore them. And even if they try to attack them, their attack won't work on banshees anyway. Plus, if they attack first, they'll be cursed, and the banshees will be after them until they're out of the labyrinth. After hearing about the curse, Einar got too scared and started praising Jorn, saying that he was a wise warrior or it could have been bad. Then suddenly, a sound came from behind her, and she got so scared that she almost choked Bjorn to death. But thankfully, they were just skeletons, and she is back to her normal self again. Jorn tried to give her advice to go for the core, but she completely destroyed them and then asked him if he was saying something. What can poor Bjorn say now? But what's more important is that he also gained one experience point. 
After that, they traveled north for almost eight hours, and naturally, they were able to come across new monsters. Elder ghouls, which are double the size of normal ghouls, skeleton mutants called skeleton warriors, and even skeleton archers. But there was not much difficulty. There were only a few of them in numbers, because it's just the first day, and Bjorn's battle ability had grown quite a bit. First of all, Mace, his weapon now, was the perfect size and weight for him, so he was able to crush their skulls much more easily than the hammer. Next, the armor, which reduced the surface area he had to protect using the shield, letting him fight much more aggressively. The steel helmet might not protect him too well from a crossbow, but it easily stopped arrows from half-broken bows. He might be good at destroying the enemies, but there is one more who's just as good or better. Jorn feeling refreshed compared to the fights he participated in with Erwin. Jorn's arm was injured, but it healed soon. Then Einar asked Jorn. Then Einar asked Jorn the reason for it, or is this the spirit seal thing? He answered that yes, it was. The undead seal's level 1 effect is better natural regeneration. It takes only about 1 minute to heal 0.5 centimeters deep. Plus, his stamina itself recovers quickly too, increasing his endurance, meaning making him a perfect punching bag. Now, the ground is no longer wet. The terrain is different, and they are ready for the new adventure and new enemies with their heroic pose. I think I've seen this pose somewhere, but I can't quite pinpoint where. They were just giving a pose when suddenly a sound came from behind. This time, it's an 8th rank monster, Death Fiend. It's a scary monster that eats light, and you won't notice it until it comes near you. Jorn ordered Einar to attack its head. Einar was a little scared, but she said that she trusts him, and they started attacking the monster. But Death Fiend is not an easy opponent to beat. Its skin is as hard as a hard stone, and it's also super strong. Einar tried attacking its neck, but she was not strong enough to cut its head. She started panicking, asking Bjorn what to do. Death Fiend is known for its good defense. Plus, Death Fiends have a passive skill called Body Preservation, which helps him heal faster. Because of Einar's attack, Death Fiend used his active skill, Call of the Dead, to summon ghouls. Difficulty suddenly rose. It looks like Death Fiend's essence is great to become a necromancer. Jorn ordered Einar to take care of the ghouls first, and he faced the Death Fiend in the meantime. Jorn was holding the Death Fiend while Einar was fighting the ghouls. After Einar killed all the ghouls, she attacked the Death Fiend, which distracted it and gave Jorn a chance to attack its head. Jorn was feeling good after attacking it, but the Death Fiend attacked Bjorn pretty hard. Jorn also attacked it with full power, but it healed quite fast. Jorn couldn't attack fast enough to catch up with its regenerative speed, so he was thinking of giving up on killing it and going for ninth rank monsters. But suddenly, Einar lifted the Death Fiend's leg. Jorn understood that she is trying to mess with its balance, so he also attacked its other leg and flipped it down on its back. Because of its body, it was unable to get up on its own. This showed who the real villain here was. After that, both Bjorn and Einar started beating its head like they were pounding a rice cake. This reminded me of a Doramon movie when they got to the moon where Bunny makes rice cakes. They were really enjoying it. And just like that, they defeated the Death Fiend. It's lying behind a big stone. Einar was happy, but Bajorn told her that it's only worth 100 stones. But with ghouls, it's 300. She was shocked that one Death Fiend is worth only 100. Then Einar asked Bajorn how much the bread they had at the inn was. Jorn answered that the cream pie would about 300 stones. She was happy, and said that she can enjoy one of those each time she kills a death fiend. This motivated Einar, but I think she forgot that they are splitting eight. Jorn gets 80, and Einar only 20. Well, whatever. Jorn was also happy because she was so active while Erwin was a bit passive. After that, they went around the area hunting death fiends. As soon as they came across one, they attacked its two legs to bring it down and started pounding its head until it died. They hunted about 70 death fiends like that all day. 
At the beginning of Dungeon and Stone, where the essence drop rate is very low, most people build their base on the essence they pick up. That's why he aimed for a Death Fiend's essence, which would synergize with his undead seal and has a nice passive skill. But they haven't gotten any. On the second day, the Death Fiends now appear in pairs, but they had learned how to deal with them already, so it wasn't as difficult as he expected. They knocked one down and worked together to knock down the other one. Of course, if they can't kill the Death Fiends quickly, they might be surrounded by ghouls, putting them in danger. Death Fiends don't chase enemies out of their territory, so they just need to run like hell. Starting in the afternoon, the Death Fiends started appearing in groups of three. So, when the second day was coming to an end, they stopped hunting Death Fiends. They decided to take rest. So, they found a cozy place to rest, but another team showed up. Jorn tried to scare them off, but before he could do anything, Einar scared them and quickly ran from there. Then she ordered Bjorn to move somewhere else, because they now know their location. They needed to find a different place to camp. It looks like they don't like humans at all. Maybe something similar to what happened to Erwin happened to her in the last labyrinth exploration. They were just searching for a good place to camp, when suddenly the screams of people asking for help came. They were shocked because these were not the sounds someone makes when attacked by a monster. Instead, it sounded like a person killing another. They tried to run away from there, but a voice stopped them. There are four fresh corpses there, and no fighting signs, and one woman standing there. This means she is a plunderer. Plunderers. They are people who professionally hunt explorers. Instead of collecting monster magic crystals, they loot explorers' equipment for profit. Of course, plundering is outlawed in Raftonia, and its punishment is death. But just like how Bjorn wasn't investigated for killing six explorers, although it was in self-defense, as long as no one mentions it, there is no way for people outside the labyrinth to know. For now, they are facing a strong plunderer, and she asks them if it is their first time seeing a plunderer. Both of them are stunned. Jorn didn't speak out loud, but he was thinking that he never seen a plunderer that looked as professional as her. She is over 170 tall and thin, with red hair that comes down to the shoulders and an injured right ear. This ear didn't look like that of a human. I think she is not human, or at least not a complete human, maybe half-elf or something else. Again, it's just my thoughts. She also have a tattoo underneath her eye. These kinds of traits make her very recognizable, but considering he never heard about her, she must be very good at her job. In other words, she leaves no witnesses. Then Einar tells Bjorn that she thinks that she is very strong. Bjorn starts analyzing her strength by seeing the corpses. There are a total of four corpses there. The equipment seems pretty high rank, and there's a mage too. They must be explorers active, on at least the fifth floor. Three of them don't have any external injuries and only threw up. The three must have been poisoned, and the last one must have had a tolerance. Then he asks her if she was teammates with them. She says that who knows. Maybe they thought so. After that, she started looting them. She put the looted items in a pocket plane bag, which are quite expensive. This makes Bjorn sure that he can't imagine how much stronger she is than them. She called them out and both of them were stunned, thinking about what to do. Then, Einar asks Bjorn if they're going to fight, but Jorn told her to run as fast as she can. Then both of them start running while the plunderer watches them. They run with their full power without looking back. Jorn looked for the signs to get to the first floor portal. While they are running, they meet a group of four human explorers. Einar was angry, but they have no choice. So Bjorn tried to get help from them by telling them about the plunderer. Then their leader asked Bjorn what is the guarantee that they are not the plunderers. So Bjorn swore on his warrior honor to verify it. They agreed, but on one condition, that they take all the rewards. Then their leader called them near, so they can use his gnome ability. It assimilates the user and others within a 3 meter range, with the environment. It's a very powerful ranged stealth ability. Its con is that you can't move, but this, you can entirely avoid fighting. 
Jorn was just thinking that they got lucky. But that man started laughing, saying how lucky they are that two barbarians just walked into their trap on their own. That man used the stone golem's active seal suppression on them, so they can't move now. To get free from it, they need to take damage. Even just one point will be enough to be free from this. They started looting Bjorn and embarrassing Anar. Jorn was angry after looting Bjorn. They decided to finish Bjorn in a single hit, but Jorn didn't want to die like that. So he focused all his mind, and as soon as the blade hit his neck and he took damage, he bent backward. After that, he killed that man and threw that blade towards Anar. It stabbed Anar and freed her from suppression. After that, Jorn fell on the ground, unable to do anything, but Anar alone was enough to slice them up. She also looked very pissed to me. Their leader ran away from there. Anar wanted to chase him, but Jorn was dying there. He was bleeding like hell. Bjorn was trying to say potion to her, but she started crying, saying that she will avenge him. But thanks to that, his mentality increased, which helped him keep his cool during the fight. After that, he drank a potion. It healed him, but it still left a scar. Thanks to his undead seal, he is alive. But Anar was congratulating him, saying that he is probably the only barbarian with a throat scar. After they got the equipment, they started chasing the guy who escaped and caught him. Anar was very angry, but Bjorn stopped and said that they need his ability to escape from that woman. But suddenly, a poison dart came and killed him. It was that woman who killed him. She said that the fight earlier was pretty impressive. That means she was watching them all this time. Jorn was afraid, but now that they can't run anymore, so he told Anar that they will face her head. On. So the fight with the tick girl began. Are there still my horny friends there? Looks like many of your dreams are breaking, or there's still some hope left. Let's wait and see. So... The fight begins. Anar swings her sword to attack her, but the plunderer dodged it. Then Bjorn attacked her after Anar, but she easily blocked his attack. Jorn started thinking how much essences she has. So Bjorn decided to drop his weapon and grab her and ask Anar to attack. But suddenly he fell to his knees. His entire body was void of strength because the plunderer pierced through his armor and stabbed his spine with the dagger. Jorn was confused about if she is an aura user. And if she is, then they have no chance of winning. Anar tried to attack her, but she was also injured by her. Then she asked them to give up, because poison is already spreading throughout their system, but she can let them live if they swear to not tell anyone what they saw. Jorn was confused why she is doing it. She tells them that it was her idea from the start. She really doesn't want to kill barbarians, because she was indebted to them. That's why she was just watching when they were attacked earlier. She wouldn't have had to kill them by herself if that group earlier had killed them. Anar on the ground told Jorn not to trust her, saying that she is messing with them. Then Jorn asked the plunderer, what if he refuses? Then she said that she will kill them. That's the promise. Then Jorn asked her who she has promised with. Then she got angry and told him that it's none of his business. Then, Jorn swore on his honor, which he sells like vegetables. After hearing that, she came close to Bjorn, saying that he was unique. Then poured the potion on Jorn's wound. Then she asked Anar about what she'd do, and she refused. Which shocked Bjorn, and the plunderer accepted it and was ready to kill her. But Jorn asked Anar to swear. Einar was not ready but Jorn asked her to trust him and reminded her that she said that she would do whatever he says. She was unsatisfied with it, but she agreed to swear. Then Bjorn asked her what floor she was at. She looked back and told them that it's the eighth floor. Then she disappeared from there, but Jorn promised to himself that it will be different next time they meet. After all that, it means they go back to the first floor to relax a bit. Jorn now has experience to go through the portal, so he landed all right, but Anar was not good at it. But Jorn asked her if she is all right. She said that it hurts, but as a non-warrior, she doesn't even deserve to talk about her pain now. 
Her mind is completely broken from the shame of begging for her life. Jorn tried to encourage her that the warrior that survives is the strongest, but she didn't buy it, saying that she won't understand if he talks too much. But still, she gets what he means, enduring this shame and desire. That means she is a strong warrior like Bjorn. But Bjorn doesn't feel any of those things because he is not a real barbarian. They have been awake for 20 hours now, and all the things they've gone through have made them mentally exhausted. But they can't sleep. Even Bjorn was not feeling as bad as Einar is, but still, he feels rather terrible. Jorn remembers his past when he was saved by Blondie, when the priestess refused to heal him, and the swordsman threw a potion at him like he was sad to see it go. He took the potion like a dog back then. He was happy to be alive, but he can't forget that feeling. He made the best choice he could in the situations he was put in. In other words, he was only focused on the present. But what else can he do? As soon as he opened his eyes, he saw someone be beheaded and things far from reality continued to happen. So he had no choice but to act out of prioritization for his safety. But he can't survive like this. So he decided to change his plans. Then he asked Einar if there is a way to become stronger but comes with great danger. Einar told him that she will do it. They all die if they don't get strong anyway. Then Bjorn told Einar that they are going to enter rupture. Then they go to a region where all four types of monsters come all at once. And this place has darkness, so this place is unpopular. And there's no reason to come here unless you're cutting through to save time. But that just means it's a great place to hide things. There was a memorial to the person who first discovered this labyrinth. The last wise man, Daifuian Grandel Gabrielius. Jorn told Einar that he is going to open a rupture, but everything that happens from this point onwards is a secret. Then Einar swore on her honor as a warrior and asked what a rupture is. Jorn explained that it's a labyrinth inside a labyrinth. In the game, it's called an instance dungeon. It's a dungeon cleared by chosen members. The first floor rupture requires you to place the magic crystals of four types of monsters on the memorial stone and with a magic crystal from an 8th rank monster from the 2nd floor. Then the rupture will open. The Death Fiend's magic crystals open an instance dungeon that's capacity is for 5 people. The difficulty of the instance depends on the party members. Now, who else will join them? Rupture. A labyrinth inside a labyrinth. It's a new realm that opens randomly on each floor. A cooldown time exists for ruptures. In order for the first floor rupture to naturally open back up, it needs at least three months in city time. But waiting around for rupture to open is very inefficient. So people began finding ways to force the rupture open. There are four ruptures on the first floor. The one they entered was the Blood Tinted Castle. Einar was shocked after seeing the size of the castle. Jorn knew that it'd be the Blood Tinted Castle since he used a Death Fiend's magic crystal but it's still overwhelming to see in real life. The good thing is that ruptures on the first floor are all doable, regardless of difficulty. Now, the important thing is who is going to appear. The members that will raid this place with them will be automatically chosen. From the space crack behind them, the first member appeared. Both Einar and Bjorn were waiting for this. For now, the scene shifts to Erwin. She was also on the first floor with her sister. She was complaining to her sister that it's hard for her to fight with just a dagger. Her sister told her that she needs to be able to defend herself without the bow or spirit. Erwin told her that Bajorn said that specializing in what she can do best is what she should do, and that an explorer's duty is to trust the team and fulfill their own role the best they can. Her sister told her that he is right, but the world is not that nice, and a teammate is just a teammate. Don't put such a high value on them. Erwin said all right to her, but in her mind, she still thought that Bjorn isn't a bad person. Then she asked her sister to go to the second floor, saying that she bet Bjorn is earning a whole lot of money up there right now. Her sister told her that you can't go up floors just by hunting a bit on the second floor, so they're going to enter a rupture. Erwin said that she thought that you have to be lucky to get in one. Her sister agreed and mentioned that there are quite a few experienced explorers who were unlucky enough to never have been inside one. 
but the last time it opened was eight months ago, and a rupture cycle is eight months at most. So the first floor's rupture should open soon. Erwin said that she understands, but Jorn didn't tell her anything about that. Her sister didn't say it aloud to not hurt her feelings, but she was thinking that it's to be expected. That barbarian's a beginner too, after all, and that he's probably going up the floors in the most inefficient way possible. She was smirking while thinking all of this. What will be her reaction if she knew that Bjorn is already inside it? This reminded what happened at the end of the rupture. It's just giving me goosebumps. I'm trying my best to make the release faster. But for now, I can't do anything because it costs $10 per hour of video, plus my time. And until now, I am not get a single penny from this. But I promise I'll start uploading faster as soon as I start earning something. Maybe from next month. If you guys can support me in any way. For now. Like Super Chat or Membership. Or on Patreon. I was still working on it. But I will give the link in comment. Or description for it. It would be great if you guys can. Let's get back to the story. Her sister asked Erwin to trust her and she will make her unbelievably stronger than Bjorn in just a year. She was speaking, then suddenly the rupture opened in front of them. Both of them started running towards it. They almost entered it, but the rupture closed, and they were too late because someone else entered it, and the capacity is full. So, the first party member is a dwarf. Then the second member entered, and it's a mage with a man to carry her luggage. Both Bjorn and Dwarf were surprised to see a mage on the first floor, but Einar was confused. So she asked Bjorn why a mage is that great, when the librarian also was a mage. Then Bjorn explained to her that the librarian was a ninth rank mage, and mages are an important resource to the city. So only those whose skills have been verified can enter. In other words, her being here means that she's skilled enough to have proved herself worthy. Does this mean we can see the librarian can become Bjorn's teammate in the future? It looks like many of your dreams might come true. The mage told Bjorn that he is quite knowledgeable for a barbarian. Then she introduced herself. She is a sixth rank mage, Alua Raven. If you guys don't know, the rank in this world is reversed, starting from rank 9 for both monsters and others. Some of you might think that the librarian is a legendary ninth. Rank mage from other stories logic. She seems a bit condescending, but all the mages in the game were absolute scums. So she is basically a saint compared to them. Then she introduced the professional carrier that she hired. His name was Tarjan. Then the dwarf introduced himself. His name is Hikurad Murad. He is an explorer for three years. Then Jorn and Einar also introduced themselves as Jandal's son, Jorn, and Fenelin's second daughter, Einar. Did you guys also notice that Bjorn uses his father's name and uses her mother's name? I was just thinking, what if, what if both of them are brother and sister? I know. I know. I don't want to ruin your mood. It's just a random question that came to mind. Let's get back to the story. Then Jorn asked them how they got into the rupture on the first floor, since they don't seem to have a reason to be working on that floor. The mage said that she can't tell the details, but heard that a rupture is going to open this time. The dwarf said the same for him. They're not talking about the method, but this is ladder kicking. In simple terms, they are monopolizing low-level ruptures and preventing new explorers from getting in. Then they started discussing how to divide the loot. The mage suggested that the loot be divided among them, excluding Tarjin. The dwarf agreed and said that it's common knowledge to listen to a mage in the labyrinth. Since there's a mage in the team, Jorn has to listen to her. The very person that convinced the royal family that evil spirits needed to be killed was a mage. Jorn said that he agrees, but Einar disagreed with listening to orders from her. She wanted Bjorn to be the leader and said that he's not a normal barbarian. He is wiser than anyone and he reads six hours a day. Jorn tried to stop her, but she didn't stop. It looks like she really wants to expose Bjorn. The mage said that a barbarian reading is unique, but they already decided. Einar said that he is not unique. He is great and she started repeating great and warrior countless times. Jorn was super embarrassed. 
Then the dwarf said it's a great thing to be respected by one's wife, and that he was envious of Bjorn. Einar got flustered and said that she is not his wife. The dwarf said that she doesn't need to be embarrassed, and both of them started arguing. Then the mage stopped them and said that they should start moving now. Jorn was thankful that the conversation topic changed, and Raven wasn't really interested either. He just hoped she never focused her attention on him until the end. Then the dwarf said that they only know each other's names. Shouldn't they know each other's skills too? The mage said that it's not necessary. The blood tinted castle's monsters are all seventh rank and under, so just Tarjan and she would be sufficient. They all looked a bit upset because of it. She also said that she would be taking the loot from the guardian. This pissed the big guy off. The situation became tense between the mage and the dwarf. The guardian's loot is the rupture's flower. For a mage who's financially stable, research is their priority. But the most important thing for an explorer is money. The mage said that she's going to give all the magic crystals that come from the rupture. But the dwarf doesn't want to eat leftovers. Raven looked really taken aback. She must not have expected such a response. Then she said that she can let him take numbers item, but she will take the guardian's essence. The dwarf agreed and said that both of them will roll a dice for the rupture stone. They are completely ignoring Bjorn and Einar. Jorn doesn't like it. He can't go back without gaining anything. So Jorn told them that he doesn't care about the essence or the numbers item, but they take the rupture stone. The mage said that he is really greedy. They do not need two barbarians in this party. The dwarf also said that the rupture stone is too much. Then Bjorn gave up the rupture stone and asked for two essences that aren't the guardians. Both the mage and dwarf thought for a second and agreed to Bjorn's condition. Well, considering their level, this place won't have any tempting essences they want. After that, the mage and dwarf acted all friendly again like nothing happened. Jorn was angry, but he realized again that he needs to become stronger. He has to climb the ladder, regardless of these ladder-kicking sons of... Then they entered the blood-tinted castle. The blood-tinted castle is divided into four areas. The drawbridge at the entrance to the castle, the urban warfare in the outer castle wall area, the underground prison in the inner castle wall area, and finally, the demon worshipping room within the castle lord's room. They met the gargoyle at the entrance. Gargoyles are 8th rank monsters. They stay still most of the time, like a normal statue. But as soon as they spot enemies, they immediately attack. The skill they're known for is petrification, and the target for petrification was Bjorn because he was at the front. It's the most common method to defeat the gargoyles to sacrifice a party member to the petrification while the rest fight off the gargoyles. Einar was worried for Bjorn. But the mage stopped her because it is a different story when there is a mage. The mage cast the curse, canceling magic, and Bjorn got free from petrification. And now the gargoyle can't petrify its opponents. It's a piece of cake for Bjorn and Einar to defeat them. And the other one was defeated by the dwarf. The dwarf was pretty skilled too. While Bjorn was admiring the dwarf's skill, Einar's focus went to a stone because it was floating in the air. Then it got into her carry bag itself. Then the mage told them that it's a spell to collect magic crystals and that she'll collect them for now and divide them up along the way. The dwarf liked it, so they started opening the gate. I mean, destroying it. It was very dark inside, so the dwarf asked the mage to cast a spell. When the spell lightened the area, they found out that it was filled with dead men. They're rankless monsters that do not reward any exp nor magic crystals. And their corpses do not vanish either unless it spits out an essence. So basically, they're a waste of time and strength for explorers. So, they finish them quickly without wasting much time. They aren't that strong either. They just look big. After they all defeated them, they dropped the dead man commander's blowhorn. Einar was little shocked to see blowhorn size. So she asked how it was used. Dwarf says that she will find out soon and start laughing. After that, they come across a steel gate. 
So Dwarf Hammer won't work this time. Mage asked them to leave it to her. Then she cast a powerful magic and destroyed the gate. Jorn was very impressed by her power. After some time, they come across the first chapter, the drawbridge at the castle entrance. It was close up. So Mage asked Anar to blow horn. Anar was little confused, but she blow the horn. After that, the magic seal for the drawbridge activate and the bridge start coming down and also the red water beneath it. And there are countless dead man monsters in it. Mage asks Anar not to be afraid. Anar says that she is not afraid. This area goal is simple. You have to survive against endless dead man. It's quite a difficult, but that's if it was a normal 9th rank party. It's an easy area as long as you have a mage with wide range attacks. Age called them near her so she can cast her magic. After that, she cast a powerful large range magic and defeated all of the dead man at once. Dwarf was overwhelmed by her. He praised her. She says that they're just dead man. Jorn was also overwhelmed by her. He didn't expect her to be this strong. After some time when the drawbridge come down, they entered inside the inner castle. Jorn wasn't happy about how easily it finished. Now that they passed the drawbridge and entered the main castle residential area, normally they have to face countless enemies here too. But the mage cast her magic again. She couldn't kill all of them at once, like earlier, but still she killed almost 90% of the mob. But the death fiend is still fine. Mage says that she leaves rest of the monster to them. Jorn asked Anar to get ready, and she was very happy, like she finds her favorite toy. After that, they use their old favorite move. Both of them grab the death fiend leg and flip it on the ground, then use their old method. Dwarf was very shocked after seeing their method of hunting. After that, Mage cast another magic, and this time it's an injury worsening spell. A death fiend's advantage is their passive registration skill, body preservation. And with that, passive skill on lock, death fiend is nothing more than a big chunk of meat to them. They don't even need to use their favorite move on death fiend now. They easily defeated them. After seeing all the powerful magic, Anar said that she finally understands why everyone praises mages. Dwarf was also flattering the mage. After hearing their flattering, Mage started self-boosting, saying that this is what they study so hard for. And of course, talent is needed to. But Jorn now get the geist of her character. Of course, no one can understand women fully. She likes to pretend to be humble, but she really enjoys showing of and is devoted to her studies and research. Then the mage asked there, help in collecting research materials. Dwarf agreed, saying that she saved there so much time here. So of course he will help. Jorn also agreed to help. After some time, they collected many materials. After seeing so many crystals, Anar was thinking about how many pies is these worth. But Jorn was thinking about the item she forgets taking. She inspected the entire area, but didn't take that item. She just have to destroy the statue behind them. Maybe she doesn't know about it. Jorn know about it, because some gamers have a habit of pressing the button to interact. Whenever they see a unique object or suspicious wall, I do the same thing, bro. In this type of game, Jorn was same too, so he was able to find countless hidden features in Dungeon and Stone over the nine years he played it. All the hidden things I found was hearts in Legend of Zelda. When you use bomb near some tree, it opens a secret hole near it. But Jorn didn't tell her that because it would hurt her ego. If a barbarian knew something, she didn't when she devoted her life to studies. So he avoid doing something that will raise her suspicion. After that, they enter the inner castle, which is completely destroyed. And there was also no monsters. Mage says that there's nothing to get from this place. So they, they go to their next location, underground prison. Everyone was excited to enter it. So Jorn opened its door. Then they entered inside the underground prison first floor. It was quite dark inside it. The dwarf asked the mage about the monsters that appear in the underground prison. Mage told him that they're skull rats, banshees, death fiends, chimera wolves, ghoul lords, and corpse golems. 
Dwarf says that he fought all those monsters except the corpse golem. Mage told him that corpse golems only appear in the blood, tinted castle. Then she explained the details about the corpse golem attacks and skills. She warned him about the flesh explosions. The explosive power isn't that great, but the bodily fluids of corpse golem is acidic, and it can be lethal if you get hit from up close. They are chatting happily like nothing happened between them before. After some time, Anar saw a skeleton rat on the sidewall. So she asked Bajorn, what are these? But Mage replied and tell her that they are the skull rats and that are rankless monsters like Dead Man. But they're not good at combat, so you just need to step on them. Anar got angry and said that she is not asking her. After hearing that Mage was also got angry. But before anything else happens between them, a sound come and Anar get scared and Jorn hand. You guessed it right. It was Banshee again. Seeing her scared mage started scaring her more. After scaring her, she feels refreshed. Then, Bjorn says that he heard that mages have a way of dealing with banshees. Mage was shocked after hearing that. She says that he is really knowledgeable. Then again, she shows her proness and used her magic again to get rid of banshees. After defeating one, many more come to attack her, but she easily defeated them. Again, after seeing how op she was, everyone was in shock. Then they entered the second floor. There they come across Chimera Wolves and Q Lords. The interior of the underground prison was like a mad scientist's laboratory because of all the disgusting monsters and objects. Of course, the real fun begins now. Dwarf asked Mage if she is scared of all these things. She answered that she is not because she enjoys dissections. So this much is nothing to her. Then she opened the door hidden behind the wall. They will meet the corpse golem inside so they left their stuff behind because the corpse golem used acidic fluids. Then she asked Bajorn to turn on the torch. After that, they entered inside the gate. Inside it, there is an incredible stench that stabs at the nostrils. Bjorn would have fainted right if it was in the past, but this has no effect on the strong body of a barbarian. The first one to react was the weight carrier. No, not you, Tarjin. You have all the quilty of a hidden protagonist. Well, whatever, let's meet in another story. The second was the mage. She was used to seeing things like this from experience in dissections, but she was weak to smell. Here goes the proness of her. Worf says that he is glad to see that at least they are fine. After some time, they show a mountain of corpses that is talking. There are countless voices asking help. Then they show it was actually a corpse golem monster. But because of the countless screams, Jorn was also shocked because these things are silent in the game. Jorn asked everyone to get ready, but the dwarf was frozen because of all the screams and fear. Mage was also down already. Looks like it's finally the chance for Bjorn to shine. Dungeon and Stone is the pinnacle of a niche game, but it also has features that cater to a wider range of people. One of them is the lively and vivid illustration that looks like photography. These illustrations were used often as memes. Because of that, many people recognize the memes even if they did not know the game. But no matter how realistic the drawing is, it was nothing compared to seeing it in real life. The same applied to Bjorn too. He was also feeling scared and disgusted after seeing the corpse golem in real life, and the mage that was supposed to be skilled in dissections, the dwarf that must have come across countless kinds of monsters over his three years as an explorer, the carrier who looked pretty strong despite his role. They treated Bjorn and Einar like trash because they're beginners, but the only ones in their right minds here are Bjorn and Einar. Then, Corpse Golem threw a corpse towards Anar and Dwarf. Jorn tried to block it, but Golem used his skill, Flash Explosion, and scattered the acidic blood. Anar tried to save the Dwarf and pulled him back, but some of the blood got into the Dwarf's eyes. The Dwarf was rendered powerless in the blink of an eye, and the mage who presented herself as someone so dependable. She was still barfing it up, 
Jorn asked Aenar to take the dwarf to the back and protect the mage. I didn't expect Aenar to actually agree to protect the mage, but she quickly followed the order and took the dwarf back. Corpse Golem's attack pattern is simple. They throw corpse bombs at those far away. As for the closer enemies, they pull them in for consumption. So you should not get too close to a corpse golem. If you get too close, the corpse golem will focus on the mage instead of you. And why am I telling you things like this in detail? It was because maybe one of you guys transferred to this world for some reason. So you guys won't curse me for not telling you important details. I'm just saying don't take it to heart and start preparing for it. Okay, let's back to the story. Since the mage is still not in her right mind, that would be the worst. Case scenario if she got attacked right now. So, Jorn has to keep his distance until the mage gets better and lure the golem the other way to stall time. After some time, the mage recovered a little bit. So, she cast a magic spell and attacked the corpse golem. The first phase of the corpse golem. The first phase of the corpse golem, which would have normally taken a long time with many torches, was finished off with just one spell. The corpse golem's outer body was burned to ashes with just one spell. The second phase, skeleton golem mode, starts. Aenar and Bjorn were ready to fight him. Jorn told Aenar to attack its chest. After that, both Aenar and Bjorn attacked its chest and defeated it. After its body disappeared, it left behind the essence. Aenar was excited to see the essence. A rupture is basically a treasure chest. Elite monsters that do not appear in the normal fields are like long-awaited rain to explorers since they have limited ways of earning experience. And the loot from the Guardians is something that all explorers desire. But a rupture's main temptation is the fact that the rate of essence drops increases exponentially. So considering the possibility, it's weird that it took this long for them to come across an essence. Aenar asked Bjorn what they were going to do now with the essence. Jorn said that they are the ones with a claim to it, and that they are the ones who did the most work, and that was what they had promised when deciding the loot. Jorn actually wanted two essences. Death Fiend Essence for its regenerative power and a Chimera Wolf's for its strength. He didn't expect to earn the essence of a rank 7 elite monster, Corpse Golem, that only appears once in the blood-tinted castle. Plus, the stats it would raise are perfect for a tanker. His body will be dulled because of the decrease in perception, but the other stats increase makeup for it. Bone density has a great effect on defense, and it's raised by 55. Weight, which is great for knocking back an enemy or blunt weapon damage, will be increased by 21. Pain tolerance is very useful too. Strength and poison tolerance are also helpful stats. But the problem is the skills. The active skill is Flesh Explosion, which causes great damage, but it costs the character's own hap. Plus, because of acidic bodily fluids, if a character is damaged, the acidic blood gets on the equipment and greatly reduces its durability. Bro is thinking about equipment, and I was thinking about what will happen to his romantic life if all the bodily fluids become acidic. And what will happen to little Bjorns swimming in that fluid? I just don't want to think about it. I just don't like these skills. But maybe you guys have another opinions. Let's back to the story. In other words, a corpse golem's essence is great, but it's a way at potion and equipment cost. Jorn was confused about what to do, so he decided to just leave it for now and heal the dwarf first and Essence should stay for half an hour. After the dwarf was healed, he apologized and said that he was embarrassed. Then, Jorn said that he was glad that he knows that, and reminded him that he would be dead if it weren't for Anar. The dwarf said that he knows and he was embarrassed, but as soon as he saw that thing, his entire body was frozen up. They almost wiped out by a middle boss, because of mentality issues, despite having enough force to defeat the boss. Then the mage apologized too. But what the heck is Tarjin doing? He is doing things that's not his job. But Bjorn doesn't care about these things. What he cares about is loot. 
So he tried to get more benefits from the mage and told her that they got rid of the corpse golem. Mage said that she knows that and she is glad that she forced herself to use that spell. She sure knows how to talk her way out. If Bjorn doesn't say anything, he won't get even a single cent out of this. Then Bjorn said that they saved their lives and that's more than one person's responsibility. The mage agreed with his statement and asked about what he wants. Bjorn said that they will take the rupture stone. For a moment, everyone became silent. Then the dwarf broke the awkward silence and said that he agrees. He would be dead if not for Einar. Mage said that she is against it, but if they come across the rupture stone, she will give him a fair chance. Jorn was not very happy about it, but that's all he can get with his current strength. Then Jorn threw his master card and told everyone about the essence. After hearing that, everyone was shocked. Mage was the one who was shocked the most. She said that Corpse Golem Essence is more rare than Guardian Essence. There are very few of them she heard about, and even the Explorer's Guild doesn't know its exact effects. Its rarity makes Mage excited. She wants to research its properties. Jorn knew she would react like this. That's why he saved it for the real negotiation. Then Jorn said that he has an offer. If she wants, he can give her the Essence. But if they come across a Guardian Essence, he will take it. This made Mage think about the offer. Then, Mage said that there's no guarantee that the Guardian drops its essence. Jorn said that he will take the risk. Then, Mage agreed happily. She said that she is more interested in it than the Guardian essence. Jorn was also very happy. Then, Dwarf asked Mage if she is going to feed the essence to Tarjan because mages can't absorb essences. It looks like mages also have weaknesses. She answered that she will not feed it to him. Just the essence itself is worth researching. And she took out a test tube. That's a very expensive item. Unless you get an essence above 6th rank, it's not even worth the cost. Dwarf said that he is very impressed that she owns something so expensive. Mage said that she only has one. She used her only test tube to store a 7th rank monster essence. She thinks that it's worth a lot. After she takes the essence, she asked everyone to move out from that horrible place. Dwarf said that he was waiting for her to say that. After they come out from there and moved further down, they saw two statues. Dwarf asked Mage, what are these? She said that she can't feel the mana from them, and they're probably just normal statues. She also said that Lord Residence is right above, and they go there if it was not already. Then she started checking the status, and suddenly a book from the ceiling fell down. Dwarf asked Mage if she knew about this. She said that a book is a treasure that hands down knowledge, for boosting in front of the dwarf instead of just saying that she read about it in a book. And the book that falls from the ceiling is called Necronomicon. It's a magic text of dark magic that's sold at a very high price. Jorn was thinking of coming back later to pick it up but she knows more than he expected. Mage said that she finds it on her own, so she be taking it. Dwarf agrees and says that they can't spellbend, so they can't carry it out anyways. Look at her awkward laugh. Because she knows that Necronomicon is treated as an item, so anyone can bring it outside without spellbending. Then she awkwardly hurried up everyone. Then they went around the devil, worshipping room, hunting monsters. There are gargoyle statues, chimera wolves, and the second mini-boss, the Bone Knight. Mage was happy saying that they get lucky to meet the desire. Type Bone Knight. But Bjorn was not feeling good because she was right, and they got too lucky. Seventh rank monster, Bone Knight. They have one of three attributes. Hatred, sadness, and desire. The sadness type uses a fog that induces psychosis so they are annoying to deal with. The hatred type uses soul slaying, which decreases levels, which are already too hard to increase, so they're the most difficult to deal with. Finally, the desire type that's in front of them right now. It also looks cheap and looks compared to the other two. It has the ability to regenerate itself using life power absorption. It's a good skill, but mage can easily nullify its skill. 
Using her spell she casted on Deathfiend, then Aenar and Jorn easily defeated it. They are the easiest type to fight. On top of that, Bone Knight also dropped the essence. Everyone was a bit shocked because they got two mid-boss essences. Dwarf congratulates Bjorn and Aenar. Then Bjorn asks Aenar to take the essence. Bone Knight essence is good, so Bjorn also wants it. But from a player's point of view, Aenar should take it because life power absorption works well with swords. And someday Bjorn needs to abandon his weapon. Plus, when he entered the labyrinth together with Aenar, he felt that Aenar is dependable. Aenar thanks Bjorn and promised that she will repay him in the future for this. Then she started absorbing the essence, but Jorn didn't tell her one thing. Jorn always does that. First, he gave Erwin a ninth rank monster essence. If not for him, her sister would have given her a higher and better essence. And now it's Aenar. It's good that it's at least a seventh rank monster essence, but from the weakest one. I think he just wants them to be strong enough to help him now, but not strong enough that they become a threat to him. Again, this is all my theory. After Aenar finished absorbing the essence, she said that she didn't feel any big changes. Then she saw Bjorn, and she was shocked. She asked Bjorn how he got bigger. Then she saw the other two, and she was more shocked because the dwarf is looking less like a dwarf now. Then she asked what they had done. Then Bjorn told her that she is the one who got smaller. She was shocked. The mage explained the basic effect of a bone knight's essence. Higher bone density in return for shorter bones. She explained it in detail, but to put it like a game stat window, that's what it looks like. It has good passive skills, but for active ones, you need another good healing skill to take full benefit of it. Mage explained that Aenar only got shorter, but her strength didn't decrease. But Aenar started screaming and crying, saying that now no one will see her as a warrior anymore. Everyone already looked down on her because she is a woman. Mage tried to calm her down by saying that she got very pretty. But it made matters worse, because that means she doesn't look like a warrior anymore. Jorn also tried to encourage her. The dwarf said that it's a cool essence. And he would have been invisible if he had taken the essence and started laughing on his own. I like this dwarf character. He always keeps laughing and making jokes all the time. On the other hand, the mage said that she would like to do a detailed check on her when they are back in the city. What can I say about her? Only Bjorn was truly trying to encourage her. Others are just saying whatever they want without thinking about her. Then, Jorn told Aenar to test out her essence on the Death Fiend. Aenar was not very excited about it, but she still has to do her duty, even if she doesn't look like a warrior anymore. That's what she said. Not me. But to be honest, she looked good before than now. Then she goes near the Death Fiend and casually swings her sword but this casual swing cuts down the Death Fiend in half. This surprises even the mage. Aenar was shocked after seeing that. She started crying, saying that she is still a warrior. Bjorn says that she is not just a warrior. Bjorn says that she is a stronger warrior. After that, both of them start cheering, but others didn't stop for them. They start walking. After some time, they come to the Guardian Room the final boss of this rupture. The dwarf says that it was fun with all of them, but it's almost time for them to say goodbye. The mage also says that she was a bit sad and gets why people work as explorers. I think she didn't understand a single thing. People don't work as explorers because they have fun doing that, but because they have to earn money. Both of them are chatting, but Bjorn starts thinking that they got lucky. Aenar got an essence. They also get the bigger share of loot because of the golem. But he was not feeling good about it because things never worked out this smoothly in his life. He was always sick and didn't have any luck in his love life, just like me. Then he was transferred to this world. He started thinking about the worst case scenario that can happen to them in their current situation. He was just thinking, but the dwarf started opening the door. Then Jorn's focus goes to the door handle. Bjorn tries to stop the dwarf from opening the door after seeing the handle, but it was too late because the dwarf already opened the door. 
and the owner of the blood-tinted castle is awake. The mage was very shocked, because normally the final boss of the rupture is a death knight, but now there is a vampire sitting on the chair. After seeing them, the vampire said that he didn't see a living being in a while. Yes, this vampire can speak, and he is not a normal monster. Vampires only comes out in levels higher than the sixth floor, and even then, very rarely. It's not even a normal vampire mutant. It had intelligence and also has a name. Vampire Duke Cambermere. Let's talk a little about monsters' power or ranking systems. First, mutant variety. Just a fancy term used for a monster with the same base stats, but with a different class like the Goblin Archer and Swordsman. Then, there is advanced variety. Monsters whose ranks are higher than the floor's average. An example would be the Death Fiend. Jorn saw it in the Land of Death, not in the Rupture, because the average rank of the Rupture is high. Then there is rare variety. Monsters you can only meet in specific Ruptures like this. Golem or Mimics, which are hard to come across in normal maps. I think Mimic Essence will be great. I'm looking forward to it if Dujorn gets one. Lastly, there is the advanced variety named Monsters, with each individual possessing their own memories and name. After seeing the vampire, Jorn told them to run as fast as they can. They run as fast as they can, but they're facing vampire Duke Cambermere, a boss monster of the fifth rank that acts on his own. He's skilled in both combat and dark magic. The mage was very confused and said that an advanced mutant variety guardian never appeared before in this rupture. Even Bjorn, who has played the game thousands of hours, has never met the vampire Duke. He only learned about its existence after watching a stream. Mage asks Bjorn about how he knows about the vampire because he told them to close the door before they even opened it all the way. Does her curiosity not stop even in urgent situations? Jorn told her to run instead of talking, but she answered that she is not running. This pissed Bjorn, but he simply replied that he just had a feeling. In reality, he noticed that it because of the door handle's color. Jorn tried hundreds of times to try and get the Vampire Duke by copying the player from the stream, but it never worked. He ended up re-watching the recording dozens of times before he noticed a small change. The only thing different in the recording was the handle color. Dwarf said that they can't get out without defeating the vampire, so why are they running away? Jorn told him that they need to at least get to a place with sunlight, and he was explaining the reason. But suddenly the vampire appears in front of them, saying that they are very rude guests. Vampire Duke used spiritification magic to appear in front of them. Jorn asks Mage to use magic. She was in shock, but she used her magic. It's a very powerful light magic, which stopped the spiritification before it completed. Spiritification is one of the dark magic spells used by vampires. It allows them to move very quickly, but their real body cannot move from its spot. But when using realization, another magic, they can move their real body to where the spirit is. It could have been bad for them if Mage didn't use her magic in time. Jorn was a little relieved, but then Einar told him that the mage is also down. She suffers internal injuries, but Jorn knows that a vampire's essence doesn't have this kind of effect. Then Jorn realized that the duke has a different essence because the video he watched was ended, before that person could even do anything. So Jorn wasn't able to see anything about the power or essence the vampire duke had. Still, Bajorn has various ideas as to what it could be. But the priority right now is to get out of the underground prison. Jorn told them that they need to get out from there. Then the dwarf asks him how they're going to get out because only the mage knows the way, and she is down. Then says that he also knows the way out. The dwarf was shocked and asked him how he knows the way when it was also his first time in the blood-tinted castle. Jorn got a little nervous but he answered calmly that he memorized it. Well, technically, he didn't lie. He memorized the layout because he goes to this place hundreds of times when he played the game. After running some time, they finally saw the exit. 
but the vampire also just behind them. They run with all they have towards the exit. Even the exit from the underground prison looks like the gate of heaven to them right now. Here, this is a small teaser of my story, and I want this story to move forward with everyone comment. On a crimson moon night, deep within the ancient forest, the haunting cries of newborns echo through the stillness. These are not ordinary infants. They are the half-bloods, as they are known in this world. These unique children belong to the Great Eastern Orc tribe, residing within the Great Alzara Forest. They are the offspring of captured women from various races, taken when the tribe raids villages or ventures beyond the woods. In this world, such sights are tragically common, and nothing about it is particularly remarkable. However, in the midst of this routine, there is something, or rather, someone exceptional this time. I was a little confused about the origin of the main character in my story. Do I make him a reincarnator or something else? Also, I'm unsure about the system. I want to give everyone in the story world a status window, like many manga. But I'm not very sure, and the art is A-generated, so it's not perfect. So please comment your suggestions. For now, let's get back to the story. The vampire is just behind them. And just like horror movies, they just barely get out when the vampire almost caught them. Thankfully, the sun was up. And because you all know the vampire and sun have spicy relationship, the vampire won't come out for the time being. They were huffing like dogs because of all the crazy things that happened to them. Then, the dwarf says that Bjorn really memorized the layout when going through it only once. And it's hard to believe for him that Bjorn only went through the coming of age ceremony just a month ago. Jorn always tried to avoid these kinds of situations, but the dwarf and mage always come back to it. This time, he was saved by Einar. She said that he can do that because Bjorn is a great warrior. The dwarf says that he can see him becoming one in the future. Then he asks, what are they going to do because the sun is setting? Jorn told them they have to keep moving. So just carry the mage for now. Tarjan said that she needs rest. Jorn got angry and said that if he wants to live, then he should start moving and should protect the mage, even at the cost of his life. Jorn intermediates him, so he agrees to keep moving. After some time, they come outside near the castle walls. This is the only chance for Bjorn to take the item from the statue he left before. So, he told them that he is going to look around a bit until the mage wakes up. Then he broke the statue, and in it, he obtained an item called Vir Goddess's Tears. It's a one-time, use item, but it's good for healing, and it's also good for attacking evil. Type monsters too. Then, to everyone, and the mage was awake, but isn't looking good. Then they have a chat about the vampire. Bjorn asks her how she became like this. She answers that she doesn't know the specific reason, but it can be pain, sharing. Then, Bjorn asks her how much time will it take to recover her. She says that it will take about 20 minutes, and then she will be able to cast a 7th rank spell 5 times. Only 5 spells are not enough to defeat the vampire. Then, Bjorn asks her if she knows any sun magic, and after hearing that, the mage got angry and said that it's very rude to ask a mage about the spell they know. It's the same thing as it's rude to ask a girl about her age. Jorn already knows, but so what? He is now a barbarian at the peak of rudeness, who doesn't care about manners except when talking to the king. After seeing Bjorn doing these things, she gives up and tells him that she can use Sunspot Sphere. Sunspot Sphere is a 6th rank attack spell similar to a Flame Sphere, but it has Sun attributes. Then, Bjorn asks her if she can use the Attribute Reinforcement spell with it. She says that she can with more mana, but it will take 10 minutes more. Bjorn said that he will hold him somehow for 30 minutes so she doesn't have to step in to help them. She agreed, but she was shocked and asked why Bjorn is acting like a leader. Bjorn says who else than if not him, and he doesn't care who the leader is. The mage says that's true, but she was just saying, 
but the dwarf started laughing and said that he is sorry for that, but he trusts Bjorn, and he has a good wand. It comes to seeing people's character. Bjorn thanks him while looking like a burning candle. After some time, the sun sets and night comes. The vampire is ready to calm his thirst. The vampire says that he can't control his trust after seeing them. Jorn and team were also ready. They held him down until the mage finishes her magic. Vampire Duke is not going to wait for them. He takes out his claws and spreads his wings ready to attack. Jorn told Tarjin to take Raven back and protect. Vampire comes flying towards them to attack, but the dwarf at the front stopped the vampire. The dwarf was holding his ground despite the attacks. That's all thanks to the first essence the dwarf has. A seventh, rank monster, Iantro's ability weight balance. It makes you resistant to knockback as long as your feet are on the ground. It also comes with shock absorption, so it's a pretty good essence for a tanker. While the dwarf was holding the vampire, Anar tried to attack the vampire, but he dodged the attack. Still, Jorn, ready behind it, attacked him. It didn't do much damage to the vampire, but on the other hand, Jorn's hand felt like breaking because of the pain, sharing. After that, the vampire's body turned into crows. This reminds me of Itachi. Crows started attacking them. The dwarf stood in front to stop them. He used his second essence living armor skill emergency restoration to restore his broken shield. Crow's bombardment started on them like crazy. They stopped them from hitting directly, but the blood splattered everywhere and touched them, which created a sacrificial seal on their forehead. This is the skill of the vampire. It's not as bad as it sounds. This seal increases Vampire Duke's physical abilities temporarily as much as the number of the seals within a hundred meter radius. Vampires have three skills, which are very powerful in battles. The first one is Eat Sacrificial Seal. The second one is increases the regenerative power in proportion to the HP lost. And the third one, also the most powerful, according to me, is Donor of the Blood, which absorbs some of the opponent's skills when sucking their blood. The problem for them is that this vampire can use those three skills as well as dark magic. He can turn into smoke to avoid something like a sword attack, transform into crows to explode or summon monsters with blood. He has very overpowered specs as he's a high rank monster. Dwarf was the first one to go down because he was at the front. Then the vampire starts attacking Bjorn. Then he asks Mage about how much more time will it take for the magic to be ready. She answers that it will take five more minutes. Five minutes is too much time for Bjorn to hold. Now that the dwarf, who had been doing the most in the battle, is down, and Einar and Bjorn are already exhausted. Then Bjorn decided to take the risk and ask Einar to take the dwarf at the back. Einar was not ready, but Bjorn convinced her to fall back. Now what Bjorn is going to do isn't fighting. Instead, he is going to become a living punching bag for the vampire. He throws away his weapon and starts taking the attack's head. On. The vampire stabs him. And he drinks the potion. He started using his own body to stop the vampire. This shocks everyone. Jern was planning to endure all of it by just using the potion. The pain potion itself is unimaginable. And the pain gets worse the worse your injuries are. Still, if something like the potion exists in the real world, it would be treated as a holy grail. He suffered so many injuries and drank so many potions that the smoke started coming out from his body. Bjorn still blocked an attack at his current state. It's a miracle itself that Bjorn did not pass out, but he still manages to block all the attacks that are aimed at his vital points. Mage says that this reminds her of something she read before, and that is that the real value of a barbarian lies not in their physical capabilities, but in their mentality. And she understands what that means now. Tarjan said that it's getting. They should get out from there. Mage asks him if he is out of his mind and where else they can go in their situation. There is only one way to get out of the rupture. It's to defeat the Guardian. Tarjan sure is hiding something. We never saw him fighting. 
Mage started thinking about what is she doing. Even the barbarian who has only recently gone through his coming. Eve ceremony is doing the best he can by making rational judgments. But she, the mage, was just sitting at back without thinking anything. Mage told Tarjin to help Dwarf, so Anar can help Jorn. Mage started running her brain cells and came up with a plan that I personally don't like. She cast a bunch of magics like aim, assist, and target automatic aim. Then she threw the golem essence towards Bjorn. This gives Bjorn lots of stats boost, as I told you before, but I don't like the skills personally. But Bjorn is looks like he is going to eat vampire. Now that Bjorn has absorbed the essence of the golem, the vampire's nails can't pierce Bjorn's bones anymore. He's annoyed, contemplating how he has to change his progress plan. He never wanted to take this essence. However, in the short term, things look optimistic. The meat shield that had been taking a beating from the vampire is now able to move, raising the possibility of surviving this situation. Though he can't endure the continuous beating. If this persists, he'll still die. Suddenly, a potion bottle flies towards his back, breaking and triggering an advanced heal that mends his injuries. It's all thanks to someone who started using their expansive potions on Bjorn. Thinking that if he keeps healing like this, he might be able to hold the vampire down, Jorn jumps directly towards the vampire and hugs him tightly, entering what he calls immortal barbarian mode. Regardless of his flesh and muscles being torn, any damage heals in seconds, thanks to the essence. Thanks to the essence and the potions. The acidic blood of Bjorn gets in the vampire's eyes, hurting him. This infuriates the vampire, and he attacks Bjorn with full power, throwing him away. Einar comes running to help Bjorn. She swings her sword at the vampire, but he turns into smoke and escapes. As he flees, Bjorn jumps to punch the vampire's face but the vampire dodges it at the last moment. Then, the vampire punches Bjorn in the guts with full power, causing immense pain. Einar tries to save Bjorn again, but the vampire dodges her attack, throws her away, and resumes attacking Bjorn. It seems the vampire has developed a personal grudge against Bjorn. Then, Mage told Bjorn that the Sunspot Sphere magic is ready. Jorn was taking the beating like a dead body, but after hearing the mage's words, he gathered his strength and grabbed the vampire once again. His face turned red as he gathered all his strength and threw the vampire on the ground. Then he asked the dwarf to attack him. The dwarf used lightning and expulsion skills to gather thunder in his hammer and formed an electric ball. It looked like Thor's soul had entered his body as he swung his hammer and threw the electric ball towards the vampire. After the vampire got hit, he fell into an unconscious state. Then, Jorn took out the item he was hiding in his shoes. He had been saving the goddess's tears for this moment, even after going through all the dangerous situations. Jorn then stuffed the bottle into the vampire's mouth and gave him an uppercut while cursing him. This broke the bottle in the vampire's mouth. After the bottle broke, the vampire became the target of the blessing. The blessing heals normal targets, but seals all kinds of defensive skills or tolerance for an evil, natured creature. Due to the great shock, the vampire became paralyzed. The mage asked Bjorn to get out of the way because she had cast the magic spell. She didn't have the strength left to hold the spell for long, so she threw the magic towards the vampire. It was already too late for Bjorn to move away. The spell landed and caused a huge explosion. Jorn was also caught in the Sunspot Sphere's explosion, and he fell into an unconscious state. The vampire used pain, sharing, and because of this, everyone fell into an unconscious state. Sometime later, Bjorn woke up first because he fell into the state first. He was confused because everything was quiet. He tried to find if the vampire was dead attempting to get a grasp of the situation, but his body was not moving due to the earlier attack. Then he saw the vampire. The vampire's body was in complete mesh, but he was alive. 
Thanks to the active skill Immortal and the passive skill Source of Darkness, the vampire's injuries were healing at a very fast rate. The passive skill, in particular, makes the user immortal as long as their heart is okay. Vampire injuries are all healing at a very fast rate thanks to his active skill. It's just an active skill in name, working like a passive skill. Jorn doesn't completely understand the situation, but he knows that everyone else was unconscious, and the vampire is recovering at a very fast pace. So, there is only one thing for him to do. He has to kill the vampire before he wakes up. Jorn walks near the vampire. The vampire was still standing up even after that attack. His whole body is tatters, except his heart and his face. I think he protected his heart and face from the sunspot sphere using his arms, like how a boxer does. Looks like he cares more about his face than life. Jorn knocked him down on the ground and climbed on his chest. Then Jorn raised both hands up high and started bashing them on the vampire's chest with his full power. This didn't work much. So Jorn placed both hands on the vampire's chest and used the flesh explosion skill. This hurts Bjorn more than the vampire, but to go out alive from there, he has no choice but to use it. He used it continuously, reaching his limit. Soon, Bjorn's health reached below 1%, but he kept doing it. He was at the doorstep of death, knocking on the door with his full power. So what result do you expect? Bjorn's health reached zero. After Bjorn HP reached zero percent, a countdown started, consuming three points of mentality. So, this is what we call surviving by pure willpower. But Bjorn only has 46 points in mentality, and they are depleting very fast. Bjorn knows that he will end up dead at this rate. But he cannot stop. He ends up dying even if he stopped. Soon after using this brutal skill so many times, Jorn doesn't have hands anymore, but the vampire is still alive, even if he is looking overcooked. Then, Bjorn lies down on the vampire to use his body. Hey, don't overthink. Jorn is using his body for flesh explosion. As Bjorn blows up with his entire body, a big explosion happens, and the vampire is finally defeated. The vampire gives five experience points because he is a rank five monster. And don't forget, the ranks are in reverse order. He also got four bonus experience points. One point bonus because the vampire is a high-ranking mutant variety. And three are for guardian defeat bonus. Jorn leveled up after absorbing all of this experience. But in this game, it isn't that nice. Your health isn't healed back to full just because you level up. Jorn's spirit power was also increased by 10. But the thing Bjorn was aiming for from the start was the Rupture Guardian's Essence, which has a 33% drop rate. I was also waiting for this. The Essence of the Vampire was absorbed by Bjorn. And thanks to the overpowered skills, Source of Darkness, and Immortal Effects Bjorn got from the Essence, Bjorn's health increased above 1%, and the countdown stopped. Thanks to this near-death experience, he achieved a new accomplishment which increased Bjorn's mentality stat by 10 permanently. The mentality stat is now over 100, and other stats also increased significantly. Bjorn wakes up after a long sleep in the laps of Anar. Bjorn asks Anar about others. She told Bjorn that they all left three days ago. She asks Bjorn if he is okay, because he was passed out for three days. Bjorn was very shocked after hearing that because this is the seventh and the last day of the labyrinth now. He checks his body, and everything is fine. There is no external injury. Then his focus goes down to important stuff. He screams and asks Anar about his pants, because he was butt naked. Anar tells that they were already in shreds, and they were bothering her, so she just tore them up. She was talking about Bjorn's clothes, not something else. But I just was wondering why they are bothering her. Bjorn was very embarrassed because of it. Then she told Bjorn not to be embarrassed because she saw what a great warrior he is. It looks like little Bjorn was also a warrior. Bjorn was very embarrassed, so he changed the topic and asked out things that happened when he was passed out. She tells him that the numbers item was taken away by the dwarf, and the mage took the rupture stone. 
Jorn was alive because he absorbed the Guardian Essence, and the other two took the remaining two items the Guardian dropped. Einar said that they agreed to roll the dice for the Rupture Stone, but the mage was being so stubborn and refused to roll the dice. She said that she already in the loss. The dwarf said that she didn't care, but Einar couldn't accept it. Then the mage said that Bjorn took the best loot he could have gotten, so he won't be able to argue against her taking the rupture stone. Sounds like she's the only one who knows that he absorbed the vampire's essence. Plus, she gave him the golem's essence as well as all the potions she had with her, meaning she did lose things in this rupture. So he was not mad at all about the distribution of the loot. Einar was angry. She said that the mage also took all the items going around on her own, and then she left without even waiting for Bjorn to wake up. She was a disloyal and greedy mage. Einar was so angry that Bjorn has to take Einar's side, even if he doesn't mind it. So he told Einar that she is very dependable to make her happy. Then Einar asks if they should leave, but Bjorn says that there's something they have to do before leaving. There is something that's still here even if the mage took everything. He will make sure to take that thing. But before that, he needs something to wear. After they take that thing, they return to the first floor and then back to Raftonia. We don't know what that thing is yet. After that, Bjorn goes to the Explorer Guild branch for the stones counting. This time, there are only 230, 1,520 stones. It feels like a pretty small amount compared to the hardship he had to endure but it's fine because he absorbed two essences. Then he moves his hand forward to take the stones, but the receptionist lady takes them back. She said that it's too much for a ninth rank explorer and asked what is in the backpack of Bjorn. Bjorn was confused about why she asked this question because they never asked this kind of question before. Then suddenly, guards come and surround Bjorn and tell him not to move and tell him that they will talk more in custody. Erwin had also just come out of the labyrinth. She was completely exhausted because she was hunting on the third floor with her sister. She experienced the strength of the seventh rank monsters that she had never experienced before. Although it was just her sister that was fighting, the sixth rank monster they coincidentally came across, it felt like a proper adventure to her. Unlike the first one where she was so busy trying to survive, she was excited to surprise Bjorn. She wanted to show Bjorn her new essence and was wondering if he would try it like last time. Even if that hurts, she was still excited to see him. Then she entered the guild building in a line. When her chance came, she gave her stone for counting. She earned 184,000, 100 stones. The cashier lady got suspicious and asked her how she earned that much, despite being a ninth rank explorer. Erwin told her that she was with her sister. Then the cashier lady asked her the name of her sister. Erwin told the full name of her sister, which is Daria Wittember de Tursia. The cashier lady checked her register and found that her sister is a certified explorer, so she let Erwin leave easily. Then she went back home to take a shower. She was very excited to meet Bjorn, got ready quickly, and looked beautiful in her new dress. She couldn't stop her happiness. She wanted to meet Bjorn and buy him dinner with the money she had earned. She wanted to exchange experiences with Bjorn. When she reached the place where Bjorn was staying, and she asked about him, they told her that he still hadn't returned yet. There is only one meaning if someone enters the labyrinth and doesn't return when it's closed. Erwin didn't want to think about it. She refused to believe it. And just like a week went by, when she came again, she saw a man taking Bjorn's stuff out of his room. She got angry and asked them why they were taking Bjorn's stuff out of his room. That man said that he had waited quite a bit for her sake already and asked her what she thought it meant. She already knew, but she didn't want to believe it. But that man told her that he is dead in there. This broke her will completely. She was crying alone outside when her sister approached her. She said that she heard about him and asked Erwin to get up. She told her that she couldn't stay here like this. Erwin grabbed her sister's hand and told her that she wanted to become stronger so that she could protect the people she loved. This look could give anyone goosebumps. On the other hand, it was already a week since Bjorn was put in prison. 
he was charged with being a plunderer. On the first day of interrogation, the investigating officer asked him about the bow. Jorn told him that he got it from the guys who were trying to kill him. So it's not a problem to loot people who attacked you first. That man said that they would figure out who attacked first. He was going to imprison Bjorn just for this. Jorn felt that something was off. It was an unwritten rule that they wouldn't question anyone without evidence, no matter what the explorers brought back. The man told him that the rules of the guild changed a few days ago. They decided to thoroughly investigate, starting with ninth rank explorers, in order to minimize plundering. Life is hard wherever you go if you're a lower rank. They brought in guys with no connections, but who had a lot of loot like Bjorn. That man asked again where he got the crossbow from. Jorn told him again about the incident where he was ambushed by a group of plunderers. Of course, he left the woman out of the story. People might think he was possessed if he broke the promise. Then that man asked if he was stabbed in the neck and survived, then saw the mark. Jorn said that it's right here, but the mark is gone because of the vampire essence. After that, he ended up talking about the rupture, despite not wanting to. But instead of believing him, he started laughing, saying that he was bad at lying, maybe because he was a barbarian. He says, why would a vampire be in the first floor rupture? Jorn got angry and asked him to call a mage so he could verify his statements using memory magic. That man said that they couldn't call a mage for a mere ninth rank explorer. Only 7th rank and up can request verification. Then, Jorn said that he would pay for it. He said that they would take all the money anyways when he dies. So why would they waste the money on something so pointless? And he would think about it if he finds a guild-affiliated mage. This is how his first day went. Then, two days later, a ninth rank guild. Affiliated mage came and tried mental magic. But due to Bjorn's high mentality stat, the mentality magic failed. After failing, the mage said that they would have to call a mage from the magic tower. But that man refused, saying that he couldn't call such important people for such a trivial matter. Bjorn even mentioned Raven and the dwarf, but he refused to listen to Bjorn. If you've forgotten, Raven is the mage he met in the rupture. He asked Bjorn to give up and confess. He kept pushing Jorn to confess until the seventh day of interrogation. On the seventh day of interrogation, he came very happily and said that he finally got solid evidence while showing the communication stone Jorn got from the Crystal Union guy when he met with Erwin. He said that it looked like this was not the first time Jorn was plundering people. He looked up the number on the message stone and found out it belonged to a dead explorer. He also got statements from the Crystal Union about what he had done. Then he told Bjorn that he would be executed in three hours. Jorn was already past the point where it can be resolved by words alone. But even if he were to break out of this place, he would just be marked as an escapee plunderer. Then there is only one way to get out of here alive. He has to prove that he is innocent, but he can't do that with words alone. So, he decided to get out of the prison first. He grabbed the prison bars and used flesh explosion. The power of the explosion was terrifying. It melted the bars like nothing. After the smoke settles down, Jorn comes out of the prison. The guard outside was terrified and shocked by the explosion of this magnitude. He tried to warn others, but Jorn kicked his face and knocked him out. Jorn's hand was healing quickly after the flesh explosion. This essence at least came in handy this time, so I will hate it less, but it still hurts for sure. After Bjorn's hand healed completely, he takes the keys from the guard. The other prisoners started calling for Bjorn. They started asking for help from him, asking him to free them. Bjorn knows that some of them are real criminals who have committed many crimes, but an innocent barbarian who is blamed for no reason doesn't give a damn about that. So he started opening others' gates. After Bjorn opened everyone's gates and they came out, they started celebrating the Barbarian of Freedom. They are in the underground prison of the Explorer Guild branch. The guards are standing guard at the gate of the underground prison when a sound comes from behind. When the guard tried to look behind, the door blasted off, and a wave of prisoners rush out with all kinds of weird weapons they find. 
they started attacking people as soon as they came out. The workers offer rewards to explorers who take down escapees. Then both groups start fighting. The fight is intense, but it was helpful for Bjorn. He took this chance to go up to the second floor because he knew that the prisoners would be caught soon enough. Unlike the explorers, the prisoners don't have weapons, except for some clubs they stole. Jorn just wants them to stall for at least five minutes. He was running with all his power. But what he wants isn't just to escape. When he reached up, there's a group of guards guarding the way up. They say that they can't let him up because the branch manager was upstairs. Then... Bjorn extended his hand outward of stairs railing and used flesh explosion. The explosion exploded Bjorn's hand and scattered his blood all over. After the blood touched countless prisoners and explorers, the blood is acidic, which hurts them like hell. But that's not the main use of it. If you guys remember, it's used for sacrificial seal used by the vampire. Another overpowered skill he got from vampire essence. It increases physical stats proportionally to the number of sacrifices within a 100-meter radius. By the sheer amount of people in the fight, you can imagine the amount of physical stat boost he gained from them. He looked like he was going to eat the guards. He started attacking them with bare hands while the guards have shields and swords, but they are still afraid. Jorn slammed the guard to the ground. I don't think this man is getting up anytime soon, even with the help of elixirs. Then another guard came to take revenge. He swung his sword to attack Bjorn. Jorn used his hand to stop the sword attack. Jorn's hand healed instantly, which surprised guards about how he healed instantly without using potions. But Jorn didn't give a damn about that. He punched the guard's face with full force. Jorn is feeling power boiling within him. He is high in power. The guards are too afraid to move after seeing the other guard flying with a single punch. Jorn was really enjoying the power boost. Guards were thinking, how can a ninth rank barbarian be so strong? This branch only locks up low-ranking explorers, so they didn't expect Bjorn to be this strong. If you guys are thinking that the guild is so weak, it's not that the guild is weak, but there are different branches for different ranking explorers. So, Jorn is the one who is too strong for his rank. After that starts the fight. Here comes the right uppercut, then a left jab. Again, a punch from the right with the seasoning of flesh explosion from your favorite, Jorn Cena. I mean, Jorn Jandal. This reminds me of, now that every guard is down, he finally arrived at the branch manager's office on the third floor of the Explorer Guild. Jorn opened the door wide trying to enter the room. However, there was a man in a red jacket hiding near the gate, waiting to ambush Bjorn as soon as he entered. Bjorn noticed the ambush, but it was too late now. The man swung his sword and cut Bjorn, causing him to fall to the ground. The man in red smirked and said that he had finally got the barbarian, but his attitude didn't last long. As soon as Bjorn's acidic blood got on his face, he started screaming in pain. He was too weak, yet he was acting like that. This whole acidic blood thing reminds me of a manga called Dungeon Seeker, but I advise you to read this manga only if you have a strong mind, because it's quite dark. The good thing is that it's completed. Back to the story, Bjorn looked very proud about this. Then a scream came. It was the scream of a girl hiding behind the table. She regretted screaming instantly, covering her mouth with her own hands. But it was too late, as Born had already noticed her. Again, this girl reminds me of another story. I know many of you guys don't like my opinion in the middle of the story, but it's a habit of mine. She reminds me of the Duke's daughter in the Manhua called I Became a City Lord in Another World, or something like that. If you guys like Kingdom, building stories with a big harem, you can try this one. Let's get back to the story. The man in red, who is also the branch manager, told them not to touch this girl because she's the daughter of the district manager, and if he did anything to her, he wouldn't be able to live. But Jorn was thinking the opposite. He thought he hit the jackpot. Then he hit the head of the branch manager and knocked him out. Jorn changed his original plan. He wasn't planning to do this, but now the district manager's daughter is here. 
things will either end up really easy for him or they'll end up going terribly. Then the daughter of the district manager started talking, saying that Bjorn already knew she would be here, and he planned all of this a long time ago. Then Jorn grabbed her and shut her mouth up with his Jorn hand. told the guards to bring the inspector in charge of him, the Crystal Union's leader, and also a mage from the Magic Tower. He warned them that if they failed, he would kill the daughter of the district manager. The guards were confused about what to do. But in the end, they decided to leave the branch manager behind and go to do the things Bjorn told them to do. Poor branch manager. Bjorn was holding the lady very tightly. Then he took a long breath and shouted with all his power. His head looked like it was about to burst from his own scream. He started telling them about himself and the things the guild had done to him. He told them that the guild was framing him, and even swore that he was innocent. He was doing all of this to make a big scene like this so they wouldn't be able to just cover it up. Jorn's demand reached the magic tower. An old man claiming to be from the branch manager informed them that a psycho was causing havoc. The person he was talking to was Raven. She looked even more beautiful without her hat. The old man then told her the story of what that maniac had done with the other prisoners and that he had taken the daughter of the district manager as a hostage to request a mage. Raven said that he must be really stupid to do such a thing. Then she instantly got ready with just a snap of her fingers. That's how women should be. Ready instantly. Raven stated that she would go because there was someone she needed to look for anyway. And she was also curious to see what this person looks like. How she will react after seeing the stupid face of Bajorn. We will see that tomorrow. Thanks for watching. If you haven't like or subscribe, what are you waiting for? Raven was shocked after seeing Bjorn there. But I am more surprised to see that she can fly. She looks like Supergirl, the cousin of Superman. Then she asks about what he is thinking or if he has multiple lives or something. Jorn told her that she will know that later and asked her to use memory magic on him. He told her to hurry because there isn't much time. Raven says that she will do it, but he has to promise to do a favor for her in the future. Jorn says that he will do it if it's something he can do. Then she landed inside and used her magic on Bjorn. Is he not afraid that his secret will be revealed if she sees the memory of his life on Earth? But thankfully, the magic didn't work on him. Then the mage asks Bjorn if he has some kind of equipment or artifact that can block psychological spells. Bjorn asks her if it looks like he can have anything on him. It looks like the people who come from another world, like Bjorn, also known as evil spirits in this world, have some kind of mind barrier that prevents them from getting exposed by the mages or prevents the information about their world from being leaked in this world. Whatever the reason is, Bjorn asks Raven to use something else. Then suddenly, a scream comes from behind. It's from the investigating officer who screamed after seeing the branch manager on the ground. He feeds the branch manager the potion to heal him and asks the branch manager about what happened. The branch manager stated that he took care of most of the prisoners on the first floor. He asks the branch manager if someone got up here. Then he sees Bjorn. The officer who looks like a quack doctor says that it was him who started all of this. The branch manager says that he already knows that. The officer was confused, but then asks the branch manager why he is not doing anything if he already knows that. The branch manager says that this barbarian is saying that he's been framed and that he is the one who inspected him. He asks the officer about the proof he has that Bjorn is a plunderer. The investigator officer says that he is not framing him. He told the branch manager that he brought back way too many magic crystals for a ninth rank explorer and his backpack was full of equipment that seemed to be stolen. They even tracked down the owner of the message stone they found in his bag and obtained information from the Crystal Union that Bjorn Jandell murdered innocent people and looted the victims. Then, in a counter-argument, Bjorn says that it's a testimony from a fellow Union member, and it's a testimony that hasn't been proved with magic. Then, the branch manager asks the officer why he didn't check it with magic. The officer said that it was because it was all because Bjorn kept lying to him. He says that Bjorn told him that he got stabbed in the neck, but survived, 
And then he says that he doesn't have any scars because he absorbed a vampire's essence in a rupture. The branch manager was also shocked after hearing about the vampire. The officer says that he was certain that he lied because he knew that magic wouldn't work on him. So how could he trust him and bring a precious mage from the magic tower? He was very happy after giving this long speech and was certain that it was the end of Bjorn. But his luck is bad because Raven was here. She came out from behind Bjorn and told him that it was true that Bjorn consumed the vampire's essence in the first floor rupture. Both of them were very surprised after hearing that. The officer asks Raven about what she means. Raven said that she was there herself. But what can they do? They can't use magic on her. Maybe it's some kind of immunity provided to mages. The officer again asks what she means by he absorbed the vampire essence. And even if she knows him, she shouldn't defend him with lies. Raven got angry after hearing that and asked the officer if he is trying to say that she is lying. The officer quickly said that it was not what he means. Then Raven asks what he means then. Was his little power causing him to start looking down on mages too? Then that man quickly kneels down on the ground and starts apologizing for his behavior. A magic tower mage has a similar status to that of an aristocrat or nobles. There are many groups within the tower, but they all came together into one organization to properly protect their rights, or I should say, each other's interests. But for a mere employee of the guild to doubt a magic tower mage, it's like digging one's own grave. Then the branch manager asks them to stop this. Then the branch manager told Raven that even she would agree with him. That without knowing the situation, it all sounds like nonsense. Raven said there has never been a vampire on the first floor before, so yes. The branch manager got happy and said thanks. But Raven will not let this end easily. She said that it's a reason for a normal person, but that's not something an Explorer Guild's branch manager should be saying. After hearing that, the branch manager got nervous. He understands that she will not let this slide easily. Raven says that even now, after so many years since the first appearance, there are still mysteries they don't know the answers to. They can never predict what might happen in there, but he was telling her that something can't happen. So he can be so sure. The branch manager's face was looking like he was getting scolded by his mother. After seeing how ruthless, even to the branch manager, he understands that she is really a mage through and through. Then a man comes there and said to Bjorn that he was the barbarian who started all of this. Bjorn asks him who he is. That man introduces himself. His name is Niall Urbans. He said that he created quite a mess. Jorn was confused about who he is. Then suddenly, a new waifu, I mean the daughter of the district manager, shouts father. I think I don't need to tell you now that this man is the district manager. The Explorer Guild manages clans, casts team spells, and sells various kinds of information for the sake of the Explorer's convenience. At least on paper, like every organization, who knows what is really happening. The management system of the Guild is simple. Every one of its hundreds of branches has its own branch manager with 13 district managers above them. And above them all is the guild master. So, the 13 district managers are basically second in command. But there are things even they do not dare to do. They throw the Crystal Union guy on the ground. After seeing the Crystal Union's guy called Hart's Young, who gave his witness statement against B. Jorn, the investigation officer got more after seeing him. Then, Jorn takes him under his remand and asks him questions about his false witness statement about the message stone against him. He tried to refuse that. But Raven used her magic on him and confirmed that he was lying. The branch manager and officer were shocked after hearing that. Now both of them and the Crystal Union won't be able to do anything to get out of this since the Magic Tower's mage has proved it. Then the district manager told Bjorn that he was innocent. Then Bjorn releases his daughter and asks him about what is going to happen with the Crystal Union guy. The district manager says that this was all caused by this person's false statement, so they will investigate this further and then decide what to do with him. Then Bjorn says that he prefers it if they look into the clan he's in too. 
The district manager said that Crystal has been quite the troublemakers anyway, so he will do that. He also told the inspector that he is fired. The inspector tried to defend himself by saying that he did everything according to the rules of the guild. But the district manager refused to listen and asked if he is trying to bequeath his lack of skills to the guild. Then he told him that there will be a thorough reinvestigation of every case that he handled. And if they find anything wrong, he will be punished accordingly. Now I am feeling bad for him. They're just trying to push all the blame on a low-ranking employee. He also understands that and didn't say anything after that. Then the guards take both of them out of there. Then the district manager says that they will compensate Jorn for any inconvenience he goes through. He said that he'll make Bujorn a 7th rank explorer first, and they will replace all of his current equipment with new gear. He thinks he can fool Bjorn with just that. But Jorn got angry and said that he can become a 7th rank explorer with a 5th rank essence anyway. So they are not doing any charity here. I don't know about Bjorn, but they almost fooled me. For a second, I think that it's amazing that they are even giving any compensation. The district manager said that he only has two months of experience. Then Bjorn almost got on his face and told him to bring any 7th rank explorer, and he will show who is stronger. Jorn goes into full barbarian rage mode and told him to come at him. The district manager was shocked, confused and scared at the same time. He tried to calm down Bjorn and told him that it never happened before. Then, Raven comes forward in support of Bjorn, blinking at Bjorn to let him know that she is with him. Then she said that she is sure that there has never been an explorer who has fought off a fifth-rank vampire and come back alive having eaten the Rupture Guardian vampire's essence. And it's funny that he was doing something he should have done anyway, and counting it as compensation. The branch manager doesn't like this, but he doesn't have a choice now, so he asked Bjorn about what compensation he wants. Bjorn smirked. Then Bjorn told him that he wants money. A lot of money. It reminds him to ask something everyone. If guys want and can support, you can do it with just a finger or a thumb. You want to support more, you can however you want, on Patreon or here on YouTube. You guys should at least subscribe and like the video if you can't do financially. Not me, but Bjorn is asking. Bjorn asked for 5 million stones. He was saying all of this with full confidence. But he knows that it might be too much. But he doesn't care because he is a stupid barbarian anyway. So he gives it a try. The branch manager said that it's too much, but the district manager agreed. Bajorn was surprised that he accepted it that easily, then said that the one million stones for her work here is separate. The district manager did not look happy, but he accepted it. He asked Raven to tell the master that he is always grateful for his work. It looks like the magic tower has more power than I expected. It's only because of Raven that Bjorn's demand was accepted. After they were done with her work in the guild, Raven took Bjorn to her personal lab in the Magic Tower. Bjorn was looking around her lab while she's busy doing something suspicious. If someone makes a face like this in the chemistry lab, I will definitely run for my life from there. Then she gives a lab flask to Bjorn and told him to drink. Bjorn was confused about what is in it, so he asked her to clarify if the liquid in it is water. Raven says that it is water in it, because they don't have any cups in the lab, but if he would like to have some of the basilisk concentrate in it. Bjorn says that he is fine with water. He was thinking about what kind of weird liquids and monster organs were in this thing, until now. So he changed the topic and asked the reason why she brought him to her lab. He swiftly put the water on the side. Then, Raven asked him if he remembers the promise that he will do her a favor. It's a promise he agreed to before in a hurry to save his life. But it's not bad for him to be friends with a mage. Then, Bjorn reminds Raven that he will only do something if it's something he can do. Raven says that it's fine. What she wanted to do is study the essence Bjorn consumed. She told Bjorn that it was also beneficial for him because there might be some features they didn't know about since no one's taken it before. Her eyes change. They're full of a passion for knowledge. 
She is so excited to study the essence of the vampire that never appeared as a guardian in the rupture before. Mages like the graduate students. Joran asks her if it's the reason behind the thing she said when signing the agreement papers. They signed a contract in the guild, and she asked the district manager not to record that Bjorn took the vampire's essence in exchange to agree on a condition. Jorn was grateful that she was being so considerate, but she was just securing her test subject. She was embarrassed now that Bjorn found out. She tried to change the topic and told Bjorn to come to the lab once a week and help her for about three hours. About half a year. Jorn told her that half a year is too much and told her to make it six months. And she also has to share research results with him. Raven told Bjorn that he survived thanks to her and also got five million stones, so he should be more grateful towards her. Bjorn is grateful. But that's a separate issue. And in order for this relationship to work out long term, he needs to show her what kind of person he is. He stands up and told her that she should be the one giving money to him. Raven was confused about why she should be the one giving money, just like you all. Jorn told her that she has to pay because she fed him the essence of a golem that he doesn't want. Raven pushed Bjorn away, or at least she tried to push him, then asked Jorn about how that is an issue. She said that she gave him an essence for free. Bjorn told her that she forcefully fed him that essence so that she could live. So how is that not a problem? She says that it also saved his life. Jorn says that he doesn't care, and he doesn't want it, and asks her to pay 10 million stones, because he heard that's how much you need to erase an essence at the temple. So you can actually erase an essence. That's great news. So basically, all rich and powerful people like the royal family should have the best essence. But if it's me, I should add a merging or devouring system in the game where if you get a similar essence of higher rank, the higher rank essence should devour the lower rank. Like if you get the essence of Death Fiend and Vampire, the Death Fiend's healing ability will become useless because of the great healing ability of Vampire. In that case, the Vampire essence should devour the Death Fiend's essence. You guys can give your suggestions if you want something similar in my story. I'm going to start writing my story. If any of you know any good platforms, please comment down the name. Let's get back to the story. Raven asks him why would he get rid of such a precious thing. She called him a psychotic barbarian. Jorn says that it's because he doesn't want it, and she has seriously harmed him. She said she heard that it's super rare and precious for explorers. So she should be the one getting paid instead. Jorn said that it's a biased opinion of a mage since you guys can't take essences, so she should be asking other explorers. She said that he was saying all that because he thinks she doesn't know any explorers. He should just wait and see. She walks towards a magic ball and taps it. She calls someone called Patsaron. She introduces herself and says that he met her mentor last time. It looks like Mr. Patsran is a high-ranking explorer. She asks him about what he would do if someone forcefully feeds him an essence that he doesn't want. That man said that he will get very mad. Raven is surprised. Then she asks, what if it was really, really rare? A really rare, a really rare seventh rank essence that you could only earn in the rupture. That man said that he would still be mad. An essence that he wasn't planning to take would only harm him. Raven was shocked and nervous, while Bjorn was sitting on the chair like a mastermind who closed all the doors of its enemy. That man is explaining to Raven that mages don't understand. But you can't make it to the upper floors by just taking whatever essence you come across. Bjorn was looking very proud, while Raven was embarrassed because of it. Then she asks about how should she compensate someone for it. If something like this happens... That man says that he will ask for money. He told her that a minimum of 15 million stones would be good. Raven was very shocked after hearing the amount. That man said that erasing an essence takes a lot of money. The fee only gets higher the more you erase too. To him, it looks like they worship money, not God. Then she asks everyone's favorite question. She asks, what if money is not an option? Wait. 
wait, this is not Fub, and Bjorn is joining bro. That man said that he is not sure. But if something like this happened to him, and the person responsible was in front of him, he would snap their neck in half. Bjorn was thinking that this man lacks imagination. I think Bjorn's imagination is running wild, because he was also sitting at a good place with a great look. Raven was in shock and fear. She was thinking about what she should do. She doesn't have that much money. This guy must be a pretty skilled explorer if he's acquainted with a magic tower mage. Someone like that would definitely know the importance of balance between essences. If she had asked a ninth rank explorer who barely made a living, they would have said that they would take whatever essence they get. That's why she loses now. Will she admit her mistakes? Then suddenly, an old man comes there laughing, saying that it's really amazing to see a barbarian win against a mage in a verbal argument. Then he introduces himself. His name is Dayan Tivhilian. He is the mentor of Raven. That must mean that he's Altimion School's master, the very one that used up five whole floors of the Magic Tower. If you're confused about what this school is, magic has many schools of thought. One famous example is necromancy. This old man is much more powerful than the district manager. This old man said that he had fun listening to their conversation. Raven was shocked and said that she casted a soundproof spell. Well, teacher is a teacher. He said she has many holes in her formula. She needs to make it perfect. He says that he couldn't contain his curiosity after seeing that his youngest mentee had brought over a man, a live barbarian at that. Jorn asks him what he means by alive. He said that most come here dead or with only their hearts left. This is really a dark turn in the conversation. After that, the old man started laughing. He said that he was just kidding. Is this mage humor? Well, Bjorn happens to be a barbarian who knows how to read the room, so he cracked a barbarian joke in response. Jorn told him that he would crack open that skull of his. Then Bjorn said that he was joking. So the old white-haired geezer loosened up and laughed. Jorn was laughing weirdly when saying all that. The old man was surprised after hearing him say, Old geezer. Raven was shocked and afraid. She asked him if he lost his mind, if he had any to begin with. Jorn was thinking if he had crossed the line now, and if he did, how he was going to resolve it. But the old man started laughing again. He said that he is different from those sensitive little worms who can't take jokes. He looks really mad to me. Jorn said that he would take back the old geezer thing because he took his jokes so well. Jorn asked the old man if he is from barbarian blood. Jorn is really taking this too far. Telling a mage that he is a barbarian is really too much. But the old man took it calmly and said that he sure has a bold side to him. Then the old man changed the topic before he started beating Bjorn. He put his hand in his pocket and asked Bjorn if he would be satisfied with something else instead of 10 million stones. He takes out a ring. This ring is a numbered item, and its number is 9,000, 425, and the name of the ring is Forest Spirit Ring. You might have already guessed it, but the lower the number, the better the item. The number of this ring is a bit high, but it's still a numbered item. A numbered item is something you can only obtain from Guardians of Ruptures, with each one of them being rare and possessing their own exclusive abilities. If you're thinking about where the numbered item is, from the rupture Bjorn entered, if you forget about it, it was taken by the dwarf after Bjorn was unconscious. They already decided about that at the start. The thing is that this old man was giving away the forest spirit ring this easily. Bjorn asked the old man about what's good about this. The old man says that it's something he definitely needs. It has the power to seal one of the essence's abilities that the user has consumed. So it can seal Bjorn's acid blood ability. You know what it means. It means that little Bjorns are safe now, and he won't become a eunuch now. Actually, Bjorn already knows its uses, but it seems that even the master of the Altimian school doesn't know about the ability that the forest spirit ring has. 
he only knows that it suppresses one ability of the essence. That's why he is giving the ring to Bjorn so easily. Bjorn accepts it and leaves the magic tower. Raven reminded Bjorn that he has to come back twice a week to help her with the research of the essences he absorbed. Bjorn says okay and quickly got out of there. Raven was worried if Bjorn really remembered it. Raven said sorry to her mentor because he had to give the item because of her. Her mentor, I mean the old man, told her that it's fine because it was a useless numbered item that wasn't being sold and that Ring's value is only 1.5 million on the market. He said that the stupid barbarian will be so angry once he realizes how much that ring was worth. The old man thinks that he was very smart. But what will happen when he finds out the real worth of that ring? Then he realizes who is really the stupid one here. In this world, mages are the smartest of everyone. But Raven doesn't seem to know how to obtain the goddess tears. That's why, even if they're mages, they're basically noobs in front of Jorn. After that, Jorn goes back to the hotel he was staying at. The man from the hotel said that he thought that he was dead. So he emptied Bjorn's room. Then Jorn asked him about his stuff. The hotel guy said that he threw them out. Jorn got angry and said that he paid for an extra week before he leaves. The hotel guy got scared and said that he will pay him back. Jorn was very angry. He wants to beat him, but he can't do that in the city. Then Bjorn realized that he starts having such violent thoughts so naturally. Even when he saw a head go flying, his mind was fine. Even when he murdered for the first time, he found it so easy to do. Even if it was something he had to do for self-defense. Even when he escaped the prison, he only hesitated a bit. He didn't hesitate much when he committed any of these actions. Even the argument that he had with the old man in the magic tower is something that the old him, the 29-year-old office worker, Lee Hanzu, would never done. He only thought that these were just changes that happened because of the given environment. But he comes to realize that it's like the instincts in his barbarian body that just jump out during battle. His personality, too, has changed to become more violent and simple. He is becoming more like a barbarian. But this is better for him if he wants to survive. Jorn asked the hotel guy for 30,000 stones, and he will let it slide. The hotel guy said that he didn't even get half of this after selling his stuff. At this moment, he knew that he is. Jorn asked him what he means by sold. Didn't he just say that he threw them? What do you think happened after that? Jorn literally moved to a five-star hotel. Now he has a king-size bed with a personal bathtub, and the city square is also much closer than before. He was thinking about the Anar now. What about Erwin? He didn't even think about her, and she was. Well, you know what happened. The next day, he goes to the Angry Bull Inn to meet Anar. After seeing Bjorn Anar starts crying, she is looking like a kid now. I still miss the muscle Anar. If any of you are confused about why she is like this, it was all because of the essence she absorbed in the rupture and became small, like a normal human. She hugs Bjorn and asks him where he was all this time. She said that she knew that he would even come back from hell, but still. Bjorn said he had some issues. Then Anar said she remembers something. She asks him if he heard about the news. Bjorn was confused about what news. Bjorn was confused about what news. Then suddenly, other barbarians came there with excitement. The barbarian guy with cuts on his face asked Anar if she is talking about the Barbarian of Freedom. They were very excited when talking about the Barbarian of Freedom. They told Bjorn that the entire city is in an uproar because of him. After hearing that, Bjorn understands that they are talking about him. If you guys forgot, the prisoners Bjorn freed from prison call him the Barbarian of Freedom. Bjorn was worried about exposing his identity. He was afraid that if he got too much limelight, he would get into endless troubles. So he asked them the name of the Barbarian of Freedom. The Barbarian with the scar on his face and others are dumbfounded after hearing that. Scar Guy scratched his head and said that it's strange. 
but his name is the only thing people are not talking about, so he also doesn't know about it. It seems like the guild took action and at least kept Bjorn's identity anonymous. Everyone said that they don't know the name, but they are very proud of him. They are proud that such a person is one of them. He is a great barbarian who beat up hundreds of people on his own, cleared himself of a false accusation, and led everyone out of jail to freedom. All barbarians start shouting, Great Barbarian. The best warrior. The best barbarian. Jorn didn't expect that it would become such big news. He was just hoping that nothing bad comes out of this. After that, Bjorn and Einar go to Kamenlubi. Kamenlubi refers to districts 2 to 5 that form a circle around the first district, Karnan. It's where the middle class of Raftonia resides, and many people call it the free market. After that, they sell all the equipment they took from the plunderers and the old equipment of Jorn that became useless now. They get 800,000 stones from all that. If we estimate the price of the equipment he earned right before coming out of the rupture to be about 500,000 stones. Well, that thing is a little special, so it's priceless. But still, everything needs to be priced for a fair share. After all the calculations, Jorn gives 300,000 stones to Einar. Einar was surprised after getting that much money. Jorn told her that she earned it. Well, it's not even 20% of the total. Jorn sure takes all the benefits. Still, Einar thanks him. She is looking so innocent. Then she saw cotton candy and started drooling. She's looking like a kid, so she brought one. She says that humans are all geniuses. How can they even think of making something like this? And she can buy so many of these with the stones she earned this time. Now she's thinking about cotton candies as currency. She thanks Bjorn again for treating her like he used to. Bjorn was confused about what she is talking about. She told Bjorn that because her looks changed a lot, the other barbarians are avoiding her. She thinks that it was because they don't see her as a warrior anymore. Well, it's also the fault of Bjorn. And these days, the humans also keep hitting on her wherever she goes. They all are using cliché lines. Einar was very annoyed by it. She said that this never happened to her before. She asks Bjorn if she became that ugly. Bjorn got confused about what she is talking about. He tried to explain to her, but she said that she made up her mind and she cannot go into the labyrinth with him anymore. Someone commented last time that he wants a Dungeon Seeker manga recap video. I will make recap videos for that manga if there is at least 10 people asking for it. Just like that, Einar left Bjorn's party. Of course, it wasn't because of her changed appearance. That's not the reason. The main reason for Einar to leave the party is that one of the shrine's elders, known for being an expert swordsman, apparently noticed Einar. And today, Einar chose to start learning swordsmanship with the elder as her mentor. Bjorn asked her if she can't just leave one day open for them to go into the labyrinth together. Einar said that she'd like to do that too, but there's a special method that won't let her leave the shrine for six months. Jorn understands what method she is referring to. That makes sense to him now, why she can't go with him. And this is a great opportunity for Einar. Einar said that she won't ask him to wait for her. She also won't ask Bjorn to let her rejoin his party again after she left but she promises that she will train hard and come back as a great enough warrior to be a burden to him. After that, she left, and Bjorn was left alone, but he can't hold her back. In her second adventure, Einar had to submit to a plunderer and force herself to swear on her honor, which is a great shame for a warrior like Einar. Even during the rupture, all she could do was watch when Bjorn is fighting. I mean, when he is getting beaten up by the vampire. That was the final nail in the coffin that led her to this decision. Now, Bajorn has to find a new party member again. Of course, he could just go alone too, since he is much stronger now than two months ago. He absorbed two essences after that, especially the vampire's essence. A guardian vampire too, at that. His basic stats have increased exponentially, and if he considers the regenerative skills he now has, there are basically no enemies that would be a match for him on the second floor. 
but even then, the third floor and onwards will be hard for him to do alone. Dungeon and Stone is a game that forces the player to move in parties. No matter how strong your character is, you can't clear levels alone. The higher the floor level you reach, the more critical the lack of a certain role becomes. It's necessary to have various party members. So it's a good idea to find similarly leveled party members to hunt monsters on higher floors. That's why he goes to the Mage Tower this time. If he is with Raven, a sixth rank mage, he will get closer to his goals. Raven was happy to see him. Bajorn was also happy to see her, but the reason behind both smiles was different. Jorn was happy because he wants her to join his party, while Raven was happy because she wants to do experiments on him. I just want to ask whose bloodstains are on this chair and what she did to them. After Bjorn somehow survived her torture, I mean experiment, he asked her to join his party, but she said a big no. And not just no, she also embarrassed him and said, what kind of mage would enter a party with just two stupid barbarians? Jorn was thinking about what she would say if she knew that there is only one now. She told him that if he wants her to join his party, his members need to be at the very least at the sixth rank, and he also needs to have a priest in the party. Only then she would consider it. Jorn just said okay and started going from there. What he was feeling was like when you want to confess to someone, and your friend told you that the most she can say is no, but when you say, she starts embarrassing you. After that, she gave him the analysis report of the vampire's essence. The report just says high, mid, or low. That's not very detailed. Well, it doesn't matter. Jorn knows the exact stats you get from a vampire's essence. They are all great, especially the natural regeneration, demon tolerance, and soul power, which are rare stats. Sorry about this, but from now on, this voice is going to be used because there are some problems with the old one. I hope you guys can understand this. Let's start. A Guardian's Essence comes with a default passive skill, which you won't get from a normal Vampire Essence, as well as all the possible active skills. Now, I just want to see Bjorn sucking others' blood. Now that Bjorn has the undead or immortal seal he got from the Barbarian Saman, as well as the Guardian's Essence, he is basically set on regeneration skills. He played this game for a decade now, but this is the fastest he has ever been able to grow. Now Bjorn's work is done for today, so he starts going from there. Then Raven stopped him and asked him about the stuff he shoved in that vampire's mouth. She said that she sensed divine power. She means the goddess's tears, but Bjorn can't tell her that. So he puts his finger in his nose to look stupid and says that she must have imagined it because it was rather chaotic. She says that she saw that with her own two eyes. Bjorn says that he is hungry. He has to go. Then Bjorn activated barbarian run mode and ran away from there. Raven just left screaming. She got very angry when he ran away. She understands that he is hiding something from her and she decided that she will find out. She goes to the library and finds a book there. This is an ancient book or text with an unknown author. It contains precious information about the ruptures. She was really lucky to come across it when she was younger. This is just my theory. But what if this book was written by Bjorn when he used to play the game? She starts searching the blood-tinted castle in the book. She finds the blood-tinted castle page, but there is some text she can't read because of the stain but she finds about the goddess tears along with a golden mask. Then she took another book with information about the goddess tears. In the book, the goddess tears are mentioned as a consumable relic with an unknown source. It spreads a very strong blessing around it when broken. 150 years ago, during the dimensional break, Cardinal Androne used all three in order to save the Pope, and that was the last time they were ever seen. Raven was very surprised after reading the book. She thought about how could a barbarian that just reached adult age know the hidden location of the goddess Tears and how he was able to use it. She got suspicious about Bjorn. 
The Golden Mask is an item you can obtain if you fulfill several conditions after defeating the boss of the Blood-Tinted Castle. It lets you change the user's face however you want for a month. It has five uses total. Well, Bjorn might have survived the extinction because he will only die if his heart is damaged. Then that means even if his head is chopped, he might grow it back. I just want to see how. Then he can hide his face with the mask. But I think it was also taken by them. When he was just playing the game, he wasn't really interested in customizing his character, so he just sold it for 500,000 stones. This is the value he considered when distributing the loot with Einar. Now that this is reality, and he was imprisoned before too for something he didn't do, so if he ever has to turn back on the city, he will keep it for now. In some bar, Erwin's sister was eating while others are talking about the crystal union that has broken up. Everyone was in shock that a perfectly fine clan ended up in ashes overnight. Crystal Union is an explorer clan that grew explosively in the last ten years. They created a wide-range communication system through the use of many message stones and provided the first-floor explorers with all kinds of conveniences. Then other explorers started criticizing them. They said that they are just pretending to be explorers. They are just scumbags. Actually, they were good in the beginning. A lot of ordinary citizens who had a hard time paying their taxes were saved by them. But as they grew bigger, they changed. They discriminated against outsiders and committed crimes against beginners habitually. What happened to Erwin was the proof. She doesn't want to admit it, but if it weren't for Bjorn, unspeakable things would have happened. She was thinking that she should do something about them, but now she won't even need to anymore. Then a guy asked another about the reason they are broken up. Then another one said that he might not have heard the news. It was the Barbarian of Freedom. Erwin's sister thought that it was also done by a barbarian, coincidentally enough. Then they talk about the whole incident, and people are saying that the new law to find plunderers isn't going to be enforced either because the incident became too big. And what's more surprising for them is that the Barbarian is just a ninth-rank explorer who barely went through his coming-of-age ceremony. After hearing that, Erwin's sister stops. She thinks that it would be too big of a coincidence. Now, she is thinking if Bjorn is really dead, and if the Barbarian of Freedom really is Bjorn, that would explain why he didn't come back for a week. She sure is smart. Then she goes home where Erwin is. Erwin now has one more fire spirit. She is looking stronger than before, but not happy at all. She is looking completely broken from inside. Her sister was confused if she should tell about Bjorn or not. Her sister and Bjorn sure are cruel. Bjorn didn't even think about her since he came out. Instead, he is busy looking for new party members. He now comes to the guild to find new party members. The reception guy asks him if there is something specific he is looking for. Bjorn told him that he is looking for a team of at least four people working on the third floor or higher. Then the receptionist guy asks Bjorn for personal details and identity plaque. Then Bjorn gives him what he asked. Then he starts checking the details. He was very surprised after seeing it and said, Five stars. Bjorn asks him about what does that mean. The receptionist guy says, Did I say something? Then he gives him the list of the teams that fit his needs. He changed the topic. Well, it must be some kind of keyword the guild uses. Five stars maybe means that he is a really good customer, or a really bad one, according to the look he gives after seeing the stars. Either way, Bjorn doesn't care as long as they're treating him fairly. Then Bjorn looks at the list, and he was very surprised after seeing a name in it. That's right. The name he saw in the list was Hikarod Murud the Dwarf. He was happy to see Bjorn, but he said that he was a bit iffy about it since Bjorn was put down as seventh rank. Then the two of them chit-chat a bit. Hikarod said that they would talk about the details later, because one more person should be joining them. Bjorn asked him if he already had someone on the team. The dwarf said that it's not that, but that person is a mage, so he is basically already chosen. Bjorn was very shocked after hearing that. He thought, how can a rare individual like that be in their party? He was thinking about who it could be. 
Then that person arrives. The mage is a young man called Leor Werv Dwalk. He said that he comes here because he wanted to join their party. The dwarf shakes hands with him and asks if he is the mage. The mage asks him how likely it is to coincidentally come across a mage at a specific time and place like this. The dwarf was confused about what he is saying. Then Bjorn told him that he is saying that it's him. The dwarf introduces himself as Hikarod Murad, a sixth-rank explorer. Then the mage also introduced himself as an eighth-rank mage of Raftonia's royal family. Now I want to talk about the Dungeon Seeker manga recap. That manga has some 18-plus scenes, so I will upload it on another channel because I don't want to affect this channel. The link is in the comment section. I hope you guys will enjoy that one too. Dwarf was very shocked after hearing the name of Raftonia's royal family. Then, Bjorn told him that it means he doesn't work for the guild or magic tower. The dwarf barely knows anything. The mage told Bjorn that he is quite knowledgeable and asked Bjorn for his name. Bjorn was pissed by his cocky attitude of speaking, but Bjorn controlled himself and introduced himself to the mage, telling him to sit down. After they sat down, Bjorn said that he would be direct. He asked the mage why he wants to be an explorer. It's rare for an eighth-rank mage to go on explorations. He's not skilled enough to be working in the middle and upper floors, and exploring the lower floors doesn't make enough money. It's much more stable and profitable to work in the city. The mage smiles and said that it's simple. He wants to become a renowned explorer and increase the fame of Baron Marton's family. The dwarf was very shocked after hearing Bjorn's name. He asked the mage if he is a noble. The mage smiled and proudly said that his mother's sister's husband is the third brother of Baron Martoin's wife. Bjorn was angry after hearing that. They are basically strangers. Baron might not even know about him, let alone him being a noble. He said that they don't have to be nervous and that he doesn't intend on treating anyone lesser than him. He really is out of his mind. He sounds more and more like a fraud the more he speaks. The mage has a pretty face and blonde hair approximately 160 centimeters in height. These are the basic features of a hot chick without a brain. But he is not. He only knows how to use daily and administration-type magic and a few curse-type spells, as well as cold-type magic. He is an inexperienced eighth-rank mage who is full of lies and arrogance. This is the image Bjorn has of the mage after the meeting. Bjorn was a bit doubtful, but better people will sign up to be in their party if they have a mage. So they decided to take in Dwalki the mage. After that, they received a lot better people, as Bjorn had expected. And Hikarod and Bjorn met three to four times a week to look over documents. Well, Bjorn was the one doing most of the work. Bjorn selected the candidates to be their party members. The dwarf says, going to reject them too, so he is relieved that Bjorn finally chose someone. And like that, they completed their team. Bjorn even upgraded his equipment and now he is showing them off in front of the librarian. Yes, I was also confused about why he is showing off in front of her. She asks about what it is. Bjorn says that he will tell her if she wants to know that bad. He told her that it's armor and a shield made from latinium. The name is like the mixture of lithium and aluminum, but the defense is good. He also shows his new expandable backpack. He said that it's not much, though, and he just got it. You can tell by Bjorn's face how much he is enjoying showing off. But the librarian puts a full stop on Bjorn's excitement. She told him to take off his armor because there are complaints. She didn't give Bjorn the reaction he wanted. Well, that's what you get when you forget about the only person that can give you the desirable reaction. After that, he got out from the library, and when he was walking on the streets, he saw someone sleeping. It's a barbarian that is sleeping in the alley. But the weird thing about him is not that he is sleeping on the side of the road, but that he doesn't have any weapon. Because every barbarian walks around with a weapon like it's their lifeline, no matter how hungry, poor, or cold they are. Bjorn wakes him up, and he got scared after seeing Bjorn. Bjorn told him not to be scared and asked about his weapons. He said that he doesn't have any money, so he sold it. He's speaking to Bjorn in a formal tone, and he sold his weapon. Bjorn is sure that this barbarian is an evil spirit like Bjorn. Then Bjorn introduces himself. 
Then that barbarian also introduces himself as Lian's son, Tari Khan. Then Bjorn takes him to a restaurant for food. He was very happy after eating. He said that he will never forget what Bjorn did for him. He said that he went through his coming-of-age ceremony a month earlier than Bjorn. He said that he got lost and couldn't enter the labyrinth, but maybe he ran off because he was too afraid to fight monsters. Escaping from an excited crowd of barbarians is a piece of cake. But the problem comes after that. Maybe he even tried to find work in the city, but no one would take a barbarian. That's the biggest negative about being a barbarian. This makes Bjorn think if the evil spirit really the one that opened the boss room, called the Gate of Abyss, because someone that skilled should know about how barbarians are treated in this world, but he didn't go into the labyrinth. Then Bjorn asks him about what he did after the first month. He said that he didn't go into the labyrinth then either. Bjorn got angry and asks him if he is crazy to not go even a second time. He said that he can't fight monsters without a weapon. After hearing that, Bjorn thinks that this is why he should have gone the first time. Bjorn was confused if he really played the game or not. Then he continued his story. He told that soon after that, he also kicked out because he ran out of money. So he had to fight the cold hunger and sickness, and then he tried to go to where the barbarians were staying, but for some reason, they excluded him. Now Bjorn thinks about how he survived for that long, when he's been acting like that. If he had run away that day because he was scared, he would have met the same fate as this guy. Then this guy asks Bjorn about how he feels about his story, and if it makes Bjorn want to help him. He said that it's hard to believe, but he knows the labyrinth very well and can be helpful for Bjorn. Bjorn told him that he is not going into the labyrinth with him. Tarikan was surprised and disappointed. Bjorn told him that he will help him in another way. Bjorn gives him 150,000 stones and told him to buy a weapon with it and go into the labyrinth. He was very happy receiving Moni. He thanks Bjorn and said that he will pay him back one day. Bjorn told him to go now because he was tired. Tarikan stands up and says that he will come back next time. Bjorn told him not to come. Whether he loses his money, wastes it, gets rich from the labyrinth, or even if he gets the money to pay him back. Once he leaves, he shouldn't ever come find Bjorn again. Bjorn asks him if he understands. He says okay and goes from there. Bjorn also comes back to his room, but is still thinking about what he did today. Maybe it was because he helped by someone in the past. A logical person would have told him that he was being stupid, and an emotional person would have been mad that that's all he did to help. Neither of them would be wrong. It might sound like hypocrisy to some, but that was the best he could do. Now he can just hope that Terry Khan survives. Soon the day of labyrinth opening arrives, and Bjorn enters the labyrinth with his new party. The mage is enjoying the scenery because it's the first time he entered the labyrinth. Let me introduce the new party of Bjorn. Let's start with the mage. He is Lior Werv Dwalki, an 8th rank human mage, age 25. The second one is Bron Rotmiller, a 7th rank human explorer, age 34, with 8 years of exploration experience, probably the most normal member of the party. Next is Hikurod Murad, the dwarf, a 6th rank explorer, tanker, and also the team leader. Yes, Bjorn is not the team leader. No one will listen to the orders of a barbarian. And, of course, our seventh rank explorer, barbarian tanker, Bjorn Jandel. And lastly, the most important new member according to our horny community, Misha Karlstein, a seventh rank beast human explorer, age 25, with five years of exploration experience. She has a strange habit of saying, nya, at the end of everything. She says it's because of the way she's born, but Bjorn didn't see someone like her. The author might have thought that it sounds cool, but in reality, it's destroying the image of the story. I was also disappointed by her character. I was expecting a strong-minded lady here. That matches Bjorn's mindset. Well, I might start liking her in the future. She said to go and start chopping some monsters' heads. The dwarf says that he can't disobey the princess's orders. She got flustered and said that she told him not to say that. The dwarf was saying that to her because she said that she was the 13th princess of some tribe. Brown Rotmiller told them to start moving. Thus began their first exploration as a team. With Rotmiller's guidance, they arrived at the second floor portal within 10 hours. But someone else already opened the portal. 
meaning they won't get any experience from opening it. This is a pretty good record, but Rotmiller was disappointed. He uses a guide skill that lets you know the direction of the portal. Bjorn didn't expect much from him since he's not a guide, but this is pretty good. After that, they entered the portal. It's a shame that Bjorn didn't get the XP for opening the portal. If he had been with Einar or Erwin, he could have earned that XP using the bug to open the portal. But he can't do that now until he has trustworthy teammates. This time, they entered the beast lair on the second floor. It's the second floor area accessible by the portal on the eastern region of the first floor. Like its name suggests, many beast-type monsters appear here. Dwarf asks Dwalki if he is okay. Of course he is not. Everyone becomes like this after passing through the portal for the first time. Plus, the smell in this place is disgusting. Bjorn asked Rotmiller if he is okay because he possesses a smell-type essence. Rotmiller says that he is fine. Then he told everyone to stay closely behind if they don't want to step on waste puddles. He looks dependable, maybe because of his eight years of experience. The beast's lair is a valley so they have to find their way through this nature-made maze. There are no traps, but a pathfinder's job is very important in this place, more so than in the goblin forest. The monsters here are so easy compared to the party's specs that it won't be dangerous. There are all kinds of beast-type monsters. First, they encounter a wolf group led by a werewolf, then a saber tiger and a mole. Of course, they all become Bjorn's experience. Bjorn got one experience point for the great razor mane wolf, and one from wall mole, and two for both werewolf and saber tiger. Six experience points in total. Thanks to Dwalki's alarm magic, they can have four guard shifts, so Bjorn can sleep for six hours. Dwalki asks the dwarf why they need to keep on guard when he has alert magic. The dwarf laughs and says that it's not because they don't trust his magic, but alert magic only detects incoming monsters. In confusion, Dwalki asks why that is a problem. The dwarf told him that in the labyrinth, explorers are more dangerous than monsters of the labyrinth. Dwalki was very shocked after hearing the bitter truth. He asks if this is really true. The dwarf said that it is so he can get some sleep. The dwarf told him that he doesn't need to keep night watch. He said all right and goes to sleep. Of course, Bjorn is not someone who can trust someone easily and fall asleep. He was hearing their conversation. After hearing everything, he thought that this might be their last exploration with that mage. On the second day, a little after midday, they reached near the portal of the third floor. Rotmiller told them that it's the spot where they'll be hunting 7th and 8th rank monsters. The third floor is a giant map called the Pilgrim's Passage. You enter a different map on the second floor depending on where you entered from, but everyone ends up in the same map on the third floor. Of course, the starting point on the third floor depends on where you enter from the second floor. Misha asked Bjorn if he had entered the third floor before. Bjorn told her that he had. Technically, he didn't lie to her. She said that it took her a year to get to the third floor. Then Bjorn asked her about how long did it take her to get to the fourth floor. She said that it takes her about two years. The dwarf said that it was similar for him. She got angry and said that she doesn't like that he is less experienced than her, but he is already a sixth rank explorer, and she is still seventh rank. The dwarf said that she is born in a rich family. Rotmiller told them to quiet down. Both of them say sorry and stopped. Bjorn noticed that sounds more annoyed than earlier. Well, he's working hard on his own while the others are playing around, so it's reasonable for him to get mad. Soon they entered the third floor. The area they come to is called Steel Stone Valley. As soon as they come to the third floor, something happens. Last time, someone say that the last voice didn't match the story theme. So I tried this one. I want everyone to comment about which one should I use from now on. Bjorn asked Rotmiller to back off. The Rotmiller was also very shocked because they were being attacked by monsters. Bjorn blocked them with his shield, but if it wasn't for the shield, he would have been trampled by them. More importantly, he was confused about why there were monsters at the portal. The dwarf was struggling to stop the other one because his shield was not as good as Bjorn's. His shield was breaking apart, but thanks to his essence active skill, emergency recovery, the shield was recovering itself. The dwarf told Bjorn that their seventh rank monsters called Iantro and told Bjorn to just try to block them from pushing them further back. 
Bjorn told him that he already knew that, but Bjorn was a little envious of the dwarf's emergency recovery skill. Of course, Bjorn is saying to himself that he is not envious or anything. If you guys remember, the dwarf also has a Yantro's essence, and it comes with the active skill weight balance, which gives them knockback resistance. The dwarf dude's essence was really helpful because of that knockback resistance back in the blood-tinted castle. It was also the one that is helping him right now. Then Dwalki used the 8th rank curse magic called Corruption on Ayantro. Well, looks like Dwalki is also of some use. Then the dwarf thanks Dwalki and attacks the boar or Ayantro. The Ayantro cruised to the ground with a single attack. Then our cat girl steps on Bjorn to jump high. Bjorn was left confused. Then she used her essence and attacked Ayantro's neck. This Ayantro was also defeated with a single strike, and Bjorn gained three experience points. We still don't know the effect of the essence she has. But this is not what's important now because Iantros should not appear here. Bjorn was thinking of the reason for this strange event. He asked Rotmiller if there are any people nearby. Rotmiller was a little shocked by Bjorn's question. Then he used a skill called Body Warmth Search. It's an active skill you get from a lizardman essence. As the name suggests, it detects body heat nearby to find living beings. But Rotmiller found no living beings nearby but he says that considering the smell, there must have been people until just now, and there got to be within at least just two minutes' distance from them. Then Bjorn says that it's most likely that they left after watching them hunt. The dwarf asks if that means that someone was out for them. Rotmiller says that he doesn't think that it was specifically for them, because luring monsters to the portal is a common method used by plunderers. They use the timing when the explorers are the most vulnerable. Then the cat girl gets angry and says that they should catch them and beat them. They will get money if they kill plunderers. Then Rotmiller tries to explain to her that it's true that they will get their loot, but it's hard to find them, and they don't have any proof. They might be the ones to take all the blame if things go wrong. She says that the dead don't talk. While they are talking about money and killing, Dwalki was going into depression. The dwarf says that they should just write a warning for the plunderers at the portal and leave. Misha says that she doesn't know that such a method was used by the plunderers. Rotmiller says that he also only heard of it, and it's his first time experiencing it himself. Then she says that it's not very common to come across plunderers after all. Bjorn got confused and asked Misha about how many times she has met plunderers. She said that she comes across about eight times over the last five years. Bjorn was very shocked after hearing that, because it's too little. He thought that people came across them all the time. He told them that he came across plunderers five times within the last three months, if also counting today too. Misha and the dwarf laugh and ask him how much bad karma he has. The dwarf says that it's impressive because he heard that that's how bad it was about 150 years ago, but the number of plunderers has gone down recently. He says that maybe he was the reason that they met those plunderers today, too. Bjorn was very shocked and depressed after hearing their comments. Rotmiller told them to stop making fun of Bjorn, and it's just that Miss Karlstein is lucky. Bjorn got happy thinking that he can't be the only one that unlucky. Rotmiller said that he comes across them about once every three months. Bjorn got depressed again because it's not even near his record. Now the party has two depressed people. After that, they defeated a few more monsters along their way to another region. After some time, they reached the border of the region. So Rotmiller tells them that it's time to camp here for the night. The reason they're camping in such an awkward area is because there are fewer monsters here. Then the dwarf asks Dwalki if he is all right because he's usually pretty talkative, but now he looks like he chewed on shit. He told them that the fantasy he has about exploration has been destroyed. He says that he knows how it might sound and they might be thinking that he is just naive and young. After learning that explorers kill other explorers, an explorer that says that killing such explorers will make money is definitely far from a fantasy. And if he continues with this, he would also one day end up killing a person. He says that on the way, he was preparing himself. Then Bjorn asks him if he is prepared. He says that he is, but he is not sure if he can do it when the time really comes. Dwalki's determination was without self-confidence. He is much better than the kind of guys that lie and then whine and cry when they're actually faced with danger. But still, he is useless. Rotmiller says that it's important not to be arrogant 
and he thinks that it's much more dependable than if he were to say that he could do it. Then he asks everyone to come with him, because there's something he'd like to show them. Then Rotmiller takes them to a place, and after seeing that place, everyone left mesmerized. That place is a beautiful landscape with beautiful natural light. Everyone is enjoying this scenery. Rotmiller asks them if they like it. He tells them that they can only see this view around this time of the day, and no one knows why this only happens on the third floor. But the reason is insignificant when you look at this view. He asks Dwalki if he has a bit of courage to keep exploring now. Soon the light disappears, and a familiar darkness embraces the labyrinth. Everyone, other than Bjorn, who was on night watch duty, went to sleep. However, Dwalki is too excited to sleep. Bjorn could only hear the consistent breathing from Dwalki after a long while. If I calculate the amount of experience Bjorn earned until now, it's a little over 50. He needs 150 XP to reach level 4, so he has a long way to go. He is level 3 now, so he can eat 3 essences. So far, he has eaten 2. So he still has room for one more, so he is in no rush to level up. But he would like to consume a good essence. I am excited to see what kind of essence he get this time. After walking for some time, they reach the boundary of the orc's habitat. Everyone I don't want to, but I have to ask for support because the views are dying down. So I want your support. I hope you guys also try other series on the channel. I will continue the series you guys will like, and please also tell me if there are any series you guys would like a recap of. All links are in the comment section. For everyone who wants to support financially, you guys can join Patreon or join the channel. Channel or Patreon members can also enjoy one or two extra chapters before anyone else from now on. The Orc Habitat has the highest number of monsters out of all the regions on the third floor. Its special feature is that only monsters that are 8th rank or above appear. It's ranked 2nd in difficulty, but if they're not going to the 4th floor immediately, this is the best hunting spot. The dwarf told them that for now they will work together here, and then they will decide the next steps of the plan depending on how well they perform. Soon, a group of orcs approach them. The dwarf tells everyone to do as they have practiced. The orcs also have a leader and an orc witch doctor. The fight starts, and the first one to attack is Dwalki. Dwalki uses ice spear magic and takes down one orc with a headshot. Dwalki and Rotmiller focus on ranged dealing, while the dwarf and Bjorn act as tanks, stopping the orcs. Misha takes care of the closest enemies first. The orc witch doctor used berserk on orcs which increased their physical attack tolerance threefold for ten seconds. The orc now looked like the Jimbros. After that, the orcs that stopped by Bjorn and the dwarf managed to get through the shields. The orc is directly headed toward the mage, the weakest member of the party. Of course, they already planned for this situation, and that plan is Rotmiller. He is in the back to protect Dwalki. He managed to stop the orc. After that, the 10 second berserk time is up, and Misha comes to attack the orc. She kills the remaining orcs. Now only the orc witch doctor is left, but a mage without someone protecting them is nothing. After wiping out the orc group, they relaxed a bit. But Bjorn was busy calculating the time it takes for them to defeat the orc group. It takes them about 8 minutes in total. It's actually a long time. Well, it makes sense, since they have two shields and one pathfinder. So their attack is definitely lacking, but even so they are just slowing. Safety is still great. This pretty okay, and Bjorn likes it. Dwalki is enjoying his first orc, and others are also encouraging him. After that, they keep fighting and made their way to the center of the orc's habitat, fighting the orcs on the way. As they got closer to the center, the numbers of orcs in each group increased. Once, they even came across a great orc warrior a seventh-rank monster. Of course, they were able to defeat it easily. But bad things always tend to happen when things are going smoothly. Someone attacked near them with a strong explosion spell. They are very shocked by it. Then a mage comes there and tells them that this orc habitat is the Jarwi clan's territory, and they should go elsewhere. He isn't just simply asking them. He is giving them an order. Let's talk about the clans a bit. It might be useful in the future. Dungeon and Stone is a single-player game, but surprisingly enough, there are ways to restrict content. At first, it appears as a way to block transportation between maps, 
but if you form a clan later on, you can also restrict hunting locations as a player. You know what that means. It means we might see Bjorn forming a clan. Of course, this requires tremendous effort, so it's a waste unless it's a boss mob habitat or a rare mob habitat. So it's also suspicious for them to restrict an area on the third floor. Bjorn might turn this unlucky event into luck for him, like what happens in the blood-tinted castle. The dwarf knows about the Jarwi clan. He asks them why they are on the third floor because he thought that the Jarwi clan was active on the sixth floor. The old man says that they have no obligation to explain that to them. But instead of backing down, the dwarf says that he did hear that a few clans with achievements are allowed to take authority over parts of the labyrinth. But he never heard that this place is the Jarwi clan's territory, and they even don't know if these guys are really part of that clan in the first place. The old man gets angry, but the dwarf is also not going to back down, and the situation becomes tense. Because of the sense of responsibility the dwarf feels as the team leader, he's acting rather rashly, unlike his usual self. On the other hand, Misha is hiding behind Bjorn. Then someone calls her while calling her halfling. She got scared and says yes, brother Talon. But Talon guy says that he told her not to call him brother in public. She says sorry. The old man asks Talon if she is his sister. He says that she is. The old man calls Talon sir and says that he has a debt with him, so if she's his he can. Then Talon stops him and said that there is no need. He cannot tell him the reason as it is regarding family matters, but even his father wouldn't care either. The old man says that at least they can tell them the reason. Then he tells everyone that they're looking for the great orc warrior's essence because of urgent clan matters. And if things go well, they will be able to hunt there starting next time. So, he asks them to go somewhere else this time. For Bjorn, it's hard to digest that a sixth floor clan is doing all this just to get the great orc warrior's essence because it's not even a rare essence. Then he remembers something. Then, in an attitude, the old man says that since they're here, there won't be any monsters left for Bjorn's party to hunt anyway. So it's best for them to get going. This is an indirect warning that they will interfere with Bjorn's party hunt if they don't leave. Well, strength is the law inside the labyrinth, so Bjorn is thinking that they shouldn't push this any further. But the dwarf is feeling like shit. But if they don't want to die, they should know when to give up. Bjorn was about to say all right and leave, but the person that shouldn't speak speaks up and says that he will try to resolve it. Yes, it's our naive and stupid mage, Dwalki, he said high senior mage. Then he introduces himself, but the old man calls him garbage and tells him not to call him senior mage while calling Dwalki an insect and all he learned is just a few basic magic spells, but boasting himself as a mage. Then the old man tells Dwalki to never call himself a mage. This completely destroyed Dwalki from inside. I now feel bad for him. I really do, and I think the dwarf too. He says that it's harsh. He is ready to challenge a sixth-floor clan for Dwalki. The old man says that he only said the truth. Well, it looks like the dwarf doesn't like the truth. The dwarf got really angry. It looks like he is really going to fight. He used the lightning skill and become Thor. He really is looking like Thor. Well, the dwarf's is related to Thor's story, so it's not strange. The dwarf lost the sense of reality and attacked the sixth floor clan. They all are standing unfazed, and the old man is also waiting for him to attack, so he can say that the other party started at first. Bjorn knows this, and he was fully aware of their capabilities. That's why he crushed the dwarf's head into the ground. Everyone is shocked by this action of Bjorn, but Rotmiller is relieved by it. He is an experienced explorer, unlike others. With an angry look, Bjorn told the dwarf to come to his senses. You can tell by the veins on Bjorn's hand that he is using his full power, and if they don't have a helmet here, his head will be crushed like a watermelon. The reason Bjorn acted like this is because they almost died here because of the dwarf. The old man and the group look like a group of wolves looking at their prey. The old man Madge told the dwarf that he got a really good teammate. He should be eternally grateful to Bjorn. After that, they got out from there, and the dwarf said sorry to everyone, mentioning that he lost his reason and acted out. Rotmiller told him that his action almost got them killed. Bjorn agreed with Rotmiller and said that he is doing a good job, and now he should keep blaming him so that the dwarf learns. He's saying all that inside his brain, 
but Rot Miller said that since nothing happened, he will leave it there. Bjorn was already confused that he is forgiving him just like that, but then he said that he personally believes that it's a good thing that he stepped up for a teammate. Bjorn is annoyed by his statements, thinking that if he were the team leader, he would be cussing him out. Happy New Year in advance, everyone. I wish you all and myself a great future in life starting from the new year. Enjoy. Then Misha said sorry to everyone and mentioned that things might have turned out better if it weren't for her. Dwalki said that it's not true and that it's only thanks to her that it ended with only them getting kicked out. She is touched by the mage's words. Bjorn was confused about what the heck is going on. The atmosphere suddenly changed. And this is the kind of atmosphere Bjorn and I always found super cringy ever since he was a kid. He even got goosebumps. Maybe that's why he was single in his past life. And maybe the same goes for me. Then Misha starts telling her story and why she hates to talk about her family. She was the only one in her family who wasn't able to form a contract with a spirit beast. Beast people or therianthropes are able to enter contracts with ancient beasts called spirit beasts. The contracts take on many different forms. Some summon the spirit beasts to aid them in fights. Some get possessed by them to increase their physical capabilities, while others receive blessings to use special abilities. Of course, only a few Therianthropes are chosen by spirit beasts. But the problem here is that Misha is part of the direct bloodline of the Karlstein family. In other words, the fact that she can't handle a spirit beast paints shame on her family's name. She was on good terms with her siblings when she was younger. But when she became an adult and still wasn't chosen by a spirit beast, everyone began ignoring her and started calling her halfling, saying that she is mixed blood. In other words, an illegitimate child. Her mother passed away early on in life, so no one really knew the truth. She couldn't deal with their discrimination, so she left her home and learned to fight. That's how she became an explorer. Wow, what a filmy story. Dwarf acted even more dramatically and started crying, saying that it's hard for her to talk about this, and he is grateful she told this to them. Misha also started crying, saying that she is thankful that the dwarf thinks of them as real teammates, and genuinely got mad for their sake. Bjorn is feeling super cringy at this time, and hoping that all this ends soon. But then the dwarf started telling about himself. His dream was to become a blacksmith. However, he was terrible at it. I mean, he lacked the talent. For ten years he couldn't even graduate from training. That's also the reason that he became an explorer after the age of thirty. He also needed to start earning money. That explains his age with just six years of experience as an explorer. Then Dwalki jumped into the race of being the most pitiful. He says that he is the most untalented one. He was able to get into magic thanks to his family's societal status, but he wasn't talented enough to get into the magic tower. And if he had been a proper mage, that mage would have respected him at least a little. He was crying while saying all this. The dwarf says that it was that mage that was the bad guy, and he is a great mage. Bjorn was feeling super awkward. Then the only member that Bjorn thinks is a bit normal speaks up and said that he has been in many teams, but he has never experienced this kind of thing before. Then he said he also needs to apologize too. Rot Miller said that when Murad and Miss Karlstein talked about age and experiences, he was very upset. It was because he was envious of them. He thought that both of them had no right to complain since both of them were lucky enough to be born as non-human species. Then the dwarf asks if there are any advantages to being a human explorer. Misha says that humans can use aura and can become spirit mages, ordinary mages, or saints. Well, it's only a small number of people who are talented. Then the dwarf laughs and said that it means their team is made of halflings. Well, that's great. They can just look after one another and not feel bad. All of them get excited and say that they will do their best in the future. But now Bjorn is in trouble, because they're all confessing their troubles and comforting each other. Now the remaining one is Bjorn. Now all of them are staring at him with expectation. Now Bjorn is afraid that he will be left out if he doesn't say anything. He was confused about what to say. He is not used to these kinds of groups. He was very nervous. From all this pressure and nervousness, he shouts with his full power that he doesn't have a mom. He shouts so hard that his voice echoes. Even his veins are about to burst. Everyone was shocked and didn't give much of a reaction. This makes Bjorn think that it's not enough. 
Then he shouts again and said that his mother passed away after giving him birth. When he was young, his father also went to the labyrinth and never came back. Now he can't even meet them after becoming an adult. He was telling all this like he's telling about his good deeds and greatness. He used too much energy in telling this that he is now huffing like crazy. What he tells them is 100% true for this body. He heard it from Anar. First, no one gives any reaction because everyone is in shock because of his loud shout. Then, everyone becomes emotional. Rotmiller said that it must be hard at a young age. Misha said sorry that she complained about her family without even knowing that. Dwalki also starts crying out loud, saying that it would be hard for him to pretend that everything is fine. Then comes the dwarf. He holds Bjorn's hand and says that he can't be his parent, but if he wants he can. Then Bjorn quickly pulls his hand and told him that it's okay. In reality, he just wants him to screw off. And that's how Bjorn becomes the most pitiful guy in this team. But Bjorn is not feeling sad because he had a mom on Earth. Plus, he's a barbarian who's become a seventh rank explorer in just three months. Then he remembers that he got dragged into a game realm and risked life multiple times. He suddenly started feeling pitiful towards himself. This reminds me of the Pick Me Up Infinite Gacha Manhua. This Manhua has a similar plot. The MC transferred to the game he used to play and is also very good at it. He also has the same cool mindset as Bjorn. So, if you guys want a recap of that story, I can continue it again. And don't worry about the Dungeon Seeker recap. I will start it from the new year. Everyone was shocked at what happened to him now. Misha asks him if he remembered his mom. She also said some words no one likes to hear from a girl. She said to Bjorn if he misses his family, he can think of her as his sister. Of course, Bjorn is not in the mood to say anything. Then Rotmiller asks the dwarf about where they should go next. The dwarf says that he was thinking of going to the witch's forest. Of course, this is the conversation that triggers Bjorn. Everyone gives their suggestions. Misha suggests that they should go to the green tail swamps, but Rotmiller rejected her idea, saying that it takes six days to get there from their current position. Then Dwalki suggests that they should head up to the fourth floor because he heard that the witch's forest isn't that great for warriors. Then the dwarf says that it's too early for the fourth floor right now. He said that he's seen many teams go there underestimating the difficulty and get killed. And it won't be too late for them to move on to the fourth floor after working together a bit more. The witch's forest is thought of as an area that you go to only when absolutely necessary. It's not a great place for hunting. The reason the dwarf is adamant anyway is because the fourth floor is just that dangerous. On the fourth floor, there are seventh and eighth rank monsters just like on the third floor, but there are also sometimes sixth rank monsters. It's a rare enough chance that you have to walk around all day for four days to come across one, but that just means that they would come across one no matter what once they are there. Bjorn actually died many times on the fourth floor because he wasn't prepared enough. So he can understand the dwarf's worries, but he told the dwarf that they should go to the fourth floor. I was thinking of trying everyone's suggestion from the new year, and we'll start uploading separate parts, merging them at the end of the month. Also, this is a small part of my story. Please let me know your suggestions about its future development. And of course the images are not matching the story, so keep that in mind. But if this story grows on us and is liked by everyone, then I will try my best to find a good artist for it. Let's start. On a crimson moon night, deep within the ancient forest, the haunting cries of newborns echo through the stillness. These are not ordinary infants. They are the half-bloods, as they are known in this world. These unique children belong to the great eastern orc tribe, residing within the great Alzara forest. They are the offspring of captured women from various races, taken when the tribe raids villages or ventures beyond the woods. In this world, such sights are tragically common, and nothing about it is particularly remarkable. However, in the midst of this routine, there is something, or rather, someone, exceptional this time. Only one who is not from this world, a wandering soul who survived the harsh cosmos and is able to retain the memory of its previous life. This soul, which only experienced a relatively peaceful world, has entered this harsh world with never-ending chaos. A world where countless intelligent species rule, where not only power or wealth, but your species matters. 
Let me take you on this new world journey as your narrator. Let's start. In the middle of hundreds of crying newborns, this boy remained calm, with a little hint of surprise on his face. He appeared to be staring at the sky to others, but in reality, he was gazing at a screen in front of him. This screen displayed details like name, age, race, stats, special stats, skills, talent, and hidden talent. The newborn, half-blooded boy felt both confused and calm at the same time, a strange calmness that seemed out of place in the midst of crying infants. However, there was a reason behind this calmness, rooted in the boy's past life. He didn't want to dwell on his past, so he started checking the screen in front of him. Upon opening the detailed window, he was a little confused because the name panel was empty. He then looked at the stats, consisting of five basic attributes, strength, physique, health, speed, and flexibility. Strength represented raw power for various tasks, like lifting heavy objects. Physique included factors like bone density, functioning as a defense stat with some differences. Good physique was beneficial for both offense and defense. Health reflected the overall condition of the body. No matter how strong the body, poor health rendered it useless. Speed denoted how swiftly one could move their limbs, and flexibility represented the agility of movements. Additionally, there were special stats, energy and luck. Energy encompassed forms like mana or ki, while luck was a peculiar force influencing cause and effect around an individual. Though complex in quantum physics terms, it essentially shifted outcomes toward desired results with sufficient luck. The boy proceeded to check his skills, but there were none. He then examined his talent and hidden talent. He possessed one talent, survivor significantly boosting luck when his life was in danger. He hidden talent was named Marge, but its details remained elusive, something he had to discover on his own, hence the term hidden talent. Several hours passed since his birth, yet no one came to feed any of the newborns. Hunger set in, but he felt powerless to do anything. Eventually, the other children fell asleep after crying, and he tried to rest as well, anticipating the arrival of adults. After a few hours, he sensed something biting his legs. Opening his eyes, he found a goblin child biting him. Swiftly kicking the goblin away, he surveyed the scene. All the newborns, including himself, looked like two-year-old children. Checking his status window, it showed only one day old. He realized they were indeed the offspring of monsters. Goblins and other monsters grew quickly, especially when newly born, much like many animals. While he observed his status window, the goblin child attacked him again. This time, it was harder to push the goblin away, but he managed. Confused about the goblin's aggression, his stomach began making sounds, and pain ensued. Looking around, he saw other goblin children attacking each other. Despite their small size, they were still monsters, and when hungry, they resorted to attacking their peers for sustenance. Now he understood what was happening and what he needed to do.